Hello, everyone, and welcome back to T Fight and Tactics. I am, of course, Impetuous Panda, part of the Rising Legends broadcast team, and I'm joined today by a very uh, unique player in terms of his story with TFT. Uh, that is, of course, Alan ZQ from Poland. Alan, how are you doing? Hey, Panda, I'm doing great. Thanks for so I mentioned you're a today. unique player. Uh, I think this comes through through many different reasons. Uh, you're someone that OG fans of TFT know very well. You used to you know, grind the game way back in set one, set two, set three. You were among the best players in NBA when it came to ladder results. There weren't quite tournaments there uh, just yet. You migrated to Legends of Runeterra and have just only recently come back to TFT, but you've come back uh, in a big way, which is why you're being featured here. But before we get into all those details, I want to know more about you, uh, kind of you know, bare bone stuff, personal stuff. Uh, who are you outside of TFT? Uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, I graduated uh, law, but uh, outside of the bit of practice I had and uh, working in the job, I didn't do much uh, on top of that. And I'm just a gamer. Like I'm playing competitively since I am 14. So that's been like 15 years already. Uh, the gaming wasn't always as developed as it is uh, now. Back in the days, even when uh, like the first my accomplishment was getting to SWC, my parents didn't let me go, so my team had to go with like a replacement for me because I was too young and they just was afraid for me uh, to go alone to friends. And that I think that was the last SWC uh, happening back then. And you so. mentioned your gaming background always being quite competitive. Was it always strategic as well? What kind of games were you playing? Um, how was your gaming career before, let's say, TFT and Legends of Runeterra? Originally, mostly MOBA games, Dota, Dota 2, Hon, HOTS, like I competed in all of those, uh, mostly at the highest level. Uh, I moved on uh, over time to the like more single strategic uh, player games, card games uh, and stuff like that, where like you also don't rely as much as, uh, on other people doing well, as much as just yourself. And how's that experience having to now, uh, you know, did it change your perspective on how you were playing, your mentality, your mindset? Were you more at the beginning, maybe more nervous, more pressure while, you know, you knew people were watching you, did it not bother you at all? How was doing both streaming and competing at the same time? Uh, competing wasn't an issue. Streaming was a very new experience that was hard thing to do. I was learning, I like, chat was teaching me how to stream essentially, like basic things. Like I was answering question without reading the question. So like uh, some people who are just like listening, they have no idea what I'm talking about, what, what I'm answering. Like the, now it's natural that like a streamer reads a question and answers it because some people are just, li most of the people are just listening, not watching. And like the, those, those kind of basics uh, just uh, happening. And uh, in terms of like streaming plus playing at the same time, I don't think it made me much worse. I don't remember uh, now, but no, it just comes natural over time. Do you have anyone you want to shout out, anyone you want to thank in terms of making it this far in your esports career, both as a player and as a streamer? Again, thanks for having me, uh, Panda. Always a pleasure to talk to you. And yeah, shout out to, to my girlfriend, that uh, Caroline, that she's so patient with me, spending so much time in front of PC because I know it's not hard. Uh, it's not. I mean, it is hard. <laughs> but it is not easy. And uh, my the whole community that supports me. That's really uh, heartwarming. Right. Thanks so much, Alan, for your time. Thank you.
inside So fill your heart with pride And let your light shine brightly Yo, don't hide You're a work of art Unforgettable and off the charts I can't pick a favorite part Cause everything about you is the key to my heart here at Golden Spatula Cup number one. And yesterday we eliminated all of our players down to just 64. I've lit a small candle to honor the players of ours that, that left us. All of, our, all of our friends that we've seen before lost like leaves on the wind. Anyways, a TFT Rising Legends, we're here, EMEA TFT competition. Somebody will have to lose here and it seems like it is going to be Aegir. You've achieved something that no other player in Rising Legends history has. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm feeling awesome. Um, hey, my name is Saza. I'm your two-time GC champion from Germany. Like, ever since my first GC win, I've been doing really well domestically. Like being in the German TC, I got second behind Selvi and uh, won the A1. Like, those are the two biggest tourneys. How can you be so consistent? What are your preparations before each and every tournament or Gold Spatula Cup? Um, it's just like uh, talking about the game with my friends all day. Yeah, we have like a study group since like two sets or maybe a bit longer. Memo, Vega, Elia, K, 
Kevin Parker, I have Max, and me, of course. Every single time players are picking up Ravenous Hunter, it is going extremely well for them. So I'm in chat saying, uh, praying for Ravenous Hunter Augment. So we'll see how that goes, if that happens. Stay tuned. It was Sasa who has, you called it, Ravenous Hunter Matt. And again, we still see the Ravenous Hunter on the Sasa's board. <laughs> it looks like Sasa will take home this round. Yeah, the, the Warwick Augment um, was the most broken Augment in the game. In Fury over the course of the fight, that should go out in his favor, but the only thing that's going out is him out of this game right now, and that is going to be Sasa going out in 7th, however. Yeah, of course, I got a bit worried when I got 7th, but um, I knew, like, if I adjust my mistakes, I can just uh, go top 4 the last game, and I have re still really high chance of winning, so... Wait, hold the phone. Nothing else we've said has oh, or no. will matter. Sasa, oh, his no. prayers no. have been answered. He was the one asking for the old one in the chat. And Mortdog listened. Before the final game started, I typed like mani manifesting the Warwick augment. And then I got into game and I actually got it. Like, it was like really fun. He's already on his way to getting the three items on the Warwick. On as well, and make sure there's so few options to stopping this Warwick. It is Sasa, our first and only repeat Golden Spatula Cup champion. I want to thank uh, my girlfriend for the candle nice. dip. Candle dip. I love her. Like my my girlfriend painted the candle and um, lighted it up for the final to give me luck, and it worked out. I think we owe your girlfriend a thanks, all of us, for lighting up that candle and for playing for that Warwick before our very special event today. Like my my plans for now are just um, I I just want that my friends make it to to the finals as well. Maybe I can take one of them worlds with me. This will be uh, the set where the Germans go to worlds.
Welcome tacticians from all of Rune Terra. Rising Legends is back with another season and I'm so glad to introduce the new updates and the competitive format to you. For this season, we will have three different ways to qualify for the Rising Legends Finals. The best ladder players during the whole season will qualify to the finals through ladder snapshots. So no reason to stop grinding in solo queue, tacticians. The Golden Spatula Cups offer two more ways. The consistency reward are the Golden Spatula Cup points. The top 21 point earners will secure a spot and every player who makes it to day two will acquire points. Players who perform the best can also qualify by winning one of the Golden Spatula Cups. To qualify to the Golden Spatula Cups, the TFT regional competitions again have an important role. Every TRC will send the best competitors of their league to each Golden Spatula Cup. But you can also qualify to the GSC by being at the top of the ladder at rank locks. Pay attention, folks! The last way to qualify two Golden Spatula Cups is by playing in the Open Qualifier, where 512 players will fight for 32 direct spots. As the last novelty, we have the biggest prize pool in EMEA history. Let me take a breath. 117,750 euros. Okay, this is huge. But what about our fan favorite, Super Brawl? Don't worry, Super Brawl is back with the same format. The top four players from their respective TRCs will team up and face the best competitors of the other TRCs to fight for the glory of being the best region in EMEA. But hold your horses, more details will come soon. Having all that in mind, the best 32 players from EMEA will qualify for the Rising Legends Finals. Split between the three Golden Spatula Cup winners, the 21 point earners from the three Golden Spatula Cups, and the top 8 point earners from the Snapshots. And that's everything guys, we will see you in Rune Terra Reforged.
welcome back to the Golden Spatula Cup number two. My name is Makes, and of course, I brought support here. We have Mr. Rapgot himself, Morgan, and somebody that's not only the tallest human being that I know, but also has a massive brain, Wida. We are here to talk to you a little bit, a bit about our day three of the tournament and how it's all coming down. How are you feeling, Morgan? How are you excited about what we have in store today? I'm, I'm feeling way better. I'm feeling way better now that the entire chat is not going to be complaining about my microphone being absolutely horrible. <laughs> I got a good one today. I'm going to be sounding very fancy. Of course, I need to put some hair on I'm, I'm, some hair. I need to take care of my hair a little bit, but that is uh, it's just the way I was born. I mean, I mean we have I some hair you can borrow, I think, both of us. <laughs> I'll give yeah, we'll just give, give me, you a little me. bit. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You guys have awesome hair, by the way. I mean, look at Mix and look at Rita. They're just majestic. Yeah, so in case you're not aware, and I mean, how could you? But before this show, we were actually talking about conditioner because that's a very important TFT topic as we are leading into the day. However, somebody might be asking, what is Rising Legends and what are these guys on about? We know, why don't you give us a little bit of a rundown how it all works? Yeah, so Rising Legends is a competition for anyone in the EMEA region that wants to make it to the global championship for Rune Terror Reforged, right? And we have a, a bunch of different circuits. We have the, the TRCs that qualified to the Golden Spatula Cups. The OQ is also open qualified, so that it also exists. And on top of that, we also do have spots from the ladder. And all of these things combine into figuring out who goes to those Rising Legends finals for Rune Terror Reforged. Whether that's going to be based off of circuit points, ladder snapshots, you name it. And then also the most important thing, maybe we'll talk about a little bit later, the Super Brawl is a completely separate tournament that doesn't qualify for, for the Rising Legends finals, but it is a strong incentive to play in the TRCs. And it's yeah, so you... fun. But like you said, we are going to talk about that in just a little bit. But Morgan, for those players that haven't made it in just yet, what can they do to still reach the EMEA finals? There are three ways to qualify for the EMEA Finals. It's either you are one of the participants in the Golden Spatula Cup and you do manage to win one of them, aka like Sasa, who's managed to win the Golden Spatula Cup 1. We still don't know who's the Golden Spatula Cup 2 winner because today is the day that we're going to be at one, be adding one more to the list. So the top three Golden Spatula Cup winners qualify and the top eight ladder point earners. And the ladder point earners are basically the top four from EU West, the top two from EU Nordic, the first one to uh, on Russian on the Russian server and the first one on the Turkish server. And as well, we have 21 top Golden Spatula Cup earners or point earners. How do you gain these points? Basically, if you made it to the top 64 of any Golden Spatula Cups, whether the first one, the second one, or the third one, whichever wins you gather, they will accumulate points for you. So you can qualify in so many ways. It's either that you win one of them, and if that's a little bit too hard, you just need to qualify to the top 64 and gather points. So you have three ways. Better, winning, and Golden Spatula Cup points. Thank you so much for that breakdown. So in case you're feeling curious on getting to the CMEA Finals, those are your chances. But of course, it was a lot going on yesterday. I wasn't here, but uh, I did look up a bunch of stuff. I hear there was, uh, to my surprise, even a Rek'Sai comp that made top one, Wida. Well, I'm the Anything else I should know about before we I head into the video? I will, I will not stand for this Rek'Sai slander, okay? It might have gone eighth a couple of times on broadcast, but we don't talk about that. We should, In this house, we stand Rek'Sai, okay? Yeah. Are you are you in the same that's house nice. as I that's am, or, or how does that work? Can I be in a different house? <laughs> I mean, you can see, like, my house is a bit more, like, dark orange, um, you know, wallpaper. Yours is a little bit more, brown, I guess... Yeah. Like light a rotating yellow? platform makes. Yeah. Sorry I'm not going to speak about uh, these uh, Katarina and Ashley rolls behind me. I'm in the house of re-rolls quite literally at this point. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to see an Ash re-roll. Trouble was talking about that day one, day two. I've yet to see a fully itemized Ash 3. We did get in the benefits of seeing an Ash 3 in total, but we'll see we'll see we do have a little video ready to talk to us about what was going down yesterday so check it out what's good y'all it's day number two of the golden spatula cup number two my name is Naviria joined here by morgan and trouble 
finds that two-star Scion in the process on, the, on his side of the board here. And the other question is, how deep does, does Teddy go? He is one. Well, he has to. That's well, the he has the duplicator. Even without the explosion damage, that's just going to be the affiliates yeah. down here. But now, can the Belvedere drop the acro do enough work? It doesn't seem like it. And Teppy, from a fantastic opening to the game, playing the tempo well. And this way for Recombobulator, man after my own heart. And not only, apparently he had two four costs on the board already. Ari, here it comes, takes down everyone but the Zeri, and she finally falls. Canvas is bored, built up from the very beginning of the game, recombobulates himself into first play. That Sichuani frontline will be enough for now. I am shocked how Poppy? long this Akshan taking to die. Oh my Wait. god. Poppy Giga Chad? What no was that? Kidding. Karma three? I think that's a karma three. Yeah, he had the double duplicate already ready. Few moments later. To no backline access specifically with this karma, which only hits the kale after every three casts. Enough damage might be going on. And with the amount of bridge blade, she's gonna be too strong, but the rise gets mm -hmm. to one last time if you got this hand sword, but no glim. Well take the loss. Uh resets, and right here, this is where he can. He's out on the right side, he found the Aatrox. All you need to find is one, two, three, four, no five, six, and seventh is going to be the Heimerdinger RIP gonna be valuable. You guys did mention that she's gonna be giving shields. You guys mentioned she's gonna be dealing damage, but not enough at all that Ari needed a much stronger front line. And this is something that Rik'Sai specializes in. It specializes in dealing damage in one shotting, and it also apparently specializes in making people like Ogi play oh. for the final game. Actually. So much action yesterday, and we're excited to even, you know, put a little bit higher with today the stakes are rising and we want to take a look at how it all panned out because of course with going from day two to day three we did have a couple of elimination and i might or might have not uh dm some players saying like hello what was going on here i do not pass golden spatula cup for one day and you dare to get eliminated i am so upset lots and lots of players that i was looking forward to see unfortunately taking the L and not moving on to day three, but we do have a bunch of really, really cool players still in here that I'm super excited about. I do want to shout them out right away. Memo from Germany, carrying my hopes and my heart to maybe get Germany yet another Golden Spatula Cup win. I'd be down for that, but we do have, of course, more and more players in here that we're very excited about. Morgan, tell me a little bit about somebody that you're looking forward to see today. I mean, of course, I'm going to be very, very biased when I speak about Lecoco. Lecoco yesterday showed us a true display of talent. Guy's just mad. Winning four games in a row in a Golden Spatula Cup is something that you would never see. Or maybe in, in, a, in a very high skill tournament like this where we have some of the best, if not the best players in the region, it is very quite rare for you to see someone having that big of a brain like Wira, maybe, who's trying to measure his own... IQ no, oh, yes. measuring the massive wins of like Coco, of course. Massive wins of Coco. Oh wait, I thought that he was measuring his his big brain because the only person who has that much is definitely Le Coco. Four wins in a in a row is just it's just mad. <laughs> we are giving us a little bit of a scale there, but talk to me a little bit about who are you excited for coming in today? I mean, I'm looking forward to watching. Um... Stakes on Skipeas actually, and this is going to be. I, I, that, that's, this is going to sound very weird, but it's a second. But I think that we're seeing two players that had very strong placements in the Golden Special Cup number one, right? With second and third, I believe, if I recall correctly. So, and Skipeas obviously almost was the first one to get a repeat GSC win. Sasa took that away from him. Um, but just overall, seeing these players that had very strong start to the season, continuing that form, right? It's not a one and done for them, and I think it's super exciting. Seeing those play people in another day free just is super exciting to me. Yeah, I personally, you know, I was a little bit relieved to see Volta make it through because after the last set, I was worrying about Volta, who is a player that has so much competitive history and so much prestige. And I was like, is this it? Is he not going to be able to keep up? Are players getting better and better? But he's here now and he's saying, nah, I still got it. I'm here and I'm ready to throw, well, not games, but maybe other players out. However, you already mentioned them, Wida. We do have two players with us in just a little bit that we're going to talk to. And it is going to be Skipeus and Stakeser. And we're really excited to talk to them a little bit about how they felt coming through yesterday. But 
take it a little bit back, Morgan. If you're thinking about competitive formats like this, what's something players need to kind of keep in mind when moving from day two to day three? In day two, we saw a lot of URF players, or URF as some would love to call it. Now, it is not just the URF, it is the way that the people played. Yesterday was a day where we've seen a lot of people pivot from their compositions. There were games where we've not seen a single Zon player, there were games where we've not seen a single reroll player, but there were games where we've seen three people contest the same composition. I think in the first game we had four people playing Zon, if I wasn't mistaken, and We've seen a huge variety. Now, this is peak level of TFT. If you go and ask any pro right now, if you go and ask any streamer right now, everyone will say this is the best set they played. I mean, not everyone, but at least most of them, and I agree to that. The flexibility in this set is really huge. You can reroll anything from Kale to Rek'Sai to Zed to you name it. You can play almost any ED comp. Some sometimes the dies are viable. Yes, it's kind of hard to pull off, but they're kind of viable. Zeddy is now back, even without the Piltover start, if you're able to get Zons in, if you're able to get some good Gunners in, it also works. So I think that this this set and this Golden Spatula Cup had the biggest variety of viable comps that you can take into a win in a few games. Yeah, yeah I agree. Me. I think, sorry, the meta has been looking extremely diverse for the most part. Lots of comps that I like, you know, a little bit of one cost re-rolling, a little bit of some Mira carry. I'm, I'm not immune to that. I think that's quite exciting. Uh, I know, Vida, you're getting excited about some other units. I mean, I, I keep talking about Rek'Sai, but I'll, honestly, uh, unit-wise here, I think that we just think, I think Urgot is like something that I speak a lot about Urgot. I think, uh, but not doesn't necessarily get recognized as important as it actually is, right? Because that eye composition, right, Morgan? Uh, a, a lot, but like Urgot 2 is honestly more important than the failures to in that composition, it feels at times at least, right? Like that's kind of what I'm looking at in that composition in general. You're looking at the, you're looking, the two-star Urgot is a big tank. It also dives into the back and does a lot of damage and threatens that at times as well, which is super important, getting that chip damage in there, getting the strong secondary carry online. And it also goes into the composition with, with the Seri, right? It's a, a big unit here and uses a lot of song mods very well as well. Yeah, we'll go a little bit more into detail on those songs in just a little bit, so you can already prepare your notes for that. But before, we have some more exciting content for you, because like I said before, we have two players with us. Here are Scapaeus and Stakesor. Welcome, you guys. I hope you're doing good today. We're very excited you both made it to day three. Scapaeus, how are you feeling being in a position where you might win yet another Golden Spatula Cup? Hey, um, I mean, it's to be expected, right? I'm a bit upset I wasn't the first person to win um, the, what, what would it be? The Tactician's Crown Cup, I guess, if you win two of them, right? But um, maybe I can be second. Oh, that's a good plan. Stakes are for you. Of course, no Golden Special Cup to look back on yet, but it might be your first one to take it all. How are you feeling? Um, I don't really know how I get ended up on day three because I didn't play very well the first two days. <laughs> but, but I'm happy to be here and I hope I do well today. Stefan, we hope so very, too. I have a very important question for you, Stakes yeah. Did you sleep? <laughs> yes, I did get some sleep. <laughs> I, I don't know how many hours, but I did I did get some sleep at least. Some <laughs> sleep. I like how he's uh, like very, very honest with it. Just some sleep. He did get he, he got some sleep, but some. Can you be more specific with some? Is it thirty minutes? Is it? Oh, a few hours? hours. Four hours. Four hours. Four so hours. That's, okay. that's good enough. That's good enough for this. Okay, it might be enough for you, but Skipeus, do you think that four hours would be enough sleep for you to compete in the final day of Golden Special Cup? No, I I need eight or nine hours oh. at least. At least. So I'm the only one that falls into a deep coma. Now I feel like a normal human being. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I also, you know, big fan of sleeping. I think I had like nine hours today. So uh, I can give you a little bit of my hours of sleep stakes or if you're feeling tired at some point. But we did want to talk to you guys a little bit, of course, about the meta as well. We were saying that right now, in comparison to previous Golden Spatula Cups, it does feel like the meta is pretty diverse. Of course, there is a little bit of a caveat with people on Piltover or having that Samira early where you kind of feel like, oh yeah, this guy is definitely more in the line to go top four. But Scapaeus, you've been known for finding these kind of edge cases where you make a comp good that usually people don't expect to be good. How are you feeling about the meta in general? 
I definitely feel this meta is way more restrictive than previous GSC, and that's because four costs are a lot better in comparisons to pretty much everything else, which means you have a lot less gold to play with on stage three because it's difficult to justify rolling down. Um, so I feel like this meta is, yeah, very restrictive. There isn't really all that much room to innovate, and really all the edges you can get are from scouting and positioning, not much from like team building compositions uh, and such. And what about you, Stakes? Or you've been uh, leaning, I think, a little bit more into the meta just based on what we saw from you. How are you feeling about how it all plays out right now? It definitely feels uh, a bit harder than last patch that GSC was on. Um, I think everyone has kind of figured out the patch in a way, and you just have to play the, the good comps. And you find, like Skipeo said, positioning and water tests and things like that. It's uh, it's a bit restrictive with your openers, I think. Mm. All right, yeah, you both seem to be in agreement. But Morgan, I get the feeling that you have an important question to ask. Yes, Skipeo, I love your camera presence a lot. I love the way you speak about tournaments and comps and stuff. But I want to ask you a very, very decent question. I bet Go that you it. love talking about this. Skipeo. If you would name two names for me in this tournament, in day three, competing in Golden Special Cup, who is the most overrated player in your opinion and who is the most underrated player in your opinion? The most overrated? Man, okay, I need, I, okay, I need to pull up the player list. list. Let's see. Okay, here you go. So now we know that he got nothing personal with anyone, okay? So the answer was not immediate. Uh, I, I do, but those players didn't make it to day three, you see. Um, <laughs> so does that make you happy that they didn't qualify to day three? Okay. Overrated players tend to be famous streamers because people think that being familiar with a player means that the player is good, and that's not the case. I'm going to say the most overrated player in day three has to be day sick, right? Day and sick. Oh, my God. <laughs> the most underrated player. It's just like, oh God, what did I get into? <laughs> what a Let's do? see. <laughs> okay, I have watched a lot, uh, a decent amount of Polish league, played with the guy a lot on ladder. I think people are okay. sleeping on Fifak. I think Fifak is one of the favorites for today. I'm not sure how okay. much he uh, he mastered this patch, but historically, I think he is probably one of the more underrated players in the top 32 here. I love it. I love it. I would love to see you in the lobby with Dasik, by the way. This would really make a lot of content for our Twitter page today. So social media managers, you're welcome. I got you some content. All right. <laughs> going going, going from, from underrated and to potentially overrated here, we have some comps that you guys uh, both navigated yesterday that we would kind of like to, to show you here, right? And I mean, it's not so much of a comp here on the, on the left side. It's more about the... Um, the, the legendary flex comp, then we also you play the game uh, of Noxus Reroll, where you also ended up going for the for the false star clad. So, what does that false star clad optimization kind of add to an already pretty strong Noxus board? Um, mostly style points. I wasn't sure if it was stronger. I was pretty <laughs> sure both of the versions win, so I decided to go for the style points. I'm not sure if it's better. Fair enough. Well. That's a good answer. I'm always down for some style points, and it definitely did look shiny and sparkly, so we're not complaining here. But Stakesor, we uh, already mentioned you were leaning a little bit more into the Noxus comms, but there was this one board that you're seeing on broadcast where you leaned into the Sorcerers. I assume it was because you got that Deathfire Grasps, but how are you feeling about comms like Sork in general in this meta right now? What, what do they need to actually make it to the high end? A bit of a high roll comp where you you hit early and you snowball and uh, you just delete people's boards in two seconds with it and you don't care about the chance to just explode everything. Um, I like it from a position where you only have AP items because I don't really like contesting challengers too much and it feels like one of the more consistent comps that if you have AP you go you go for for challengers mainly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on back to Skipeus. We spoke about the meta, we spoke about the, the legends, we spoke about the comps and all of that, but if you had a chance to remove one augment from the game, what is that one augment that whenever you see it's just like, oh man, this, this, this is disgusting. We got to remove that from the game ASAP. You are now 
with the power enough to remove one augment from the game. What is one augment that you do not want to see ever in your games? Oh, I think you. I think I have the same answer as absolutely everyone else. It has to be final reserves, right? It, that's reserves. by far the worst <laughs> yes. defender. To hold, yes. Okay, I, I was gonna ask things or the same thing, but he already answered me. He was <laughs> thinking to shake hands well on that one. He was like, I oh can give God, yes. I can give two more answers as well, which would be two cool more. fact and endless horde. Where two more. It, okay. it, it is like it just makes matchmaking RNG so rough. Where like, oh, every stage you face the cruel pactor, and then someone didn't, and then they're 30 HP more than you. It feels really rough. <laughs> okay, so now we got three very hated augments. Uh, cruel pack was it, and then endless horde, and uh, Skipeus, you said they remove final reserves. So these yeah. three are the most hated ones. H how come you guys don't really hate the ravenous hunter? I mean, it's nerfed right now, but nobody said hero augments, nobody said ravenous hunter, rift walker. Um, yeah, it's because they are not as strong right now, and okay. because um, so the the most annoying thing about final reserves is that it saves someone from a doom spot into basically a guaranteed top two or a first place, um, which is a lot more frustrating to play with than knowing that you're playing for top two from the get go. If you see someone in the previous GSC getting Ravenous Hunter, for example. Yeah, it's like your ex graveyard giving everyone a Zephyr and then the Robby just goes into hell. Yep, yep, I agree with you. Final reserves should be removed from the game. Mace! <laughs> yeah, I mean, hopefully you guys don't uh, have any final reserve players in your lobby today. I'm crossing my fingers to you and wishing you all the luck with that. Our time here, sadly, is over, but I'm hopeful that we're going to hear more from you in the future for now. Of course, uh, you do have a little bit of time stakes, so why don't we start with you this time around? Anybody you want to shout out going into this final day? No, it would be uh, Lalana for helping me <laughs> to do board reviews every night, watching me high roll my way into day three. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> and uh, the other people, Manatee, who unfortunately went out day two, and uh, Audra, Barry, and Muck, uh, the people, the boys. Yeah, uh, when you're mentioning Muck, I of course have to say don't give in to the Rex Ivory role, right? Keep that in mind. <laughs> I don't get baited. No, 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 no. <laughs> Very good. Skip, what about you? Anyone you want to shout out? Yeah, shout out to Travis and Laluk, as always. Always sharing hints, knowledge, bouncing ideas off of helpful people to have around. Awesome. So good luck in your games. We're going to see you out there. And thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's always so good. Even if there's a little bit of spice, you know, it's just, I love talking to our players. It, it makes scared me. So happy. me. He, he just went, <laughs> no. And then two seconds of silence, and then he, he mentioned like six names, then what was it? No, you did give sh a shout out to somebody. This went like, no. I'm like, oh my god, Skipeus affected him. And then he's like, oh, I want to shout to XX. Uh, scared me for I think that. it was more like a now, like, a, you know, like a, a, a thinking about word, but... Remembering, remembering, yeah. I did mention that we do have a little bit of segment to help you guys out. If you've been struggling on the ranked ladder, like myself, losing infinite LP, trying to get up there, trying to make way in this current situation, but uh, we do have some comps here, and of course, most played comp out of this Golden Spatula Cup. It has an immensely high play rate and still a pretty good win rate. Still, it has to be the Zeri Zon. Morgan, why don't you talk to me a little bit about this comp? Yeah, Zerizon really relies mostly on getting your, your comp into two-star as fast as you can. But what matters mostly is the augments. A Rage Blade is absolutely a BIS in Zeri. But you can maybe mess in with some items like the Hurricane, like the, the DB, Guardbreaker, whatever. She triggers them really quickly. But just as Rita said, and just as Rita is going to tell us about the mods and the augments, which are really the pinnacle of the strength in Zon, Urgot is as important as her, but Rita... Mods play a huge factor in making Zone better, don't they? They absolutely do, right? And the, the, the main way you gotta be looking out for here is gonna be that robotic arm. At the start, I said it was mainly an enabler for Jinx reroll. That's not really where we are at the moment, but it is the best augment, or it's the best modification, sorry, for, for Seri. And even then, like, it's a, a quick rundown of what, like, what each mod does. Like, you have the adaptive implant, which is just like bonus. Uh, at that AP and AP and healing when you're above 50% HP. And uh, then you have the exoskeleton. That 
this negative effects and just provides more tankiness to, to your frontliners. And then you have the bio which like creates like a spreading plague that just kind of amplifies the, the team's damage on the units that have that effect. And Shimmer Injector is an interesting one because it provides some attack speed, but it also provides a sort of a GA effect, a second life, if you will. And then the, the other one, I think the most fun one, is going to be Chemtang, which is basically just, haha, unit go boom, which is mainly combined with that Jarvan you see on your screen with a Sawn Emblem, because when Jarvan goes into the enemy backline, that's the entire enemy backline going boom and most likely dying, because it scales with max HP. So you get some HP on that, on, on that Jarvan, and the entire backline is gone once he gets focused. Yeah, and uh, you know, if you want to listen to Chad and you think this is fake, and really all you should be doing is Kale reroll, we got you covered because we know here's Kale. And uh, the biggest thing with that comp is managing your economy to actually get to level nine, right? If you want to have Kale reroll online, you need level nine to fully empower her. You need all of those massive units, and you need the Poppy Four because she adds so much CC. It's ridiculous. So. If you're running this comp, make sure you know how to get through the mid and late game to actually reach those high highs and level. And then I'm sure you can also get some LP with that one. But because we're a little bit short on time, we're going to jump right over to our Twitter giveaway, which uh, you should check out if you're in the market for some TFT eggs. You know, we've been doing this contest a couple of times. There's always something new. Yesterday, we asked you about your top two players. Today, we're going to ask you who is going to win today. And it doesn't matter if you're right or not. It just matters that you're being creative with your answers. So head on over to our Twitter page at TFT Esports EMEA and slide in those comments. Yeah, and this contest is dedicated for you guys because the last time I participated in the Finding Team one they said that I couldn't win, so <laughs> use your chance. Because if I was able to participate in that one, no one would be winning, but this you, one... You read the terms and conditions, Morgan, right? I know they're boring, but sometimes you just got to read them. I, 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 I'm sorry to say, but if you're just... TFT uh, players and reading, Wida, get you out. You can't read. Exactly. No, like... Come on, man. Imagine I'm reading what guy. an ability does, by the way, right? You just, you, just look at the, you just look at what the ability does on the screen. Doesn't matter how much damage it does. It's all about like the eye test. There is no such thing as reading the tool set. Yeah. Do you ever press agree and continue, but read before that? No, I don't think you do. I think everyone also, just presses agree and continue. It's called a I tool hope, tip, not a tool law, right? So I hope you all are reading because we have more information coming your way. The Super Brawl is going to be back in a very familiar format. Mark your calendars. The 8th of September is when it starts. Three days of team fight goodness for you guys out there regional competitions of course if you are from the emea region you're interested in playing in the super bowl some of the trcs are still looking for good teams to compete there so you might still have a chance to slide into this one it doesn't qualify you for the emea finals but it gives bragging rights and we all know that these are very important and competitive esports reminder same format as last time Wida. why don't you take us through what's going to happen yeah, so we are putting the team in team fight tactics, right? We are going to put a 4v4 knockout bracket up here. We're going to be playing best out of freeze between the teams. So we combine the points that are earned normally. So that means there are going to be some fun things in there. Are you going to make your board strong enough because you're going to attack your teammate? Or how are you going to do it, right? We saw some hate drafting last year where like people just holding Yasuo as a fun with the last roll. It was absolutely ridiculous, but... We have a, a full on the group stage knockout bracket, and then we're gonna finish it all off with a best out of five between the two strongest teams in, in this 4v4 fashion. And the good news, they just keep on coming because if you were here for the last Golden Spatula Cup, you know we have something very cool lined up for a final day of competition today, and it is our alternative lobbies. As soon as games start, the Twitch Commander Center is going to open up, and you actually can choose which lobby you want to watch. We have all of these talented, amazing casters here today with us. Of course, we're going to be taking you to the main broadcast lobby, but for every single game, we do have a talented caster pairing lined up with a little bit of a different focus for these teams. You can choose which one you want to indulge in and, of course, always follow your favorite player. Now, if English is not your cup of tea, we also have, of course, our co-streamers ready, whether it is Espanol, Deutsch, uh, Frances, 
I think Polsky or, or whatever language you're interested in, you know, I'm practicing, I'm trying to get there. Maybe one day I can deliver this uh, this part in, in full uh, non-English. We'll see if, if I can make that, but check them out if that's what you're interested in. And with that, I believe our in-game casters are about to be ready to take us through game number one. So really quickly, Morgan, what's one comp you want to see? One comp that I want to see? Um, Ashley roll. Okay, Ashley roll. Wida? What do you think? Rexa, okay. Church. We're in the church of the kill. Because that's the, that's, you know, <laughs> that's the, the best voice. Honestly, that's the most like enjoyable thing about playing Rexa. It's, it's like the sound that she, like the sound that they make, like the, the unit makes. It's like such like menacing sound. Oh, wait, yeah. wait, wait, wait. Menacing I see sounds? No, 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 no. No more oh, comments. Our casters are ready. We are ready to start the game. And Patches, Panda, and Counterfeit are here to bring you game one. Oh, oh boy, I was making get on with it sounds over in the green room because we're very much looking forward to getting things started today. For anyone who has to come to join us late, of course, for this event, the Golden Spatula Cup number two, players from all across Europe, Middle East, and Africa converging on this three day tournament to compete for their spots in the EMEA Regional Finals on October 20th. Today is the final day of that Golden Spatula Cup number two. Just six short games of TFT to see who will claim the 11th Golden Spatula Cup and guarantee their spot at Regionals. My name is Canafit, joined by Impetuous Panda. And Panda, we have had a hell of a tournament so far. We have, and the 32 players today are going to be playing at an excellent level. They're the players that have the best read on this patch. They're performing at their peak level. And a lot of great names coming in here, like Dasic, for example, Skipeus, Lalana, a lot of the OGs from TFT way back in the day are still playing and are still smurfing in many of these lobbies, many of these tournament days. So just really pumped to see what they bring to the table today. Yes, yeah, absolutely going to be a fantastic mention. Of course, we've got so many returning players from times gone by. We've got a good variety of places these players are coming from as well. I believe 16 different countries in our top 32 playing here today. And 10 of those countries have never won a GSC. So we've got a really big chance to make the day of a lot of our fans watching here today. We did on the desk have a little bit of a moment about talking about what kind of compositions that they were hoping to see here today. Panda, from your end of things, are you also a Rek'Sai reroll enjoyer? I am not. I think it's uh, disappointed me a little bit too much, this this set in general. I think from some spots, it, it's, it's really fantastic with Bruiser Heart, for example, with Transfusion, uh, especially the Prismatic version. Uh, there are some thoughts you can really cap out and win games entirely, but Overall, if you're relying on hitting Rek'Sai 3, I'm not sure what it is about this unit, but it just seems that it's the one unit that I cannot 3-star compared to all of the 3 costs in the game. So I try and shy away from it. So it was mentioned on the desk as well. Yeah, of course, Zarya now got very, very popular, but something another composition that we've been seeing also having a massive impact is this Belveth Legendary board. You know, so somewhat popular in day one, picking up even more popularity in day number two. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you know that kind of measures up against the Zeri composition? A lot of Belveth and, and these legendary units is just the fact that you have to make it there in the first place. Uh, so there is some confirmation bias with things like you know all that shimmers, giving you a ton of gold, it being a very strong augment, and then that comp being accessible, let's say, final reserves, as Capace was mentioning, uh, kind of the same fact. In TFT, in an ideal patch, five costs are the best units in the game. Uh, and I think we're in that place now, where you have things like Belveth, things like Ari, completely dominate once you hit them two-star. Uh, so that's really, I think, the, the main reason for that. If you have the gold and the resources to make it to that board, you know, most of the times you will, as long as you have the correct items, the correct augments. So it's really about having enough resources and playing the, the early and the mid game well enough to have access to that to that board and that comp. So if we're talking about compositions that will be consistent for you, Noxus has definitely been getting the job done. But we'll come back to that in a minute because we have got our players on the line here. So as noted before, Skipper is talking to us a little bit before the stream started and also returning Golden Spatula Cup champion. And Stakes are as well, all playing in this lobby. For you, who are you looking at the most closely, David? I think Stakes has had a very surprising start of this set nine with two day threes in a row. Not really known as, as you know one of the top performers in EMEA in the past sets. He's been there. He's been a little bit consistent in, in GSCs, but not to this level. So I'm really excited to see where this train stops, if this train stops, if he just keeps going, if he maybe wins this tournament altogether, considering his very high placement in GSC number one. It's worth noting as well here in day three, while Sasa, of course, who is our first two-time Golden Spatula Cup champion, is not able to come back and try for a third crown. We have got a lot of returning players, as you mentioned. Yes, you know, Capaeus and Stegsor, uh, you know, they were the top two and well, between them, the top three of the previous tournament. 
Skipeus got number two, Stegzol got number three. So it's quite a thing for them to be able to come back and challenge for the top spot in Golden Spatula Cup number two. Portals are loading in, and I think some players are just not even going to vote because they are not really content with the options they've been given. <laughs> uh, at least for a competitive game mode, there are very tricky things happening with every single one of these portals. Uh, I think, yeah, Catalyst and Jim Ray just don't even care. They're they're kind of against every single one of these. Uh, and for many different reasons, Peter, if you want, I can go through them a little bit. Um, Marisol Magnum is very difficult if you low roll your opener because everyone has an extra fawn. Everyone essentially deals a lot more damage in stages two and three. So if you're playing in a kind of an open fort strategy, you get punished so much more than usual. Well, one we will be seeing in this one is the Hall of the Nine. So all of our players will be getting extra stuff dropped into them throughout the game. You know, we have seen a fair amount of different portals which kind of give you more stuff as a general rule. But what makes Hall of the Nine particularly you know, different from those? Different, I would say dangerous, maybe, as a word as well to describe this one, because uh, there is a lot of variance. Obviously, what you get is is kind of random to some extent, and it's kind of very warping in terms of how a normal game plays out. And for some players, they might high roll and get exactly what they want with all these different drops. Uh, for other players, they might low roll, and, and there's going to be a big gap between those two. So this is the tricky thing about this portal. Um, it can't really work out for some players, but for others, they're going to feel like maybe they got punished. Yeah, and it's not certainly the way which our players would have liked to start today. It's, of course, incredibly high stakes for them. All the players, at least having made it to day three, will get some golden spatula points, which will ideally help them get to the regional finals. But the only spot that is completely guaranteed is if you win the entire competition, which is a very, very tough thing to do. Segzo, of course, seemed relatively humble coming in today. Perhaps he's got a chance of making it happen. Check the Zonma there, was not virulent or robotic arm, so now we're going to really try and pry out the Zeri comp as much. I think it's, it's a very good habit to have to always, you know, check this and have full information the moment that you can do it. So stage one is ideal, obviously, in this case for Stegzor. He does have a Samira online, which, uh, as we know, uh, for unfortunate reasons, is the strongest over in the game right now. It really makes playing stage two a little bit easy mode for most of our players. So noticing a couple of somewhat, well, I'll say one relatively unusual and one more unusual augment coming in as we've got silver augments coming out early on. So legend choices for Daisic, Earth, but the one which really caught my eye was Lalana bringing out Ezreal into this game. Not something we've seen often at all. And we saw their Piltover start for Stigs or with Laden Forge as well, which is really, it's really perfect. Uh, when you're playing in stage two, especially and, and picking your augment, you want to lean into what the game is telling you. If you're playing for a loose streak and you give, get an augment that gives you, uh, you know, an Orn item seven rounds later, it's perfect. You're, you're playing to lose anyway. You're not, you don't need combat strength. You don't need an item right now. So really leaning into that and it's going to be a very, very strong start for Stigs or as long as no one messes up his, his loose streak. You see the latent forge has been popular across the field, but Taking the second to look at Lana, we've got here, picking just a sign to go for the level three early on. You know, of course, there was the period of time where Ezra was absolutely everywhere. Getting the gold per drop removed means it's a little bit less powerful than it has been previously. What do you think Lana's going for here to bring out this most unusual legend right now? I think identify that he really wants to have items and really wants to win you. Lana's a player that historically is a very strong early game player. Uh, sometimes, again, you can't fight the game. He doesn't have much of a strong opener, so we'll stay on level, th on level three and just try and work for his econ right now. But Ezra really helps in terms of having a very strong early game, having lots of items to slam, especially going into comps that have multiple carries that you want to itemize a lot alongside a tank, for example. It'll be really helpful to have all these different items. So that's that's the main idea. For day six here, challenger, emblem off of the, the branching out. Uh, I think is a player that is comfortable playing all kinds of different lines, so he's happy to go into a bit of a random mode. Does not get punished. I think this is one of the stronger emblems for that challenger comp. Well, talk to me a little bit about challenger then, since it was a composition that flew somewhat under the radar in days one and two, but certainly saw a decent amount of play. Compared to, you know, what we've been seeing a lot of, you know, the Jinx compositions and the legendary compositions, how does it kind of fit, you know, in with them? Is it generally a decent composition for a top four, top one? Mostly top four, uh, you really have to high roll, uh, you know, being able to go fast nine, having like a, you know, Ionia emblem or challenger emblem on a Heimerdinger, for example. Um, a lot of things has to go right for you to, to top one, but it's a very consistent top four comp, as long as you understand what challengers want. They want a lot of combat power, combat strength, augments especially. Uh, they want lots of items on, of course, Kai'Sa and, and the Yasuo. And an emblem always helps because challenger and Ionia emblem are both incredibly good on some very potent legendaries later into the game. So there's a way to play challenges into the top four, but there's also that little window of time later in the game to cap out your board and have the potential to win out if you're strong enough. 
So here in the final day of the competition, from where you're sitting, from what you know about these players, you know, are we? Are you expecting to see the majority of them trying to play a more safe style, trying to get, you know, trying to scoover up as many GSC points as possible with a strong overall finish, or do you think they've got, you know, they've got the kind of personality to want to go for that first place and actually winning the cup overall? I think it's more dependent on what kind of openers you get and where what the game is leading you into. But I think everyone here, uh, you know, has their own pride both personal and national on the line. They kind of want to do well. They want to almost try and guarantee the spot in a regional finals, which is the big, um, I think, you know, most interesting aspect of these tournaments is not so much getting these points, but trying to go for that high roll, getting that, you know, just outright win, both for your own personal brand and also the guarantee of being in finals and having that path towards the world championship. It certainly takes a lot of pressure off of to get a reminder that we have got a young wild and free in the mix here, allowing for a little bit more shenanigans getting out that first grab. Jim Ray picking up the spatula early on. This is what I wanted to bring up with you, David, that we do know that on the drop table, it's not guaranteed, but it's possible that Hall of the Nine will provide these players with a spatula during the course of this game. So it could be very powerful for Jim Ray later on. Precisely, and there's still a ton of you know very strong emblems you can craft with spatulas. For example, Sorcerer, I think opens up Sorcerer's a viable comp really in terms of your level seven roll down and, and what kind of board you're gonna have. Uh, same with Challenger and Ionia, I think very very strong emblems. And as we're seeing here, Noxious as well, uh, very strong not just because of the emblem itself, but because you can actually kill a, a pretty bad component in Noxious, which is the belt, uh, by making mm. it into an, an emblem. So it's actually very very relevant. So talk to me a little bit about Noxus then, because you know, again, we mentioned it just before we started as a competition that has been extremely reliable across, you know, across the entire competition, really. There were, you know, there were some sort of mutterings of maybe we'd be seeing more of the, you know, the reroll style of things, but it seems like Darius and the standard setup is working very, very well for a lot of different players. It's just very strong, lots of buffs across the board. Samira, Swain all got buffed. Uh, they're all overperforming to what they should be doing on most of these boards in stages two and three. And there used to be the punish before of, hey, you're playing Noxus, you're not win streaking, you're in big trouble. Uh, but I think there's still a very viable uh, pivot into challengers in the mid game if you don't have that high roll opener, if you can't get those stacks. Uh, maybe you don't have the gold or the access to the six Noxus uh, somewhere in stage three. So I just think it's very strong. All the units, you know, Darius himself can be a great carry. Uh, there's ways to cap out the comp as well with legendaries later on, especially with Noxus Emblem on things like a, a Belvet, for example. Um, it's just, yeah, any, anywhere in the game, any part about the comp itself, even the, the Prismatic Augment, the Crown, uh, is just very strong. So it's, if you have access to it, if you have the opener, I think you almost always go for it. Let's check in with Ineffable coming into us uh, with a pretty solid Shurima start. Here's some social distancing as well and the Dead Eyes. Yeah, we've seen a little bit of action being played, and of course we can see it on Jim Ray's side of the board as well. Working very well for Immeffable for the time being. Managed to get some early two stars in the mix on the back line as well. But I wonder if this win streak will remain in place. It's going to be tough. The Auction here trying his best, but Darius claws in, not quite able to clean it up. Uh, Shurima is going to be a very strong straight or straight in stage two as well, um, as well as these Auction itemization. You're missing a DB ideally to get this uh, Runan to have a little bit more effect. But it is still a fairly strong board here, and you're very rich as well. You know, five win streak, 50 gold at this point in Krugs. Uh, it's a really good spot to be in. So let's take a wider view of things, as we've got both Dasic and Ineffable, you know, running to bring quite, especially in Ineffable's case, bringing a lot of gold out of stage two. You know, we talked about that there's, you know, the potential to bring in these big legendary comps longer term. You know, is that what you'd like to be seeing from one of the players who have managed to streak for the early game? You know, set, turn that money into a really big late game board? It's gonna depend. Uh, off of high streak, you can't really decide that just yet. It'll take you know a little bit longer, a little bit more of a high roll all throughout stage three. It'll depend on your three two augment as well, the itemization you have. Uh, hopefully, hitting an early level seven uh, legendary that you can kind of uh, use as a secondary carry for the most part. Uh, but really, it's about I think Noxus is, is the most accessible uh, you know comp to get into legendary, just because you have so much power and the board is so cost efficient. Where you haven't. Usually don't have to use so much gold if you high roll the six noxes without rolling too much. And then you have the, the very easy option to go into the legendary board. But looking now, Alana, he has decided to go into Kale. He has six kills already. Getting closer to the Maokai and the Poppy as well. And mm. what a shot there. Definitely a place to stop here, it looks like. And I have to sell Diego as well. Yeah, very, very nice. I mean, you have Kale, a composition that has been performing very, very well, and the two level ups as well there. So just need a few more in the tank to get the three, three stars that will bring eventually on the line our Yordles. But the Slayer Emblem coming in, do bear in mind the lobby has just been giving spatulas across the board. 
Very interesting to slam the Slayer emblem onto the Poppy. Not something I've seen before, not something, uh, something I've done before. Uh, not sure how good it'll be. If it's Alana slamming it, I'm guessing it, it will be good. Uh, but usually I, I see it more on just uh, any unit just to get the Slayer buff online, not really caring too much about the emblem itself. And then later on, transferring it over to, to a five cost. No, I'm with you there. It does seem to be puzzling. At least it will mean, I suppose, a little bit more damage to the Poppy, but certainly tankiness is going to be her main role. So we come in, we're going to get ourselves some Silver Augments to help carry things on. On the right-hand side, Lalana and Stegzor down towards the bottom, as some duplication is in order for Lalana. Takes the army building knowing that he's already hit the three-cost, three-star Poppy, already hit the three-star kill as well. Just needs one more Maokai to get the two, or just maybe just two more Maokai to get the immediate Maokai three there, and, and be, make sure to have that Poppy four-star as soon as possible. We check with Ineffable and Dasic. They're both undefeated as of the entirety of Stage 2. And now into Stage 3 as well. Dasic managed to pick up a second Challenger spot. Means he's up to Challenger 6. Not a ton of upgrades as of yet. But the board is still looking pretty scary at level 7. Rolled heavily here as well to try and maintain his win streak. Six win streak now. If you continue winning, essentially you're getting the same gold you'd get from being at 30, 40, 50 gold interest. So there is the incentive to roll down very heavily in some very niche cases, this being one of them, simply because of the, the trade spike with six challenger. Uh, you can almost guarantee a win streak if your board is strong enough, especially if you have the two cost, two star upgrades. Yeah, that guarantee pays off for Dasic. He will remain the only undefeated player as we do see Skipeas starting to build up some power of his own. Now, one of the things I want to bring back in from Skipeas' interview was talking about, you know, he was saying that his biggest you know, strength was, you know, scouting and positioning in the lobby. You know, that's the secret to his success. Where are you on that kind of, you know, approach? Do you feel like that's the largest part of what gets our players across and two places like day three? I think with how even the competition is at this level, everyone knows what the strongest units are, everyone knows what the strongest comps are, what augments to pick for the most part. Uh, I think it is one of those things that really helps you min-max uh, your results and overall your performance in a tournament like this. It's the biggest Good differentiator Lord. between tournaments. And as we're seeing here, Daysig didn't hit many things on his roll down, but he has hit a Belveth with a Challenger emblem, a Hodge, and an IE. This is what I was talking about. This is what gives you access to those fast line boards. An incredibly huge power spike when you're already win streaking like Dixic is, means that he's going to have the chance to maintain this tempo, maintain this win streak for quite a long time, and propel himself and resources back up to those fast eight, fast nine boards. The only problem with that is Lana has started to build up a decent amount of strength. I don't think it's quite there as of yet, with only the single item on the Kale, but has managed to hit the three yodels, which brings this board in line. I can see Lana is not having... Uh, oh no, I thought for a second that was a little look of frustration, but... Maybe oh, I think, I think there were several, several looks of frustration. He was shaking his head <laughs> as the fight started. Uh, we do know the spatula was the reward from the Hall of the Nine at 3-1. That's what I was talking about in terms of it being kind of uh, maybe irrelevant for some comps and some players and very relevant for others like Challenger uh, for Dasic there. And also Jimray, who had that open spat and has a Texas Fawn. We're seeing now Skipay is picking one up as well. So it just really warps what should be a normal game of TFT into a game where you have to be able to adapt and balance yourself, your comp around what you're being given, which is, for the most part, random. We're about to head over to Stagzor because there's, I mean, of course, the Piltover situation from much, much earlier on is very close to getting a hefty looking cash out. Needs to put together a board that can get the win, of course. Already has picked up an Urgot. Hopefully finds a Zeri along the way as well. But no, picked up the Cassidy and picked up the Vi as well. So overall could be a strong board. You will have to maybe itemize the Jink, but no, he does find a Zeri in the very end here. Has to decide what he will be cutting in order to have this Zeri on the board. Picks up the Orn item just in time, hopefully, so he can actually use it for this fight. Looks like he did not. Un oh, he did in the end. Okay, just a visual bug. And it will be Hull Crusher, which cannot get effect on this current board right now since Urgot was not positioned in time. But this should be enough to win, especially when he's playing against Catalyst, who maybe isn't the strongest player just yet, although there is an Ionia Emblem onto this Callista. A long-term Catalyst has got a lot of promise, but you're right, this feels like a big opportunity to get that massive cash out. Unfortunately, I think just short of the line, so Sazon will at least get more Piltover stacks for his trouble, but we move into a further position where there aren't that many players who are going to be vulnerable to getting knocked over at this point in the game. And that could have been a different on that Urgot being positioned for the whole Crusher. So just a little bit of time was missing there in terms of the APM for Stegzer to roll down. Uh, some moments of indecision. He continues to roll down here to try and guarantee he's able to win this next round, considering he's already at 17 HP, Peter. A very dangerous spot to be in. 
I mean, today, you know, we, we're not in a top four situation anymore. And days one and two is all about making it to day three. Now, in day three, it's about getting the best position possible. Stegzor has taken a big risk, but it's been a risk we've seen pay off pretty frequently overall across the days. Stace is up against Jimre, who instead of building that Vision's Crown we were alluding to earlier, has built two Noxus Emblems instead to try and cap out his board, being able to slot in things like the Echo to give the Katarina a little bit more power. Is Stegzor able to cash out here against what should be a very strong board from a Noxus player in this Stage 3? Looks like it's not going to be able to do it. Has Death Defiance on the Darius as well, which is his best item, and we're getting into a very dangerous position, Peter. It's not looking good for Stegzor at all. This is not the way you want to start day number three. I do, yeah, I'm with you there. It feels like the Death Defiance is an excellent item for dealing with more of a trickle damage champion like Zeri. We don't have the two star, but at least Stegzor makes it to Wolves, which gives him an extra round to maybe, if he finds, if he gets really lucky, find an upgrade, at least for the Urgot. The biggest problem and why Piltover uh, succeeds at cashing out usually at 3-5 is because many players are not trying to spike at 3-5. They're trying to greed out until Wolves, get their Econ online, and then roll at 7 and, and roll it down at 4-1. And that's where most players spike. So the chances of Stegs are now facing someone who has just gotten a lot stronger and has hit kind of that next peak in their board strength is a lot higher right now. So it might be tricky if he faces Dasik, who is in his player pool right now, has not lost yet, who has a Belveth with a Challenger emblem, he might be out. Yeah, I mean, Dasik just went to level 8 as well. Russian player very much not messing around here and trying to get himself established very much in the first game. Do you remember, of course, we have got our three other lobbies being broadcast right now from the command center, so you can go and see any single game you choose to while this one is going on, but I don't want to take my eyes off a Dasik board. But fortunately for stakes, or not his opponent for this round. We'll be facing an Ethelbull who is still on 40 gold, so hasn't rolled as heavily as maybe some other players should and, and probably have at this 4-1 mark in the game. The Auction, though, immediately kills off the oh. Zeri, and that is where most of your DPS is coming from. The Urgot by himself, Urgot 1 especially, will not do it. Stegzor, unfortunately, cannot work around the cash out, and he is knocked out in 8th place. That has got to sting. And you look at the HP of the rest of the lobby, it would have still been a lot to make up for as our two silver organs will go into gold to give us our last one of this game and number one. Catalyst, our now lowest HP player, competing for Challenger. Chosen is a great pickup here for the Kai, so that will be the choice we have here. There is only a belt open here, but yeah, gonna. I think that's a huge, huge play to reforge before you open this next anvil, and you're able to get RFC on the Yasuo, mm. so that is best in slot essentially for that Yasuo, at least for these two items right now, and similarly for the Kai'Sa, for the Shojin. Last pieces coming into place. Ineffable. If we've got the longer term future of the Shurima here, up to Shurima 5, of course, with this being the lobby where everybody's been getting these spatulas coming in, that composition is available to be brought online. And I thought with a good amount of money in the bank, going to be relying heavily on the action to get the damage in against Lana. And he's going to try his best to go 8 in the process without losing too much HP. He is fairly healthy now, middle of the pack with 60 HP, but facing up against Lana, who theory has swing, oh. but the Akshan is the challenger. IQ and display gets the perfect angle right through the middle of the board, kills off the kill. Will it be enough though? Can this Slayer Emblem Poppy deal enough damage, have enough Omnivamp to win the fight? And I think she actually might, but no, oh, the last man. cast comes through. The Auction gets things done. You can see, as you noted before, Alana definitely running some frustration here. It feels like under normal circumstances, this Kale board will be doing very, very well indeed, but I think just having the Akshan in the lobby feels like it changes so much of what you'd expect. Dasik has finally lost his last match. He's level 8, 20 gold. The Belveth still doing so much work. And 8 Challenger is online alongside a Zephyr, which allows Dasik to try and maybe, again, outposition his opponents and get some wins that he might not get otherwise. Yeah, this build is absolutely terrifying. We've got the very well placed knockup onto the Kale, which is going to further, of course, ruin Lalana's day. The board is coming together for Lalana, but not quite there as of yet. Kale's at least up to full itemization, but Frontline is falling in the face of just such a ridiculous amount of damage, and there's not enough time for Kale to get ramped up, which is getting Zephyr right at the beginning of the round. We saw the true damage from the Belveth, obliterating most of what the Poppy stands for. She is this mega tank that takes so long to get 
killed off with the redemption with the Omnivan from the Slayer Emblem. In this case, no problem for Velvet to essentially one shot. And already, right away, Escapeus <laughs> with Young Wild and Free alongside Catalyst, they have been let free from their prisons. They're allowed to pick up the component and the unit, more importantly, in this carousel that they most want. And in this case, for Escapeus, it will be a Velvet with a sword. And a really good point out from Shad, who's helping us out with uh, some of the things to spot in this lobby, pointing out the young and wild and free here. Of course, the Hall of Nine is giving everybody these spatulas. Skipers has been able to make sure that he gets the appropriate components to make sure that spatula counts. Looking at the HP totals, Alana with a kill, the Catalyst board, and Jim Ray's Noxious board falling down. But this is a huge upgrade for Catalyst. Has. The Yasuo 2-star has the, the Kaiso, which is not really the best holder of the Ionium, but could be just a temporary holder for now. Just needed to put it on someone to try and get some value on the 6 Challenger, 6 Ionia board. Similar to the Zephyr, Peter, this Yasuo and his positioning is so relevant here, depending on if he's on mm. the Hex he's in now or the one where Irelia is. He will dash directly into the left or right corners. Yeah, that extra range makes him such a nightmare to deal with. In this case, it looks like it won't be so bad because we've got the stuff on the other side, which is more melee-centric than having the individual backline. You can see, that's where it goes in. Deletes a Jin, not so much of a big deal, but still there's plenty of time to build up the challenges and make sure we get a very, very harsh loss handout either way. And that Giga Chan of the Jin somehow survives the Yasuo ult, but Set comes in, cleans it up, just one punch, and he was down. And that's a big win for Catalyst, who has to start Getting this streak of wins now for the rest of this stage four. Jim Ray, so content, so happy. We understand why he lost so much HP earlier on. He had not hit this Darius 3 upgrade yet. But now that he has, everyone else is in big trouble. Death defines Darius, the one of the I think possibly the strongest version of Darius overall. Yeah, absolutely terrifying to deal with. And big bad news for Catalyst and Alana, who are both on the lower end of the HP. Of course, there's no eighth place available stakes or going out early on. But Jim Ray, I can't imagine, is going to be falling down anytime soon. As Alana, I think, might finally get a good matchup, but they have been few and far between. He's playing against what looks like a fairly weak board, considering it is just the Belveth one trying to do most of the DPS work here. The Yasuo does not have any animation, still level one as well. Looks like it should be enough here for this kill, still ramping up the attack speed on the Rage Blade. And the Poppy, as you see here, very much alive, very healthy alongside the Gwen. The only problem for Lana is there's not much gold in the bank, so dreams of a level 9, I think, are very, very far away. I, think, I mean, at least, you know, the good news is, up to 6 Slayer, so there's a lot of damage in the play. But I do worry, you know, we've got a Thieves' Gloves on this Gwen uh, right now, so very reliant on the rolls being good to get the two damage sources online. A pretty unusual state for this board to be in, uh, considering there is no Demacia online. I think a lot of this was because you already have three items on both the Poppy and the Kale, which are you're two really the stars of the show here in terms of damage and, and tank ability. So you're able to kind of cut Demacia all together, not have the usual Jarvan on this board, and instead have the six player fit in. All right, Lana, not enough gold to go further. We got tank items on the Gwen, could be worse. A War Mogs comes in to buy a little bit more time. You can see Lana very much considering the positioning on the Kale because our players in this lobby have been punishing. We know how good this Kale comp can be long term, but Lana may just not get that long term at all. At this health total, especially if you face off against one of these Exodia players who have hit extremely, extremely capped boards like Daysig, like Sinar, like Jimray, who are all wind streaking, Jimray, who just hit the Darius 3, you might be in big trouble. And when you're at 13 HP, that's just one life. So we'll see if you can do it here against Catalyst, who is now at 6 HP. Now, Bulgarian player looking to try and end this swiftly. These two players, I mean, you know, whoever wins here likely will remain, well, we will remain in the other one. Quite possibly will get knocked out, particularly if it's Catalyst on just 6 HP. The Kale is ramping up, though, and the Kaiser can't break through the Hextech healing. Finally, some good news for Alana, but some very bad news for Catalyst. And this fight shows the importance of Gunblade on kill in a comp like this one. You are able to keep the Poppy a lot healthier, but also you're able to survive this chip damage. The Kai'Sa ulted three or four times onto the kill with backline access, was not able to kill the kill altogether. So, so, so relevant to have a Gunblade there. Now, I really like it as well. You know, we've definitely seen a few different choices coming through that over time, but we'll check in with Skapes, who now takes Catalyst position as a player who's only on the one life remaining. This board looking pretty decent. We've got a fully set up Heimendinger. We've also got the Ari as well, but the road might run out here against Dasic. Big Zephyr onto the turret, which is so relevant in these late game boards. The Ari being only one star, 
could be in trouble, especially without a Gunblade here. She could be dying to chip damage as well. We'll see what this Velvet can do on the side of Daysick. Is still alive, is still kicking, but finally taken down, and it should be just enough unless the Kai'Sa casts, and she oh. does. So unfortunate, the timing there, the little HP the Kai'Sa still had, and Skipeus down to 5 HP. Well, good news for Skipeus is Alana gets knocked out in 6. No, down to minus 1. So it's a difference of a single point of HP, which will make a difference of one point in the tournament overall between Sigpeus and Lalana. I think, honestly, based on what we're seeing there, I mean, Lalana maybe could have gone all the way, but just did not have the runway to do it. Jimray stuck on level 7, trying to itemize and trying to make use of his Echo as well, who has a Noxus emblem. Still alive, but at 21 HP, you're still at two lives, thank you, so you do have a chance to lose one if it's not too, too big of a loss and still make it through. Jim Ray definitely not with a lot of money in the bank. Needs to be getting that money from getting these wins. But you look at that Sorcerer line up on the other side. That's an enormous amount of burst early. But the Darius avoids the worst of it. So we'll be able to keep on healing and chunking through everyone. The front line is not amazing. The Swain, I will stand for the time being. A second cast coming for Lux will not even be necessary. Horrible news for Jim Ray. And so much work from that Lux there, able to melt so many different targets there. The Echo was able to get into the backline, but the first target of the Velikos killed it off and then died to the damage coming in from Lux later on. Ionia Emblem could be interesting for a few players, Daysick especially. I'm curious if he's going to go for that. or just trying to fully itemize his carries. That will be Edge of oh, Knights. Boy. I imagine for the Yasuo. Mm. Just a quick word about Turkey overall, because you know, with Ineffable being eliminated there, Sina is still left in as one of the Turkish players. They came into the GSC with a lot of representation, but they lost a ton of players over the first two days. And now there are only these two Turkish players left in the competition. For them both to hit top four is a pretty amazing showing for the country overall. For Steiner, especially not too surprising. I think he's one of the you know standout players from Turkey who has been performing for a long time at a high level and consistently alongside someone like Ging. Oh, absolutely, Ging, of course. Every, nearly everybody's favorite player. Unfortunately, not being able to make it through today. For Jim Ray, though, against Dasik and Sinar, they both got so much HP left in the bank. And we need to see those bottom right hand sorcerers, whether or not they're able to get down the Darius early or if he continues to cut through. And there's Easy Rob buying some extra time, but this Darius will not be stopped. Dunks and kills everything in just one hit. The Noxian Guillotine doing so much work there. Oh, gosh. So, you know, Jim Ray's holding on by a thread. We've got run round until we get to the next PVE as well. I mean, do you think Jim Ray has got enough in the tank here to make top two? Positioning will be so relevant. If things like the Darius get focused down by something like a Lux right away, it, you're going to be in big trouble. You always want to have a Samira and the Darius on the right side to make sure the Samira is taking off armor off of whatever Darius is hitting so he's able to just kill things right away. Gifts of the Fallen is really big for this comp as well. It makes Darius an absolute monster all throughout these last, you know, late game fights. Amazing if he's the last one standing up against the ghost of the challenger board. See how they end up doing here. Again, we, you know, we noted, of course, we've had the uh, Belveth in there with the challenger emblem for a while. She's not up to two star as of yet, so the challenger board not up to full capacity. Jim Ray, of course, though, is exactly where he's going to be for pretty much the rest of the game. There's so little money to, for Jim Ray to build anything else. And we're seeing it there. Once Gifts of the Fallen is proccing on this Darius, he just has so much power overall. He's able to one-shot pretty much everything that stands in his way. If he's able to get these key targets like the Belveth uh, at the very start of the fight, it just skews the fight so much more in Noxus' favor. Oh, absolutely brutal. And of course, we've also got... You know, maybe I'll take back what I was saying a little bit. But Jim Ray, no, I only got the four Katarinas overall for the nine needed to get up to three-star, but... The setup for Katarina in this composition is pretty darn good. We've got Rogue, we've got you know, multiple uh, Chalices of Power and you know, pushing up her power as well. I mean, if Jim Ray could somehow find the three star on her as well, I could even see him going top one. I think being so far away now, there's not really much worth in it. The JG would be interesting. I think it'll be on the Echo here though, despite him, because he is a three star unit right now and Katarina isn't. Mm. Sometimes you roll down, you just don't hit many natural copies of certain units and you kind of forego them from your game plan. It will be Infinity Force in the end onto the Echo. And I imagined a uh, Jewel Gauntlet or the Gunblade if you want to just heal and have Katarina be more of a supportive unit than a unit that's trying to take care and deal damage on her own. Once well, you said before, the Darius needs to be the last one standing, so perhaps giving a little bit more longevity to the comp is what's needed. As Dasik thoughtfully looks across this particular battlefield, we do not have a massive amount of single target damage, so the Darius gets through more or less unscathed. 
The Belveth, the one, only one I can imagine who'd ever be able to take him down, but it wasn't even a little bit close. And this win streak buys more and more time for Jimmy to try to continue capping his board, ideally going eight, and then hopefully finding something like a Heimerdinger would be so, so massive for his board. I think just extra amount of DPS from a cano, but also just the guaranteed Sunder and Shrink from the Shrink module. Sina so going up to level nine, trying to find a way to hop, skip, and jump above Jim Ray. He goes to level eight. We need to get some good rolls to push that board further. But I guess you know, the question now for me is between Sina and Dasik, you know, you know, well, we don't know how far Jim Ray will go, but I wonder about which one will be able to upstage the other. Ion 2 is really big here. Sorcerer really wants to just buy time for the burst to come in from the Lux, from the Velkaz. Unfortunately, no Ari on the rolldown, which is really just not ideal in this case. But Scion, again, is one of the best units for buying time. Jarvan is the same case for the four cost, but for five cost, few units can beat Scion. Uh oh. Yeah. Lux and disruption. Yes. In the corner, Echo just walks forward and deletes immediately, just like we saw with the Kale before. You've got that one point of failure on your composition. These rogues will punish you for it. I don't know if Jim Ray could have done this without having two Nox emblems on the comp. And this is where positioning is so relevant in the late game. We Scapaeus and Stigs are both talked about it in the top of show interview, and we saw why in that case. Lux able to get the rogue proc onto the Echo and then immediately gets bursted down by the Echo who now has the Infinity Force and is able to actually deal damage and not just be a nuisance. Yeah, well, we, I would have to wonder at this point if there's any way for Sana to be able to focus down the Darius when he has to worry more about losing his two carries in short order. They will be side by side, so taking the go for burst over safety. We check in with Dasik who's also gone to level 9, one Belveth away from Belveth 2. Use Cassidy in positioning. The Zephyr comes in onto the Cassidy. Does not get the Lux or the Velkov Zephyr. Ooh. But immediately Yasuo is onto the Lux. Kills it off just by himself. Belveth untouched. Not bursted down by Lux. And that could be a deciding factor for the win here for Daisy. Exa as well has not been damaged at all throughout this fight. It's all just down to the tanks. And the tanks do not have enough damage to clear the Kaisa and the Belveth. I do love this sniper. Yeah, so you mentioned the Rapid Fire Cannon being joined by the Sniper's focus as well. Instant backline access to Sina. Looking fairly unimpressed with that interaction, but we've got some spicy stuff on the carousel. No Ari, unfortunately, for Sinar. The Heimerdinger could be interesting if you have maybe an open spat from um, a spat you could not use earlier on, but I don't think it's the case for any of our players. Redemption will be the case here for Sinar. Trying to work around some AoE damage, add some heal to this frontline as well to, again, just buy some more time. But the biggest thing with things like RFC Yasuo is that it gives so much more player agency. You're able to outplay your opponents. Mm -hmm. You have the access to it at the very least, which is huge when you put it in the hands of players of this caliber. No, no, I mean, that's exactly what you know, Scapaeus was telling to us before. That it was all about trying to find ways to express your skill individually as a player. Sina will start to make some changes here. So the Velkos is out. Oh. Ari is in. Finds a second Ari. Can number three be coming? Has not been found. You've rolled down all your gold. The Ari with Death Heart Gas will be big, but at one start, she is the, at the mercy of being bursted down by, by certain amounts of damage. You know, Rogue Proc like we saw before. On the right side this time, Echo is not going to be able to access that Ari. Then we've seen one of the solutions to the problem of Darius, which is putting him up in the air with a Zephyr, but if your frontline is not strong enough, it just doesn't matter at all. Good lord. Jim Ray handing out the L's to everybody. Sina and Dasik had so much HP just a little while ago, but Jim Ray's board just can't be cracked. Everyone now down to one life. Seven, six, and three, respectively, for the three players remaining. RE2 is the only real cap that Sinar can really play for at this point in time with the gold he has. Again, RFC on Yasuo is so important for positioning. Daisy can win or lose a fight entirely off of this. He's a little while off of this Kaisa 3 as well, just one off, but can't find it. And the Zephyr equally so relevant for this next fight. Oh my gosh, these are the moments of the makings of a player. Do remember again, none of these players have ever won a Golden Spatula Cup, so getting a strong start really puts you in a position to challenge most seriously for it as Jim Ray moves to Darius back, trying to make sure there's no chance of getting nailed out with a Death Bar Grasp early on. he will go onto the Scion, allowing Darius to lap around the corner of the composition and maybe start cutting. Echo on the left has not been able to access the Lux or the Sona that side just yet, but all of a sudden Darius is coming in. The Nox and Guillotine cleans up how Sinar no. taken down, Daysick taken down as well. And it looks like Jim Ray will be our winner for game number one. A great display of three very different comps, but three comps that are definitely comps that we'll be seeing throughout all of today. Sorcerers, Challengers, and this Noxus comp. Incredibly strong in the current meta.
I, and I loved as well, you know, if you have Jim Ray, of course, you know, a player who doesn't have necessarily the same depth of experience behind him, to go through and compete against such good players there and hold his nerve all the way down to the last possible HP. I think it speaks really well of his chances to go very far here today in day three. And one of the biggest, I think, coolest things we saw this game was all three players had a lot of ways to impact these fights in terms of positioning and scouting. All, you know, with Echo uh, on the Rogue comp, the Noxus comp, where, you know, Darius will pass to and how he'll get these Noxus guillotines changed as well. Uh, similarly, for the, the for Daysig with the Shroud and, and the Zephyr. So, all in all, I think a great first game of TFT for this day two, day three, rather. Oh, absolutely astonishing stuff. I mean, you know, I'm certainly expecting to see a lot more Darius as thing goes on, but I think you, you made a really good point there, you know, during the mid-game where we didn't necessarily see the Darius coming through and, or the Noxus comp coming through and getting the immediate strength out, but with the Noxus changes, certainly able to come back and be a force we reckon with later on. So, we're headed to break. We've got five more games to go here today before we will determine who our Golden Splasher Cup number two champion will be. During the break, we'll be hearing it from our tag team multi-time champion, Liu Kuei. Stay tuned. The analyst desk coming up next. Hello, um, my name is uh, Luca and my EGN is Luque. I'm from Italy and I played TFT since the start and uh, I'm gonna play GSC today. Okay, so yeah, I, I got invited and I managed actually to win the Malaga Invitational in Game Police in Spain and with my brother Balotelli and it was such a cool experience like to meet all the players and actually I think the uh, the team mode, like 2v2 or double up, are really good and are gonna be maybe the future of competitive TFT because they're they're really enjoying to watch. Actually, I I think these events are actually really good to develop the community because like you can actually meet your favorite players in person or even if you're a casual player, we can go there and play maybe some games with them. So yeah, I, I think these events are really really good. Okay, so I think um, one of the best performers from Europe and on the previous set was probably Solo because he's always like rank one in ladder, but also like players like Keleluch or the French players like Enzo and uh, Brian, Kelly Coco and of course Double are uh, really strong. Okay, so like a, a tip uh, if you want to qualify on the Golden Spatula Cup uh, is to always have your mental strong. Like don't, uh, if, if you have a bad game, it shouldn't bother you and uh, just play at your best and uh, stay strong. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my community, my awesome Italian community, to my friends uh, Balotelli, Raiko, Zweller, all the Italian players, and Forza Italia. And we're back here at the analyst desk. We were just discussing a lot about this game. And uh, of course, a big defining factor here was the Halls of Nine. In that lobby, this portal just changes everything up. And Wida, you were saying somebody that navigated it really well, on top of maybe a little bit of luck, was Dasic. 
Yeah, and the thing that's worth noting here as well is that the first Halls of Nine take here was a huge influx of gold, right? Which allowed Daisy to push level 6 already on. I think it, was, I think it might have been 2 6. Right? By Crux, at least he was already level 6. Level 7 by 3 2 as well. And as we saw, like, he, him getting that. Belbeth there, obviously 1% is super lucky, but he managed to just like play it out super well. On top of that, he got a second challenger emblem because of the fact that stage two drop was a spat, and then that kind of enabled, that, that kind of just like put a, a massive, massive tempo storm on the ent entire lobby. Yeah, maybe coming back a little bit after Scapaeus called him out as overrated, you know? We don't know, we're gonna figure it out. But Morgan, you were extremely excited about something on Jim Ray's board during that game. Now, before I throw to you, I have to say I was excited to see my boy Echo 3 back. I know he was not the main character. Despite that, I was quite excited to see him come into play, get some items, be a little bit of a helpful support there where the Katarina 3 didn't come in. But you, on the other hand, were excited about the Death's Defiance. Talk to me about that. I was excited a lot about the Death Defiance on Adarius. It is kind of one of the most Exodia items that we love to call them. And it is—it wasn't really just the, the Death Dance, but again, I have to throw back at the start of the stream when we spoke about the meta, when you told me what comps we saw yesterday and we gave the recap, I told you that this meta is really diverse and we can see many boards being let's say, switched up with their main carries, with the units, as long as what you're given. He was given Echo in that game, so he went along with the Echo. He had a Death Defiance on Adarius, so he lived with that. And it kind of made him extremely strong, all thanks to the Lotus. These 2k crits kept him alive for so long, Max. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's a Darius 3. He about to be some Duncan around. Other hand, we did have Sinar with the Sorcerer board. And for me, it was really frustra frust frustrating. That's a hard word to say. Frustrating to watch <laughs> how he just couldn't find that Ari. Finally found her, sold off some other units for it, but it wasn't enough. Just not as strong that RE1, RE2 not coming into play. Extremely sad to see that, but Jimri coming out on top here with this composition. Yeah, I don't think it's also worth noting about the way that he navigated the gameplay earlier on in this game, right? He, he went for that Laden Forge, which means that he kind of sacked off his HP in the early game, picked up a spatula with that open bell, and as David pointed out during the game, he killed the bell by picking up that spat and making um, the first Nox Templum, right? That was, this was before the spat came through the start of stage three, just very good spot recognition coming through from Jim Ray. Yeah, we love to see that. However, we also love to see our standings, at least to... Uh... If we're not a memo fan, what's going on there? Second, or rather two point, a seventh place. But of course, it's only game one. After that, players will have to reset their mental. We're going to be reseeding some new lobbies. We're going to put all of the players that placed at the bottom together in one lobby and the players that came out on top together. And in this case, it's actually going to be Jim Ray, Zulogazang, Fifek, and Ziola Nash, who managed to claw one out with the first place. Really, really good to see. Oh wait, how did Lecoco not win that game? Uh, I think production, th that that standing asset needs to get changed. Lecoco only gets first, baby. He's, he says he has seven points, but I'm sure that this one is wrong. Obviously, I'm just kidding, but Lecoco coming out second again. Looks like he's going to be having a decent start for day three, Wira. Yeah, and I was just like looking around what the players that took first in the lobby kind of play. And I think I looked into it and we had like two Kaplan in their sports. And then we had Solo Gazang playing Aphelios, okay? Uh, I mean, Solo is probably one of the players that play like the most, I believe there was an Aphelios 2 on this board at least, right? But he is one of the players that has a very broad understanding of the meta, uh, really after they place a lot of TFT and is always at the top of the standings, right? So he has a very good, he has very good spot recognition, which is super important on a day like this, where you're just playing in pretty much the same lobby all throughout the day. Yes, they are getting mixed and matched, but being able to recognize the spots where if you're the player that can fall into a niche that is not, may not, may be open and don't play the contested alliance, you can just have a lot of success with that. Yeah, and I think Solo is a great example for a player that is always down to try something new, is always down to, to share knowledge. We, uh, I think, called him Mr. Spreadsheet on day one. Trouble came up with that name. I think it's a very fitting one. <laughs> but with that, I believe our casters are getting ready to give us the next game. They're going to be hopping into the lobby of the winners, Lobby 1. We're going to see how that turns out. Petrus Panna and Counterfeit are here to take you through game number two. Thank you very much, Megs. As you said, we are going straight from our first lobby into our top lobby. So, David, we saw in our previous lobby that going pretty aggro worked out very, very well. Do you feel like that's going to reflect at all in you know how people are approaching this top lobby? 
I think the portal especially well, was the biggest outlier in the last game, so that's what really warped, again, so much of what was happening with emblems, with, you know, fawns, with extra units on the board in stage three, uh, with the Belveth, but that was that was a completely separate separate topic, I think, for day six. Uh, so we'll <laughs> see if we get a more standard here with TFT. Um, it was also silver, silver, gold in terms of augmenting game one, so mm. that didn't at least add to the chaos in terms of prismatics. Uh, but maybe we can get some prismatic openers in this game. I think it's, it's a whole different kind of vibe when it comes to the openers in stage two, if you have access to those. So as we see our players with different approaches to getting ready for this game, Alex decided to you know, take the more meditative approach, Fifex, just making sure that it's playing the social game at the same time. But I love, honestly, I love seeing how players and just the different, you know, what you can read from their faces as they come into what should be an incredibly tightly fought lobby. We're going to see Fifek, who Skepeus mentioned as, as maybe one of the more underrated players currently competing at a high level. Right away, get the, gets that caster blessing from Skepeus, gets a first place in game one. Moving now into game though, three portals are up for the choice here. The options are going to be the Dreaming Pool, Yorick's Graveyard, and Shifting Sands. All Also pretty warping mm. portals, especially Yorick's Graveyard in terms of, you know, Shrouds and Zephyrs in the late game. Oh yeah, and we've seen exactly what it means if you do get knocked out early on and the ice start pouring in. We see Volta being the one to throw the fly in the ointment there and saying, you know what, I feel like having a little bit of re-rolling, but it's not going to happen. Yorick's graveyard for everybody. So as you say, long term, we're looking for these boards to be absolutely stuffed with items. As a reminder, every time a player dies, players will have an armory with four different items to choose from. This could be things like Tactician's Crown even, which is, you know, pretty warping in terms of if you get that choice. Uh, but also, I think the, the biggest thing will be the Zephyrs and the Shrouds. If anyone in this game builds a Zephyr or a Shroud and they somehow die early on, players in the late game who, you know, I think everyone's going to want that utility from a Shroud and a Zephyr when you have already your itemized carry and tank. Um, and we'll be seeing a lot of Shrouds, a lot of positioning diffs happening in, in late game fights. Take a quick glance across at our legends. We can see at least we've got a relatively straightforward conversation. Volta and Valax going for the Earth. Everybody else going for the reliability of the Orn. Look at this opener now. Staying open to the Kale reroll, potentially just going to hold it for now. I think just a habit you should have. Even if you're not a reroll player, even if you're not someone who thinks, you know, Kale is your cup of tea in a tournament where it could be very first or eighth. It's always important to hold these units just in case you get, you know, golden ticket as your first augment, just in case you get somehow six kales in your first shops in stage one. Oh, absolutely. As you know, as we was saying on the desk, you got to leave yourself open for these lines. We do find for Fifek a potential Noxus start here. So we've got Noxus online from the very beginning of the game. No upgrades as of yet, but those could be coming as close as the next shop. Items are a little bit awkward for Noxious, not as awkward, of course, as Cloak or Belt, for example, uh, but you ideally want to have a, a tier start for Samira, just make her so, so strong with a Shoujin or a blue buff. Uh, mostly Shoujin's to have the option to pivot into Challengers if you need to in that mid game. We can see, of course, the, not the only one going down this route of early Samiras. See there, Sana, so many Samiras, you can afford to put four of them out on the board. We'll see if we've got a follow-up that perhaps allows for a strong early play. It will be silver augments once again, so fairly low variance, fairly low amount of resources and power coming into the game. Uh, for some players, it could even come much, much later into the game with things like Lady and Forge, but no, it will be Jeweled Lotus. And this makes a lot of sense. In TFT, you should be trying to, to play around your current board, around your current strengths. In this case, it will be Samira. And because you have a two-star, because you have at least three components here to, to all slam on Samira, um, it'll be the way to go. Gunblade can be slammed on Samira. I think that will be the choice, depending on how strong his opponent's board is in this first fight. We certainly know how powerful that can be longer term. So you take a quick look across the augments coming in. So we see for, for Alex picking up the blood money uh, early on, particularly very powerful. Zulinash as well, the inconsistency. So we've got you know a pretty stark divide between our players picking up some pro proper combat strength augments and uh, a couple of them going very e economically focused. And Coco, who considers to have a, a very strong start here, said, hey, I'm going to go for Young Wallen 3. It won't give me combat power on this board right now, but if I win anyway, I'll be in such a great position to try and, you know, really high roll on these carousels, not just in this early stage, but all throughout this game much later on, these five cost legendaries and the key components you're maybe missing for your comp. Yeah, and of course, that means Coco really needs to be winning to make sure that means anything. Fortunately, it's weak enough boards, especially with these latent forges coming in. That's very possible, especially with Phyalex, you know, who's hoping to lose a lot of HP early on. Very vulnerable to getting run over early. And has his on online already, is considering just playing it for now, so it should be one of the stronger ones on this Jinx. 
We're going to slam the Redemption for now on the set. So a key indicator that maybe he will be going uh, for an AD comp. I usually want to save your tiers if you're playing AP for the most part. But in this case, I think pretty dead set on playing some sort of AD, potentially Zeri in the late game. So, I mean, looking back over our previous game, we were expecting, you know, from based on what we've seen previously, though, to see a lot of, you know, Zeri being played as a strong option. But, uh, you know, certainly from the top comps, at least in the previous game, didn't really show up there at all. Do you think, this, is there any reason why we might be seeing less Zeri than we've been used to seeing on days one and two? It would probably be the Zon mods. We saw only, I think, Stigs or checking it as we were watching uh, on his board very early at the start of the game. And it wasn't one of the two strong ones, which is Robotic Arm and Violent Bioware. So that's the step one. If you don't complete this first step, you kind of take that comp out of your possibilities and close that door entirely for the rest of the game. So it could just be that the few players that had a spot to play Zeri didn't have the right mods for it and decided to go into a different line instead. Let's check in with Coco. Of course, it's been said many times before, but we'll say it many times again. An absolutely astonishing tournament performance for Coco so far. Manages the top one both days one and two. What a thing it would be to win the title here, getting first on all three days. Should be a very easy win here for the Coco, playing against a board that is going to do good at preserving HP with the Samirs and the Cassio, making sure to, as we're going to see here, almost always kill at least one or two units per fight despite losing. So you can work on your econ while also not just straight up open forwarding and losing, you know, going down to 70 or 60 HP at the end of stage two. So how much to keep an unblemished streak, but we'll be first out there onto the carousel, as you can see, to scoop up the first item. It's worth noting the young one of free, you know, popping very, very early on there. So you've got the guarantee you'll get through and get exactly what you want. I thought the Karma had still not even loaded into the to the you know to the carousel <laughs> as Loco was already walking around waiting for everything to load in and to pick his choice of best pairing of units and component. So so relevant in the stage two carousel. Uh, some units like Callista, for example, some of these key three costs like Akshan. Uh, it's a great way to to really boost your early game if you're able to find a key piece of your comp and into your trade tree. And we're definitely in the stage where even the smallest of differences can keep these streaks going or break them. So for Alex and Sinar, the two win streaking players, Jim Raid down the bottom with 76 HP. Of course, uh, we'll keep an eye out for, for Alex as well uh, to see if the blood money comes through. But for the time being, Zulu Nash putting up a good amount of money here is a little bit above the threshold for inconsistency, but it's still getting a decent income. A lot of info right away from what Zulu Nash decided to keep on his bench and what he decided to sell. In this case, sell the Cassiopeia pair, closing the door to some extent to Noxus. I think he probably scouted the lobby and said, hey, there are two or three or four players who have a better path into this comp. I'm not going to try and contest it from a worse spot. Instead, they'll probably pivot into Challengers, has a Deathblade already slammed. It's still open to other AD comps, of course, but for his current board right now, it's looking like a Challenger angle to me. Oh, I, I like the setup we've got here, and I like seeing on the previous rounds of Nash. You're playing a relatively strong board. I think it's what's keeping him a full 10 HP above Jim Ray towards the bottom while still keeping that lost streak going. We check in with Volta. Uh, the Piltover start are uh, pretty darn good, though not a Piltover emblem, instead an Ionian, but with still the chance to reroll if he chooses. And this is where you're at the mercy of branching out and augments that I don't recommend anyone to pick unless you have a very <laughs> good understanding of every single possible line and comp in the game because it is entirely random. You get a Reforger, yes, but that's really all there is to it. And in this case now, Volta is going to cash out that Piltover after the one he was able to get in this round four. And now we'll pivot into an Ionia comp instead. Yeah, well, this is where you've got to be for the rest of the game up against the Nash. Again, has been taking some of these softer losses. So you can see the Volta, have been a pretty decent board so far. I mean, how do you, you know, given that we know that this is going to be where Volta is going in longer term, how are you feeling about Ionia at the moment? I think it's quite strong. It's a little bit awkward in the start of the late game until you get to the capped versions of 6 Ionia with RE2, etc. Um, so it's going to be tough to see how he gets to that point. Uh, you can't just pair it with challengers overall uh, for the mid game. I think the strongest things to do now with challengers and Ionia overall is to lean into six challengers as kind of the tempo option. And if that goes well, then you start deciding to drop challengers and go into an Ionia comp with, you know, legendary units like Heimerdinger and Belveth. So navigating the early mid game is, is the key to success here for Volta. Of course, for any of you unfamiliar, Volta, a very, very long term player in the TFT scene. Yeah, you know, I think somewhat, you know, behind in the conversation against players like Double 61 and more recently Canvas as well. but. An extremely accomplished player who I'm personally very glad to you know to be playing back at this kind of level and in day three as well. 
like not quite able to make 40 gold here in four. So you do need a lot of gold to play challengers overall. You want to ideally roll down at three five and hit the six challenger mark if you don't have an emblem for it. Um, looking at the items here, can do a lot here. Has part of an RFC can build an edge of night as well. Obviously not ideal on the current on the jinx right now, but as a reforger as well. So can really think about what the best items to make here are. I do like the Volta as well, managing to put together, you know, a decent run. We'll be slamming all of the items to make sure that the streak remains intact. A lot of one stars on the board, so Volta definitely playing a little bit with fire. But Jim Ray is going to take the Lalana angle from the previous game and go right into Kale. And has rolled down heavily at 3-1. Players sometimes stop at 30 or so gold. If you are close enough to all of your three stars, it is correct to roll down as much as you have to. You're going to almost guarantee a winching unless you face a real high roll player, and you can just save so much HP as well in the process. Usually you end stage three with, you know, 20, 30 HP, but in this case, 60 HP now I think will hold most of this stage three. No, I really like this as well. You can see, in fact, maybe not ideally, you're going to actually break that streak there with very little money left in the bank, but for Jim Ray, the long game is here. Hopefully it'll go a little bit better than it went for Alana, but previously we'll be having our gold augments coming in as we look to see what can build up this Slayer board longer term. With the strength that Jimmy already has on the board, I think Martyr has to be the choice. It's going to be one of the best augments for the late game. It's going to help, uh, you know, with a huge 10% heal onto things like the Poppy, for example, will be massive as well. Bulk equally strong, though, and it will be Martyr in the end. I think it's just more a decision made towards uh, looking at the late game and what the highest cap of this board will be. Sometimes you need immediate power when you're just too weak and, and you think you're going to be in danger of losing too much HP, but not the case here for Jim Ray. No, I mean, as you said, we've got some very beefy frontline units, the Maokai and the Poppy together. We've got Yordle online as well with the three stars in place. We'll be looking at a pretty decent board, but uh -oh. I thought for a second we were going to be seeing Noxus, but instead it's going to be the Shadow Isles coming out for Saga Sang, pivoting away from Noxus, presumably. And this is a very strong line to get into. As long as things go well, it is going to be a dizzy time, possibly for Solo Gusang in stage four, when he has to roll down and try and assemble his, his board of Avengers. But Six Shadow Isles, one of the best vertical traits in the game right now, especially with a Shen 2-star, especially with a Gwen 2-star, and most importantly, finding that Senna early on in stage four. Well, so to talk to me about the path Solo Gusang can have to walk through this game, he's on you know, a good amount of HP, a good amount of gold. You know, we've, we've talked you know, about the very late game possibilities of this board, but in the here and now, you know, is Solo in a decent spot? I would say so. He has both the HP and the gold to, again, he hasn't leveled yet, uh, you know, to six, level five still. He was thinking maybe of, of rerolling something. I think, I think not. I think just, you know, waiting it out, trying to work on his econ. He knows that his big spike comes when he finds a Senna, when he finds a Gwen 2 star, and he needs a lot of gold to get there. So I think he's happy to trade some of his HP just to make sure his econ is, is in a place where he's going to have a consistent chance of finding most of his big spikes. I mean, right, yeah, right now, not even have the Shadow Isles active at all. So the board's not going to do a whole lot. Jim Ray, of course, looking to build back up his economy from before. Very happy to find an opponent that can be put down in short order. And I do start to wonder, Solo Sang is starting to take some, well, a huge loss as of there, pushing him down into the bottom three. Certainly expected, though. When you don't use your gold to level up, when you don't use your gold to roll and transfer that gold into strength in your board, uh, the only possible outcome is to lose, unless you face some very weak players. The Shen right, is so here. Oh, wow, yeah. That's not bad at all. Nobody taking it as of yet, though. You can see Volta has definitely got his oh, eye on it to so snap tough. it up. So we're taking a quick look at the status of the lobby overall. Coco, of course, number one player from Davies, one and two on a win streak. Not completely undefeated, but very close to it. For Alex, also in a very strong spot. Both of them barely having taken any HP damage at all. It shows the strength of Coco of analyzing his own spot at 2-1 and, and kind of the, the chance you'll have to stay strong throughout the game. Because if you pick up Young Walton free and you start losing and you're first pick anyone in the carousel, you are basically down an augment. So it only really works from a spot that you're high rolling and it's kind of a win more augment. And the Coco perfectly identified, hey, I have a strong opener. I have a Sunfire Slam that I'm really a two. I know I'm going to be able to maintain this lead as long as, you know, the game doesn't more dog me too much. And that was the case here. Still 98 HP, still win streaking and still making perfect use of this augment. The young one and free, absolutely giving a lot more agency to Coco than would normally have under these circumstances. Up against Fifek. You can imagine it's going to be another pretty straightforward win here. I mean, you know, for Coco, 
how far do you expect to see this street trying to be pushed? You know, is this going to be a point where you know, we just acknowledge you've got to you know, save up for the longer term, or do you just keep pumping gold into your board? It's going to depend who he faces. This fight here is going to be quite close with the Kalista pulling out one last spear, not able to do it in time on his opponent's Kalista. And Jin, despite being a somewhat weak unit on this patch, should be able to clean up house there against the Samira. I think the big thing is maybe facing Philalix. Uh, if he has him in his pool mm. in the next few fights, he does now. That could be the streak ender, but we see it now. Coco identifies he might be in trouble. Levels to seven. It's a little bit more power by having an extra unit on the board. We'll jump down to the other end of the lobby then to take stock of what's happening over here. and see that Freljord coming in for Zulanash and a very tasty looking item set on the back line being currently carried by the Samira. It feels like we've got something brewing here, but for Zulanash, running actually pretty dry on money towards the end before everything gets hit. So will be Akshan carrying these items for now. We'll see if he wants to stay in this Akshan board. He does have the Freljord in for now. Close to the Sharima as well. He decides to slot that in later on instead of the set. Uh, for now, Akshan won though, and the items are not ideal. Akshan is not the best user of Rage Blade. I think this will be a temporary Akshan board, and we'll try and get into Zeri later into the game. At least the Nasus is doing a good job of providing enough time for the Akshan to come fully online, but you know, Zula Nash getting the win there pretty much out of cash. So again, has got a long path back into the game to build up a stronger board. We've got as we come into walls, though, we have got upgrades coming in across the board. Uh, Felix has lost the win streak, while Coco maintains his. I think the note with Yorick's Graveyard as well is the fact that you're going to have so many more items than in a usual game of TFT. So playing two or three carries is going to be very relevant. Uh, you're able to slam many more items in the early game to preserve HP. Things like slamming tank items in the challenger comp without having to worry about having that triple itemized Kai'Sa and Yasuo in the late game. So it's something that players have to adapt to for sure in the first few stages of the game. And I think we've seen that in a big way. I think we're going to get a really vicious fight once it comes down to the end. I mean, we've already got this big separation between our top four and our bottom four right now in terms of HP. Our bottom four having fairly consistently lost HP, but for Zulanash, perhaps we're going to be seeing a little bit of a change of fortune finding the early Balbeth. Akshan, as we see there, uh, Zulanash not very grateful about the job Akshan was doing. Immediately sells in the moment Belva pops up. A Heimerdinger in the shop here for Solo Gasang. A big roll down mm. a seven, and this is troublesome. We have a Shen, yes, but we don't have any Gwens on this board. Uh, and this is what we were talking about. Shadow Walls is very strong, but you really have to hit on this level seven roll down, or you have to be fortunate with finding a Senna on the stage four carousel. But will Solo even make it, Peter? He's 36 HP and the board is not strong. No, we can see all of these players, particularly the top four, trying to put down that pressure, trying to get those Yorick's Graveyard items in as quickly as possible. I mean, I have to wonder, as exactly as you say, Solo Gassan going down to 23 is now the lowest HP player in the lobby. Do bear in mind, we are in lobby one, and as the Prismatic Augments come in, these are all absolutely fantastic tier players, but somebody's got to go eighth. And Solo has to find this Gwen. He has to find the four Shadow Elves. Looks like he's not going to be able to right now. He doesn't even know what, what to make and what not to make, considering he has to be holding someone of Econ. Hadn't found a Kalista until now as well, so just so unfortunate mm. the roll downs here for Solo Gasang, not at all finding what he needed. No, that's so painful as well. Of course, Solo Gasang, a player who's been known long term for his ladder performance being absolutely amazing, has started to find more success in the tournament field recently, but this lobby does not seem to be his friend. Yeah, not very surprising. I think there were multiple players trying to go into this challenger line. All in all, not finding a single Gwen and finding only one Kalista. We have to say that is extremely unlucky, considering the gold he had and considering he played into having a lot of gold with that level 5 at 3-3 and 3-4. We see Volta, speaking of gold, taking the Infernal Contract, which means he will never go above level 7. But he did gain an awful lot of gold, and he's turned that into upgraded units, which are handing out some pretty nasty losses. Kaisa doing work here. Sinar taking a little bit of a hit, but still middle of the pack when it comes to the standings. You see Sinar again. He's cool under pressure, but yeah, we haven't necessarily seen an absolute ton of Infernal Contract being played. I mean, for Volta, we said, can't go beyond level 7. What kind of game should he be looking at here? You want to ideally roll for something like this uh, with the idea of trying to get a three-star Kai'Sa or Yasuo as your win condition. Uh, you can't really get much more powerful, and that will be the case here. We're going to see it now. Uh, he thinks he's strong enough with this Kai'Sa 2, and hopefully that'll be a Kai'Sa 3 over time. The problem, I think there are several 
challenger players in the lobby, and it might be difficult until they're eliminated to actually get to that point. As you pointed out before, we will be seeing the items flowing in, but it hasn't happened as of yet. Solagasang, Zula Nash, both are potentially going out in a couple of rounds, and then the items will be up for grabs for everybody else. For the time being, though, Volta's board, you know, with all those upgrades coming in, the high-quality units will be able to hand out a substantial loss and keep Volta's economy going. We'll see what this next carousel looks like. Very relevant for Solagasang if you find the Senna on it or not. And very relevant for two young Walden free players who might be not trying to grease all good time, but trying to find Senna, a very strong unit in and of herself for their late game boards. Oh. There she is. Like Coco, go, go. don't do it to him. <laughs> Coco walks fast. Solo is getting excited. He sees finally my first moment of Hyrule in the game. He steps in and picks up the Senna. And will this be enough to save him? I'm not entirely sure. 13 HP is a dire place to be in. That is going to be just one life, essentially, at this point in stage four. Talk to me proportions then, you know, to have the Shadow Wars online, to have the center jumping into the board, how much stronger should this be making Solaga sign for the rest of the game? Considering he did not have any Gwens earlier on, if he doesn't have a six Shadow Walls board with upgraded units all around, uh, it's going to be problematic. He's going for six Challenger instead, it looks like, so a bit of a different angle. And with the Shadow Walls emblem onto the, the set, he needed immediate power. I think he had to make some dire decisions in terms of having to cut out the Shen altogether, considering he couldn't find it upgraded. The items on the bench ready to go. I mean, the Callista is certainly nothing much to look at at the moment. Do makes, does make me wonder where the items will land, because Solagasang is out of cash. Zulanash, the next closest player, but if Solo's round goes badly here, this could be the end of the line for him here at the top lobby. We'll be having to take these items onto the Gwen. I would have liked these items on like Kaisa instead, for example. So just everything going wrong here for Solo, I think, considering the gold he had, it really backfired on this roll down. And this is the, the problem with this comp. You're only stable if your level seven roll down goes well. And it was not the case for Solo. Is it enough for now? It looks like the answer is no. Then I taken down and Solo now down to three HP. I think thanking his lucky stars, it wasn't even worse than that. We did get a chance to check in with Sina and that Zorn board, which you can see it's got the chem tank already exploding. I suppose, at least for the Shadow Isles, they've got the shields across a lot of their team to maybe deny that massive damage. But Solo has got so many tough matchups ahead of him. And we can see on the right-hand side, we've got multiple four-cost two-stars coming into different players' boards. Solo trying to mix around his board, thinking if it's possible to slot in six Shadow Isles. Looks like that might be the answer here, but again, I think he thinks he's just not strong enough, and I think he's right. He needs the tankability of the set on the front line holding the Sunfire Cape. It's going to be very tough here, especially if Hayes is a strong player, and it looks like that is quite a strong player as well. Oh boy, it's, he's, it's almost like he's looking in the mirror for what he would have hoped for. Fifec having the Callistas, having the Kaisers, having the board that Solokasang wanted so badly. But wait a second, actually breaks through. And with the Callista going down, Solokasang gets the fight for another round at least. One thing to make note of for both of these players, they both have multiple versions of social distancing for their boards. And this is a, an augment that works perfectly with challengers. In TFT, most of the time, your comp wants what it does not already have. And in terms of challengers, they have a lot of attack speed, yes, but they don't have any raw stats that, that give them the access to make best use of that attack speed. In this case, social distancing gives you exactly that. Uh, so Jim Ray going to get very rich indeed coming into this tail end here. You see 118 gold in the bank. We're talking about whether or not Jim Ray could find a way to economically build up this board towards you know, the ultimate version, the level 9 board with all the Slayers online and the Kale at full capacity. It seems now it's very much on the cards. And for anyone wondering, Jim Ray is not just an excessively greedy player. He does have Hedge Fund as his third augment, so he <laughs> is rewarded for staying above 100 gold. In this case, with a newly added cap a few patches ago. Um, and this is what he needs to make it to 9. If you have enough board and combat strength from your first two augments, you're in a good enough position. Your only idea from, from that point onward is making it to 9, and Hedge Fund head funds allows you to get there. Yeah, that's, I mean, he's one of the very few players who has money left to spend. You can see a uh, roll downs across the board happening for our players who even did have a little bit of money left in. Volta, in fact, the only other player who's managed to keep anything back. The desperation is starting to build here because what a difference it is, you know, getting that first drop from Yorick's graveyard or not. Volta facing off against Lunak, we'll see. If Zulanak will survive this fight at 19 HP, he should. There shouldn't be a big enough loss at the start of stage 5. That will warrant the death of Zulanak, in this case the Romanian player. Should be able to stay through on this one. The Aatrox trying to do so much with the BT. The shielding, keeping him alive in that front line. 
And the Kai'Sa, is she able to clean up? The answer is no. It looks like Aphelios will get the best of her, but just barely. And that will be a loss for Volta. Talk to me a bit about the Aphelios, because, you know, there was a controversial topic over the previous days, you know, whether or not, you know, if we've got a very Jinx-heavy meta, whether or not Aphelios is the way to go. The stats don't seem to support the idea, but we've seen it occasionally do very well. In maybe high roll positions, I'm not a big fan of Aphelios overall. I think he's still very much a subpar unit compared to something like Azeri. Uh, so I try and stay away from it. I know there are some spots it is good in. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you're just given an Aphelios 2 and say, hey, this is the best way to hold these AD items. I'm going to go into this line and hope for a top four. But I definitely don't see many uh, winning boards in containing Aphelios, that's for sure. So like I said, going up against the level 9 Lococo, again, number one from days one and two. Absolutely monstrously strong in this competition. At least we do have the RE surviving for a good while, but the individual units are still alive, particularly the Belveth, who's just ridiculously monstrous. The single target damage is not there, and Germany, so like I said, goes out in eighth, Fifec following in seventh. And this is the best news Volta could ever receive. Both challenger players going out 7th and 8th. All these challenger units back in the pool, including the Kaisas, including the Kalistas that Fifik was trying to get Kalista 3 for. So all of a sudden, Volta has a very good chance with Infernal Contract of finding that Kaisa 3 throughout the stage 5. Um, and we're not just holding them. <laughs> you gotta do it. You've gotta do it when you know that you're losing the lobby. Or at least you're guaranteed you can't win the lobby anymore if someone else gets that incredibly high peak. We've had our first two eliminations, which means that items are starting to flow in across the boards. Exactly as you said before, it's down to how many carries our players can field, how well they can use this surplus of items. Nakoko, 31 HP, perfectly snowballed that initial lead with Young Wallet 3 into tons of stats, into level up, try and achieve that, that level 9, fast 9 board we were talking about earlier in the show. And this is what we talk about. A very good win streak start, a high tempo start. You're going to have enough gold and resources to make it to these boards. And we're seeing the power of them now. Zulana could not survive here. Minus 12, sixth place in the end for the Romanian player. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really impressed by what we're seeing here. As we come on to what would, well, at least for several of our players, I imagine it's going to be their last carousel to try and push their power further up. I mean, Kyoko is not on top right now. Jimray is, but... It definitely feels like Coco is in a great position to at least battle for top two. Not just that, he has a chance to only get stronger. Every time we get into the next carousel, he has a chance to pick up a five cost unit. He has a chance to pick up the best item he currently needs at the time. Let it be a you know a DPS item or a tank item. Uh, Yorick's Graver as well is going to make it so that every single one of his legendaries will have items, which is you know fantastic. In a normal comp, you might have two or three units that make good use of items that can be carries, both in the tank and DPS capacity. In this case, every unit here wants items. And we see Coco's got an Ari ready to get fully itemized immediately. A Bloodthirster left spare as well, just to make sure that front line stays a little bit more tanky. But we're absolutely with you here. Coco, not, not, not keeping back any money at all, relying on some good shops, but the board itself is immaculate. And Philalix and Volta might be in trouble. Volta not able to hit any three stars when it comes to his four cost carries. He has just the Kaisa and the Yasuo. And Infernal Contract caps him out at level 7. Maybe he's not able to win out fights like these where you start getting these really, really stacked boards. We're seeing it there. Kaisa taken down by the Urgot. Not quite, but finally is in the Aatrox. Can he clean house by himself? BT, IE, Ionia Emblem. It's going to be a 1v1 Aatrox versus <laughs> Urgot, but the Urgot's HP bar is not going down. Oh my gosh, the secret tech of the full mail working very well there. Surprise, Aatrox does not make it through. Phylax like going out in fourth place. Uh, yeah, in fourth place with Volta going out in fifth. It means we're down to our final three. M even more items coming in as Sinar has put together one of the boards that so many players have been fearing across the tournament. Jarvin won. Solo for Lama, that's all you need. Oh, here comes the upgrade. Unit transfer as well, you're able to get the Zephyr onto a different unit for these last few fights. And again, you're trying to make the biggest difference possible with who is zephyr up in this fight. It could be the Ari here onto the Warwick, and that will be the case. Is this Jarvan going to be able to do enough? We have got a lot of clumping there. We can see it's going to take a little while before the Jarvan actually explodes. Goes off and chunks through, but the Belvest stays alive, as does the Ari. The reset's coming in for the White Empress. As the Ari dies and the reset happens, it looks like enough was done there to make sure that Sinar keeps himself alive against the Ghost. The Coco 
Also taking a bit of a hit there, down to 19 HP. Not one life in stage five, but in stage six with a big enough loss, it definitely could be. We'll see if the Coco is able to hit his final few upgrades, get some extra gold, extra resources from this PB round, and hopefully hit this RE2 if he wants to stay alive in this game. Oh boy, absolutely down to the wire. I'm still so impressed though by what we're seeing from Jim Ray here. Managing to hold on to 38 gold at this point, considering that this is an absolutely brutal lobby. I mean, you know, you said we want the level 9 ball with all of the trimmings, and we've absolutely got it. Talking about the highest cap boards in the game, kill is one of them. The hard part is getting there. It is a very risky and long road in which I have fallen many, many times. But when you're able to get all your three stars at 3-1, it makes the game so much easier. You can pick augments based around late game board strength, like Martyr, for example, and Ooh. make it to a position like the one he's in. And we're seeing it now. Aatrox and Scion could be upgraded, but no Ari, which I think is going to be the star of the show for this comp. Coco is very much the player to be in the competition. His performance has been off the charts, but for Jim Ray in this particular lobby, he's got everything he needs to make this a board that's just completely unstoppable. Going up against Sinar's Zeri board here. The Kale being taken out of the commission early on. We're waiting for the big kaboom. The only thing here is somehow has not managed to find a Heimerdinger and all the gold he had and all the gold he rolled down to fit in for three Yordle over this Teemo. Will it matter? It looks like the answer is no. The kill doing so much work with the Sniper's Focus and the Gunblade healing up the Maokai and the Poppy. A huge win for Jim Ray. Sinar down to one life, down to six HP. It's all the way down to the wire. We'll be up against the Coco next time round, and this board is getting stronger and stronger. You, you know, to have as well the extra itemization coming in, the only one we're really missing at this point is Aatrox, but we did see, of course, with the players pushing levels, they have been scooping those Aatroxes out of the pool. And it's so funny, considering Jim Ray's board, because you can tell right away he did not have to roll much throughout the mid and late game, considering he still has the Galley on his board instead of a Jarvan, doesn't have six Slayer in, doesn't have the Heimerdinger in, so still has many ways to cap his board even further. See how Coco does against Sinar here. We do see a very spread board as the Bellworth gets sent up in the air. The Ari trying to avoid getting blown up as she was so quickly from before. Goes in. The explosion will chunk pretty heavily, but not get the kills that were being looked for. Ari taken out the side, leaving Belveth all on her lonesome. She is getting the chunks. She's getting the resets, but it's not quite enough. Coco holds on by a thread. The biggest problem for Coco there is he doesn't have man much Omni Vamp either on the Belveth or the Ari, so all this, you know, chip damage coming in from Zeri is going to be too much for them to handle, but, the, but they'll be dying a little bit earlier than expected. And also, there aren't much combat strength augments with Young Alden Free and Level Up. Finally, oh. the Heimerdinger is found. <laughs> and the it's been a as long well. road. This is really big right. for the damage coming in from Gwen and the Kale. We've even got a Jarvan as an option there as well. So. If we thought Jim Ray was strong before, gonna take a next step forward. Fully itemized that Heimerdinger in celebration of how powerful this is gonna make the board overall. Jim Ray will be playing on the right hand side against Coco. Coco again, the player to beat this Kale board. It's absolutely ridiculous though. We're still waiting for the big cast to come through. Kale with the Hexnet Gunblade survives just a little bit longer. She's scaling up, but the front line, the Belveth, drops down, turns into an Aatrox. The Kale is eventually going to hit the heart of the comp, and with that, gets the funnel shot in. Coco falls. The Coco taken down, and just barely, the Poppy was able to deal with the Belveth before that true damage came through and just knock out the Poppy altogether. Poppy is, of course, the glue that is holding together the entirety of that front line, the entirety of, of really the damage scaling coming in from Kale over a very long fight. Shroud and Zephyr, both of the best utility items in the game, coming in for each of our players for this final, or what could be the final few fights. So talk to me about this, what could be the final fight here. We've got the Shroud on one side, Oh, in fact, the shroud on both sides. Is there any way which we see Jim Ray losing this? He has to be careful not to get his kill killed early on. Again, this is the cornerstone of the comm in terms of the damage coming through. The Gwen as well, her pathing and her AI and where she decides to go into and, and how early she, she dies off is also key as a secondary source of damage. But the positioning here is so relevant. He has to find a way to get kill out of this Jarvan's range. One more round, Jim Ray from the Netherlands has a chance to get first place in the top lobby of the competition. The Shrouds, the Zephyrs compiling in, the boards flying through the air, but the Kale is untouched as of now, scaling up throughout the fight. 
course, on the other side, Zarya will be doing much the same as the explosion does not do much of anything. The angel triumphant Jim Ray, massive win here in Lobby One, takes top spot in the competition. And Kale proving it once again, it's a first or eighth comp. In this case for Jim Ray, it's going to be a first and to no one's surprise, he had such a strong start for it. He had all of his three stars assembled at 3-1, rolling down all his gold, yes. But as we saw, he was able to maintain a win streak for pretty much the entirety of the rest of the game, getting all that extra econ back from the streak. And overall, knowing how to cap out his board, getting the Heimerdinger online, perfect positioning at the end there as well. We saw the Jarvin, Zephyr first and then brought into the back of Sinar's own comp instead of where Kale was, allowing Kale to just dish out damage untouched the entire fight. Oh boy, I mean, just to see that board and to see what Lalana could have had in the previous game, it just wasn't able to reach it. The other point, of course, Shinra as well. Yeah, we've talked about our players' connections, has the connection with the NA scene, has, you know, has told us before, coaching Spicy Appies over there to try and take his place at the World Championship. It must be incredible to be a player, you know, you spent so much time developing other players to be able to step into the limelight yourself. Yeah, it must be a very rewarding feeling and just great to see him find success on a risky comp. He took the risk and was rewarded in the end. I think the break is going to be ready. We're going to the analyst after this, breaking down this game too. First, we'll hear from Flossosaurus in an interview. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Pavel, uh, and in game I go as Sponsorius, and uh, I am 32 years old, uh, and I come from Lithuania. Yeah, my thoughts about uh, Runter Reforge is that this is uh, probably one of the best sets so far. I really like it, and that helps me a lot to, to play better, as uh, motivation is there, doesn't make it. Motivation is there to play because I really enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, so the most creative player and the most uh, that impressed me so far in, uh, in this set is Dabudi Dabudai. He's from Ukraine and he played really well in qualifiers. He also qualified to GSC. I never uh, saw him before, so it's uh, probably a new player, but he played really strong and uh, versatile. Yeah. So I'm impressed by his play and creativity. He adapts uh, to like every situation really well. As a player, my goals are obviously to like I'm taking it step by step. So next step would be to qualify to European regionals, and when I achieve that, obviously then next goal is Worlds. So we'll see. We keep, we keep playing, keep improve, and maybe we can do it. Okay, so I want to shout out to our small Lithuanian community. They helped me a lot to uh, prepare to this tournament. Um, our small community is uh, the, what uh, we are playing for. Like it's the driving force behind uh, our minds. Uh, we motivate each other, we play together. So yeah, thanks for them. Welcome back to our analyst desk here. And after this game, uh, we've seen yet again 
Sinar and Jimri coming up on top. Now, Wida, you were saying that you kind of found differences and similarities in their playstyle. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, so it, it, obviously it, it's not going to be super representative after just two games. You'd have to go back and look to like their overall tournament patterns. But this is two games back to back now where we've seen Jim Ray come through with a reroll composition, navigating it very well, right? Panda already went over this as well, but like the hedge fund pickup was insanely big for being able to go towards those like mass level nine and make sure you get that huge cash out. And for Sinar, he's been playing these strong carries around, legendaries around, four cost in both of these games as well so far today. So pretty interesting to see both of these two players having back-to-back -back success in the same lobbies for themselves with just similar compositions. Yeah, that yeah, definitely do. is going to do wonders for your mental, right? Coming into this game, winning back to back, you're going to be feeling pumped and really excited for the day. But there was something else that was going on here because when we saw it, we got super excited about the two players being on Earth as opposed to Orin, which many players are running right now. Didn't work out though, did it, Morgan? Yeah, I mean, up until now, I've seen Volta and uh, Fiddy able to choose Orf again. And the only one that went kind of full Orf on the augments, not full Orf, at least for the first two augments until the uh, third one came, which was the Infernal Contract. I've not seen him able to achieve that much with it, sadly. So our lobbies are still very, very dominated by own players. And up until now, we have only gotten the news from another lobby. We are told that... 61 has been able to hit an Aatrox 3 star in a lobby that we're not watching right now. It is kind of unlucky that we don't get to see that on stream, but I thought it was something worth mentioning because how often did we get a 3 star 5 cost in the special cups again? Ever, did we? Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely worth mentioning. Double 61 absolutely having the time of his life with an Aatrox 3 in one of the off stream lobbies. And if you're interested, watching these lobbies we do have the command center ready for you guys you can check it out you can watch every lobby you want to see you don't have to ping us in chat to show a certain player just go there and watch it's teamfight tactics slash command center to bring everything up if you're on a browser but we of course are going to be carrying you through the main lobby now here are our standings yeah, and the big thing to look at here, right? Skipeas did not get the interview buff, it seems like. Um, but also, like, we're looking at Dark Hydra, who's ha who has had pretty good days here so far on his second consecutive day free of a Golden Special Cup as well, if I recall my own uh, stat tracking correctly here, right? So he is pretty much in a pretty good spot already to pl to go towards the, like, the Rising Legends finals. And for a lot of the players that are down towards this back end of the standings right now, sure, there are three more games, but you have to fight your way all the way back up to that first lobby to have a chance of being in the in the running for the champion uh, for the title today but the higher up you go in the standings makes there are going to be more and more points coming your way i'm sorry i can't i can't stop being a little bit giddy about Dasic coming up here on top currently second in the overall leaderboard we did have a little bit of spice coming into this tournament it seems like that fired him up all right getting another first place here same as jim ray both of them up there trying to defeat their way to that final golden ticket to the way to the EMEA Rising Legends finals where of course everybody wants to be. So we're gonna see how that plays out. We're getting our next lobbies ready in just a little bit but we're gonna have somewhat of a caster switch here I heard. Not too sure who it's going to be but we'll see after a break.
what a surprise. We're back. This time, it's me and Wida, and we're going to be taking you through game number three and four. We have a very exciting lobby ready. We we're just talking about it, Wida, right? We were, and there are some pretty interesting names in here. We have Stake Swords, we saw kind of make a bit of a comeback after a, a rough game one. Let's take as a playoff that we haven't seen too much of uh, throughout this tournament. I feel like I haven't spoken much about Lilik, but obviously former Super Bowl player as well in there. Memo, a player I think you're super excited for. I think I'm also super excited for. One of the most like interesting transitions, I think, in like TFT competitive history at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. For the longest time, <laughs> I hope I'm not doing him injustice here, but for the longest time, he was kind of regarded as a content creator and streamer first, and as a high tier player second. And in the past couple of months, Memo actually turned this around and has been going really well in the higher competitive meta. And I'm so excited to see him finally reach the highest heights. And I have high hopes that he is going to be able to transform it into at least some couple very good golden spatula cup points if not a win. So we're gonna see how that plays out. But of course, there is more exciting player in this lobby as it should be in a day three of a Golden Spatula Cup. We have Zolo Gazang in here. We have Elusive Set. We have Stakeser that we talked to earlier and Og, who has been absolutely turning it up for all of day one and two. Absolutely, and, and Og is a player that had a pretty rough time at, at finals. Or uh, That's kind of a, he had one of the days that was super good for him, then he had one day that was just absolutely not up to his standards after having some some strong performances and some of the, some of the other events going into the Rising Legends finals. And even before like, we went into Rising Legends, Org was a player that was always in and around the 20th to 30th spot when we had those 64-man qualifiers for all the championships before Rising Legends, right? So this is a guy with a lot of competitive pedigree that slowly but surely now has transitioned incredibly well into Rising Legends. Yeah, I'm sure Trouble is happy to see that. She was here casting yesterday and the day before, giving those break players a little bit of an extra, you know, caster bias buff, I would say. But here is your lobby and we're starting right in with Three portals, it's going to be Unstable Rift, which is always a little bit of spice, a little bit of uh, surprise. We're gonna see where that takes us, if that is going to be the case. But of course, Yorick's Graveyard and the new Shifting Sands is also there. And we can see some question mark pings come out as well. Yeah, so the thing about like, why a lot of players like Yorick's Graveyard is it's a very low variance galaxy uh, portal. Sorry, said free remains still in my head, you know, to a certain extent, but it's a very oh. low... I love a bit of unstable rift here, right? Let's uh, let's get that going. But go your guys have super low, super low variance. It's only really kicks in when people die. But now we're gonna go into the unstable rift instead. So we are gonna be seeing random items come around here every single round. Yeah, and uh, that means you want to play a comp that is able to carry multiple items, comps like that. I think specifically po popular is going to be the challenger oh. variation with like Yasu and Kaisa. We're starting off with an Archangels here, and uh, ooh, that could be a very easy piltover for Zolgazang. Yeah, that was kind of the the way, reason why I went like, oh, Look okay. at him giggling. He's so happy right now. He also has a Jin 2 in the shop just for good measure in case he needs it right here. So uh, this is an open it with a lot of perspective in it, depending on what ends up coming out of this round. You're not expecting more gold, obviously, because you've gotten your, your six gold value, the baseline kind of already. So just try to see if you can find anything that could help you along the route here. Any Oriana, any Vi now will be absolutely fantastic. Hopefully it's gonna come around, definitely securing that Jin too. It was but thus far, game makes. thus far, there is no other Piltover making their way to Zulu Gazang's board. I mean, you know, it's it's kind of really hard to not find an Oriana at these early stages. So he's just all giddy, very excited to probably get this online faster than possible. But we are going to be having some extra augments coming as well. So we'll see how it all plays out for him. You'd think it would be easy to find an Oriana, there's just one Oriana, how hard can it be? But sometimes that is just going to be super elusive, right? But you're going to get this pretty strong AP line here as well, looking up Spear Shoujin, Rod, Laden Forge. He is an Orin player, right, as most of the players are in this tournament. There's just a lot of, again, low variance, a lot of dependability in the augment outcomes from that legend, right? So. Sawcard also a bit of a test, doesn't line up too well with the pill double line going forward unless you want to transition out of that in some regard, right? But he doesn't even have the pill double online, so it doesn't mean he's locked into it just yet. 
Interestingly enough, he rolls away the forge and is now presented with all natural. Not necessarily something we see a whole lot of, but I think consistency is interesting oh. for him. It's not going to be the case. Goes for the sword cart instead, and uh, that that is the Oriana that's now coming into play. But we are not going for the Piltovers. No, so this is a kind of a bit of an intensive. I, I, I kind of wanted to hit on this when we figured out like which way Rudy was going to go down, because there are a few things to to kind of uh, to talk, keep in mind here. When you are playing with a sword card, much like when you're playing challenges, you're able to play ahead of the power curve here. So Swain now with Fall Sword again, much more uh, a super powerful unit here. And on the back of this two star gene as well as a bit of extra execution damage. This is a, the potential of a very strong setup, and you combine it with the fact that he has an open rod, he has an early spear of shot, and he now has full direction where he wants to go, and that's going to be obvious to anyone in the lobby as well. Yeah, I'm a little bit disappointed because I really wanted to see that Piltover come online, and it would have been Pilt, but saying I'll take this direction and go into Sorks, which is a spot that's usually not very competed. So you have a much easier time actually finding your unit, finding your line, since AP is not extremely popular, does kind of check out um, if you don't want to play for the Race Keeper of Rhines. We'll see how it does for Zologazan as we are moving about. We did look at our legends. There's only one player on Earth that's going to be Memo, and there is one player that's making Impetuous Panda extremely happy, and that is going to be ineffable with the Caitlyn. Yeah, so Caitlyn, I think, in my mind, at least, shines a lot when the Prismatic first one with the starter kit. Obviously, it's not as broken as it was on the PB, because I was like, why is no one playing Caitlyn PB? You just get a free two-star forecast carry at some point throughout the game. Not necessarily the same anymore, but it's still like, an interesting line to kind of see how that is going to impact Neverpool's gameplay further down the road here. Another thing that's also worth noting is to go back to the, to the Sword line. Um, as well here as remember stakes are playing the lobby here on the top of the show today spoke about how it is a high roll line and when he spoke about that being a high roll line is very much the spot that solo Gazang is currently in that he's preparing to i'm just looking at Litic, having that titans having that darius having the samira but not getting the noxus online as of right now does have the casio in the shop could be going for it but would be losing out on the maokai right now unless you want to ditch out the juggernaut and challenger which surely cannot be an option here so just hopping around waiting to put that noxus in probably so memo makes it's going to be on a void line here with the void emblem we haven't seen a lot of, of vertical void it was a, a big thing towards the start of the set but I even feel like right now on ladder, when I get into to, to a point where I get towards that, the Baron Nasher, that is honestly doesn't necessarily pay off here. So I mean, so we'll see how he is going to be making use of this white emblem going forward. Yeah, there was a little bit of a uh, Herald change coming into this patch. So maybe Void in the mid game more popular could even be that he's just going for the Void 6 and then trying to diversify with some legends instead of going for that full vertical. Although I do think there's some fun in seeing that Baron Nasher. So we'll see whether or not that is the case for Memo. For now, we're going to be heavier into the AP items, which of course, it's not going to be good news for Zologazang now that the rot is gone. Somebody else will pick up the tier and he's left with some of the more defensive items and a bow. Yeah, it's actually like picking up the spatula, so interesting to see where that is going to go further down the road. He has the ability to slam an Ionia spat right now, and depending on the position he's in, that could be interesting to see whether or not that is going to be the position he's going to be going for here. But also makes, look at Orc's position here, red buff, early early Noxus online with a Callista as well, level 5, Swain 2 as well on top of that, with that, that front line is super <laughs> massive and could just be his ticket to a full streak stage 2. Yeah, it cannot be overstated how strong a Swain 2 is in these early stages. He's just so tanky, lives forever, tanks everything despite having no items. He's just going to have a grand old time moving through these. But the, so far, we do have three players that haven't lost yet. And that's going to change right now. Zuligazan meeting up with Ark here, both of them 100 HP. Somebody will, of course, be on the losing end of that. And it's a battle of Swains. One has two items, the other one last second gets that CZ Roth, but is going to lose out to the two star Swain. Zuligazan will probably take a loss here. Yeah, just like Arkyo, he had a two-star, uh, he had a two-star copy of Renekton on his board as his other front lineup, but just valuing the fact that he could slam that Surat portal and then just having the Swain as a solo front line and just putting in more backline power here really helps him get wow. that fight over the edge. But wow. two-star Kalista as well, not half bad on stage two. 
not half bad. This is a really good spot for Ark, and he's probably just smiling seeing that right now. Of course, he has to be a little bit worried because one of the players that he could meet up with is going to be Lytic. And Lytic is also streaking on 100 HP. You want to preserve this streak, then a Callista too would definitely help in doing that. So we're gonna buy here last second, make sure nobody else knows that we had this available to try and outplay us or level to kind of get it in, but it's not going to be Lytic. Lytic on the other side, it will be Stakesaur instead. And so Ox should have a little bit of an easier play here. Yeah, Stakes are also, as I was talking about on the carousel here, has gone for the Ionia Emblem as the slam here, trying to play down that tempo route. And much like what David spoke about earlier on on the cast is that you're either going towards challenges, you're either going to work your way in towards a traditional, like, high cap board with some Ionias in there. Ionia Belvif, super powerful. Ionia Callista, super powerful. Ionia Kaiser as well. So all the classes that you know and love, still super powerful. And with the ever-changing <laughs> fact of this uh, of this portal mix, right, these, these items are going to change completely. Having those items that you were talking about, super useful for multi-carry compositions. Yeah, I think he's in a really great spot right now. But on the heels of Lytic and Og is Elusive said, and we can see that he's in a little bit of a similar position, of course, with Samira being the flavor of the week. Everybody is going to line up for these challenger comps, and that just means that whenever you see a challenger, you kind of just pick it up just in case. We're going to see a lot of contesting in the early stages until players actually find the boards that they want to run with. In elusive set place, I don't think the Callista is going to be the long-term option here. Now, Spear of Shojin plus the uh, the Godbreaker here, obviously just like tempo options, does have that Laden Forge item coming through and free thrive, like so many other people in the lobby, right? That's just kind of be the nature of the game with Orn being such a, a classic dominant pick here for most players. And as we've been talking about, right, we've had situations, we have the Draven moment, for example, right, mate? We don't necessarily talk too much about that, but we've had some legends that have just been super oppressive uh, even in competitive settings and it's not that Orin is oppressive it's just that his baseline is very very high so you don't necessarily get screwed over at a point where you would not want to absolutely right i'm curious though on whether or not Lytic and Og can actually meet here and somebody will stop streaking but for now it's going to be elusive going up against ineffable and once again, we are seeing that Samira 2 on the other side, on the back of the unstable rift item, is going to get a lot of support out of that Runant. Will be a loss for Zed. And we'll see on whether or not the streaks continue here. I'm not sure if these two players are fighting each other, but doesn't seem to be the case. However, Litic still losing out, and it is going to be Ogg, the only player that's streaking going into prismatic seconds. This is going to be a bit of a, a shake-up for the entirety of the lobby, right? Because as we've been talking about so many times, the shift from, from Silver to Prismatic is so big because you're kind of starting to, to play a specific tempo now. Because, like, how many players are going to roll aggressively here on level 6, try to two-star some of these up to have some of these important units to get some front lines just to be more stable? And you can even see here, Ineffable, just going for that transfusion, saying, you know what, I'm going to take some losses. And he has an inconsistency augment also that it will will build him up some economy, even if he is going to be, well, inconsistent in his streaking. It makes wow. two banger augments here, two Lotus and Sword Crown. Okay, so you already had one Sorg out of the first augment, and he is going to go with the second one, gets that Spear of Shojin, gets that Vel'Koz on top of it. But I did see something happening just before these augments came through, and that was Scarambus actually able to find a Karma too, which is going to be good news if you're on an Invoker angle. It's not a comp that we're seeing a whole lot, since it is really good if it's competed, but if you can find a good way into it on the back of, let's say, an Aeonia's emblem, or just having a lot of Invokers early and getting that Karma, then Scorambus might be in a good position here too to stabilize on the back of that. This fight is super intense, actually, and Stakes so just slams down the belt <laughs> on his Kaiser that he has found. And that's, that is a Kaiser free, too. And that's what I was talking about. We might see people trying to overextend their goal just a little bit to get those final few upgrades coming through here. You can kind of see that this also being the, the thing here for Solo. He just gets those upgrades naturally, but does kind of lose the streak he was trying to build in the process. So uh, I'm aware of how the sword comp works with one emblem. How is it going to play out with two? We're just going to go for eight Sork and get a little bit more variety in, or what are we expecting out of Solo Gazan here? 
it kind of depends on like which issue can, you can fold into, right? Something like a Kaiser, for example, can have pretty big success with, with, the, with the Sword Emblem as well. It, it just gives you so much freedom that you don't have to play something like the Orianna to chase verticals, you don't have to play other units that aren't necessarily up to par, and it can also come down to the lobby, right? Because if you're able to go 9 relatively uncontested, then you can kind of just start building some more Sorcerer Iona units, for example, instead. So a lot of options are open, and the world is kind of as oyster at this point. Speaking of the world being an oyster, ineffable finding that Samura 3 here, and we did see the Karma 2 plus 1 come out of Scarambus, but there was no chance she was going to make it out alive against that Samir, just a massive unit to have. However, the lobby is separating a little bit on the back of Ox, still streaking here with 100 HP, putting down pressure onto the rest of them and dishing out some more minus HP than you would normally see in a lobby that's a little bit more even. Yeah, uh, and, and one of the players that ought to watch that bottom of the lobby as you're talking about makes is going to be Steak Sorry Ken. I gotta, I gotta highlight him again because it's the second time this game he's taking a spatula <laughs> off of the carousel. This time around, it's going to be for that Challenger Emblem most likely, so he will be going down that route pretty extensively. And with Freaky Friday, that is going to be one of the comps that can actually use that augment very well. Just a quick check on the mod here as well. Just good mechanical play, right? Just, you know, okay, I have that mod, cool. And he knows, like, I'm not going to go into Sawn, do one effects to Sawn, and. All he just wants to go directly into it as he as he does here. Yep, yeah, it's uh you know it's a little check. We're just seeing what's gonna happen here. Gets of course that snipers on top of it. So Zeri just becoming much more attractive there for a second and is gonna help get a lot of damage out. We did slam the belt onto the Kaisa to try and survive earlier on, so she's stuck with this one. But stakes are stabilizing here on level six with these two four costs should be doing him quite well. On the other side, we are seeing uh, another Void Emblem. Do, do I saw that correctly? There's two Void Emblems on Memo, just on the back of Augments? He, he had one earlier, void, right? He, he gets the one for branching out, then goes into Void Crown, says you're, you're gonna double down here. You get plus two Void. You don't have to struggle to find a Belveth, for example, to get in that final piece of wood, get access to that Baron Asher. So that's going to be a pretty wow. big one for him going forward here. And now another big decision to be made here for Stakes. So where does this second Infinity Force go? Do you want to have that double Infinity Force Kaiser? Do you want to hold one of those for the Yasuo or further down the road? Yeah, we'll see what Stakeser decides to do. Hopping over to Scarambus, though, on that Karma reroll line. Does have a lot of Karmas already. It's just missing one more. But of course, if we're taking a look at this economy here, he already invested quite a little bit to get it online. Doesn't carry Ionia 3 right now to empower her, but is going to be finding her hopefully quite soon since no one else is looking for these invokers. Yeah, and the big thing about how hard it can be to get Ionia at some point throughout the game is that well, until you find that Shen, it is very hard for you to play a, a decent invoker setup and also have access to that free Ionia. And obviously, you want to go into the Ionia aspect. You can see right now, he is holding some of those Ionia units on the bench, just waiting for that Shen to show up. Of course, uh, I do have to correct myself here. He doesn't have uh, eight. He actually has a little bit less. The second Karma is, of course, coming out from that duplicator here of the Orn item. So, got baited. It's you okay. You got tricked by the tricks of Spyglass. It happens. I, I did get tricked. It happens. You know, sometimes I just see Karma and I get excited. But this time around, he's actually not as close as I was thinking. And that puts him in a much worse spot than I was expecting to be. Because with that much Econ out of the window and you still being so far off the Karma 3, it's probably going to be a little bit of a tougher ride than I would have hoped. Yeah, another thing that's also worth noting here, but in terms of like tough situations, is that on this rollout here on 4 1, a lot of these Ionian units are going to be super contested because you have Elusive Set rolling down for the Challenger comp, you have Stakes are rolling down for the Challengers, you have the person that was on the Ionia on the, on the comp line also rolling down for the likes of the, of the Shens, right? So a lot of these units are going to be complete flux here, and that's going to be a difficult one here. Elusive Set does find that high and that could be a saving grace, however. Yeah, that absolutely could be a saving grace. One percent chance on level seven coming through here with the Heimerdinger. Finds two upgrades right out of the gate, but Ineffable on the other side is dishing out a lot of damage with that Samira three. Can the Heimerdinger do enough here? Doesn't seem to be the case. Kaisa trying to help 
but will fall eventually. And for elusives, that's also spelling out a little bit of tragedy. We are going to get our augments now, so that could be a little bit of a saving grace to try and turn things around for players like Skarambas, for players like Zed, for players like Stakesor, who find themselves at the bottom of the leaderboard right now. Yeah, and just in general here as well, it's, okay, we get another, we get Dark Prismatic MX, okay? I think this is going to be a, a massive ooh, hit in the face for a lot of the players that want to bottom the end of the lobby, but... It's never it was down. never Egg. I'm sorry. I was trying to get excited for it, but it was never Egg here. He's on 22 HP. That would have just been in. I'm sorry. I have to say it. There's another Golden it Egg F here now, for though? an Fable, though. That could be an Egg. Come on. Come on. I can see you hover it. Pick it. Pick it. Pick it up. We got it. Egg, Egg, Egg. Come on. An Fable. Do it. Oh, he does not. Goes for the Lucky Gloves instead. Yeah, and, and Lug Gloves here is going to be super inter interesting to work with for him, right? Because he already has an open glove on the bench as well, so has the potential to make two TGs off the back of the next carousel. Really scaling in with that augment very well towards the back end of this game. It will be a pretty interesting spot to see how that pans out, because he's still on just five Noxes, right? He doesn't have that final spike, because he's still just playing those double casual pairs in the back line. Yeah, we'll see how that does. Once one more Noxus for sure. That's Amira putting in the work, trying to take out units. On the other side, we do have Ark finally broken from the wind streak. Is not 100 HP anymore, but still very strong and strong enough to take down Ineffable. Lots of prismatics coming through here. So we're going to see how that does. Or Og actually putting... putting <sighs> I'm so excited by this Augman pick, I cannot even talk anymore. Ark picked up Endless Hordes and Strategist Soul. So he's on an insane board right now. This is a pretty crazy board overall, right? And I think that, that a lot of people have been speaking about Endless Hordes and that not being a fantastic uh, Augment himself. It actually has pretty surprisingly good stats over the course of this weekend. And, and it has an Augment that's kind of been, I mean, got a little love and now is a bit better. And we heard Stakes all refer to it as well at the start of the, of the broadcast, right? Saying that, it's an augment that kind of just messes with the entirety of the matchmaking algorithm throughout the game because that would be players that lose like 30 HP less because it didn't hack an endless horde or, or a uh, or, or a cool pack player. Yeah, endless horde definitely is going to be a defining factor here in this game. But you can see elusive set capitalizing on the units he found earlier. Finds that Kaisa too, which is going to be so helpful here. Finds all three upgrades on the turret of Heimer Dinger. And with the Yasuo too as well, it is going to be a lot of damage coming out here. But he also needed to invest everything. Skarambas and elusive set both on single digits. We're in the 9 HP range, so they're on the chopping block. One more loss and it's all over. Belveth in the carousel is going to get picked up by Stakes or Memo watching this, probably crying right now. Yeah, and the big thing with Stakes here as well, right? Remember all the investments that he's made into these emblems makes all throughout the game. He has a challenge, he has the Ioni emblem for this Belveth. And that's what we were talking about at the start of the game. That is a classic, that double combination here could be absolutely massive for Stakes or. And as you're pointing out as well, Elusive and Skaram is on single HP. We could lose two players before before Raptors this game. That's crazy for the tempo in the lobby. And that's just with double prismatics and one player putting pressure onto the lobby does for you. It happens, it's super unfortunate, but you need it to find those spikes early, which for reroll comms like Skarambas is just unfortunate. He's trying his best with the Trickster class to put a little bit of extra pressure here out. He found a three Ionia on the back of that. Shen is going to be able to run it with the four invokers, but I'm not sure it's going to be enough. Who are we going up against? It's going to be Zolo Gazang on the right hand side, Elusive Zed on the left hand side fighting against Stakes or both of these players need to look out and find a win or it's going to be over for them in this third round of the day. Question is, are they going to be able to make it? It looks like it's going to be really hard for both of them. Elusive said, getting knocked out here. And I fear that Skarambas might be in similar fate. The Lux, the Heimerdinger, the Velkos, with that Swain tank, just too strong coming out of Solo Gazan. And that's rough, right? Because they're also at the same HP, so it's going to be Elusive Set taking the seventh. But another thing is worth noting, we're talking about what will Solo do with all these plus ones. Well, he's going to make a Sorcerer Heimerdinger, obviously, makes, right? Finds the Heimerdinger on level seven. But when you look at it in like the overall bigger picture right now, doesn't have Lux 2, does not have Heimerdinger, does have the Duplicator on the bench, but he's nowhere near being stable right now because he doesn't have that final big upgrade to really pull oh. him across the line. Linux here. I, I see it this time. Trickster's Glass on that Katarina, but that is going to be too 
Kata 3 on the board together with the Darius. We're missing a couple more copies to make that Darius come alive as well. But the Noxus is shining through here and going up against its own. On the other side, we do have that uh, Samira 3. She's going to be doing massive amounts of damage, taking down the Katarina 3. And that's the power of Samira for you. But I think she will still be taken down by Lithic here. Eventually, it's going to be possible. Yeah, almost looked like a cat catastrophe there for a second, but Samira not able to fully pull it over the line in, in that battle. But a key augment here we need, we need to talk about makes golden ticket coming through for Lydic, right? So he's saved a lot of gold rolling for these key carries, and he is very close to finding that Darius. But as you were talking about, he is contested by Neffable right now, so some of those units are very much in flux. Yeah, we'll see. Two more Dari Dariuses, Dari Dari to make it come alive. That would be the dream here to get the extra carry unit onto the board. Of course, the double Katarina is going to help a little bit, but since that Trickster's Glass copy cannot carry items, it's just going to be a little bit of an extra health pool to get through. Memo, however, picking up the Earth's grab bag as third augment here coming through with so much void augments uh emblems it's just crazy we can see he has the eight void already enabled without having the bellbeth but the bellbeth is on bench to get her screen time this is just this is just a rex eye reroll game okay i mean i'm saying this is a win for rex eye reroll okay no 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 you're not claiming this one this is a void vertical i am not allowing this to be smothered in the name of rex eye reroll uh-uh I think we have seen a little bit of vertical void throughout these past two days. It hasn't had the most success, at least the highest player, right? Because it's very hard to pull off. And you need the you need the elements here that you can kind of see the memo has all of them online, but he's getting run over by Orcs board right now. Right? The Endless Horde here really doing a lot of work, making it really hard to take these units out, even with the reduced HP off those units. But Kaiser 2, Rek'Sai 3, Bellwiff 2, potentially <laughs> down the line. There are so many oh, awkwards here to this board that could be made to put Memo into a fantastic good spot to find top 4. Finds Velkos upon Velkos upon Velkos here in that roll on the shop, but it's not necessarily what he needed. Is going to play the Yasuo right now. Don't worry, we'll bring back the Aid Void, of course. And now it's time for a little bit of legendary soupness and the Rek'Sai 3 coming online. No, you cannot claim this one. Despite a golden Rek'Sai, not allowing it. It's not going to be the main character here. We will have the Kaisa, we will have the Belva. I do want to ask you though, how are you feeling about that backline Baron? We're seeing a lot of players try to prioritize putting him in the front line, get that extra knock up, get that extra tankiness. But Memo saying, nah, I'll put it where it's supposed to go according to the UI. I think that I prefer the backline one here, especially with the set the Memo has online. But I could be wrong. This is not a line that I have a lot of uh, experience with over the past, like in my last 50 games or whatever. Um, that's not necessarily the line I want to go with. I feel like the second you go above free void, make wasting slots for perfectly good bruises, right? But but no, um, it, I think that's just like, you have when you have two emblems, you can play units that more naturally go in towards the front line. You're playing Yasuo, for example, right? We saw that come online. So you don't necessarily need to have more front and just produce more damage with them instead. Yeah, I think so too. It's a little bit of a prioritization with only having that Kai'Sa one. He needs the extra damage that he can get. And we can see that his front line even still is not strong enough to hold him over on the back of that Rek'Sai 3. It might be now Zolugazang on 2 HP. Litic was eliminated in the previous round. Can the Sorceress turn it around? And it's only going to be six Sorcs trying to take down one massive Baron boy. This time he's in the front line. This time he's fighting for his team front and center. And it will be enough to knock out fellow countryman Zolugazang. Yeah, and Solo here kind of struggling to, to get it to a stable point, right? Finds a lock too, finally, but wasn't able to make use of that strong start that we were talking about with the early Swain 2 and stuff like that. But so far, so good, you could say here. But four people remaining here, 5 4. This is uh, kind of an average, but you look at the HP pools here, everyone can kind of take one or two losses here. Memo 23 is the lowest HP, but like this means we go for a pretty long game depending on the, how the fights end up panning out. Yeah, it definitely means that. Let's see how it goes. Memo just finding one win before. Stakesor on eight wins. That's massive. This late into the game, being able to preserve for this long. And we're seeing now why being able to have the six Ionia, the Trickster Glass, Ari getting a little bit of extra support in there and the Kai'Sa coming around once more looking for that Kai'Sa three. 
Yeah, the issue with this investment, right, makes is going to be the fact that you have Memo Alive still hocking yeah. on to free copies of Kaiser. However, it's worth noting that since he's currently he's floating a chance where he can play double Kaiser for the setup until the point where Memo is knocked out. And then he has had time to rebuild his economy and start chasing those white units, which is also holding on for a potential Bell F2. On the other side, we do have Ineffable with the Samira 3, the Noxus for it coming around, trying to take down what they think is theirs, but the double Kaisa equipped does get a little bit of damage out. Will probably be enough here on the back of Belveth and Ari. The legendaries have done it again. They are taking another live Ineffable knockdown to 34, and Og will take a loss on the back of Memo. Yeah, so I kind of want to go back here and talk about some concepts, right? Because Remember when we had the, the great patch of Yasuo Kaiser and nothing else really for GSC1? Uh, one I of the tried most to forget. Yeah, so, so, so one of the most important things on that patch actually was playing rental units, right? A concept that was very much brought up in, in phase when we had the, the rental uh, chosen and stuff like that. But playing stuff like, let's say, a, a casual two star copy of Gwen until you find a different unit. It's very much what we saw Stakes so do here when he went into that Seri for a little while until he found his other units. Og going up against Ineffable. Both of these players are still safe on the base of HP. So are Memo and Stakesor. But in comes the Sephir. In comes the Shroud of Stillness, trying to take down as much utility as possible. We're seeing one beefy boy causing havoc in the back line, but the front line in the meantime is going to fall. And I think this is looking favored for Ogg's board. Down goes the Samira, and in the end, the rest will fall with it. Memo, once again, winning out here with his Void board. Yeah, and maybe he's gotten to the point now where he is fully stable with those uh, Void Emblem Holder uh, upgrades coming through, right? I think that could be a pretty important thing to look out for here. And for someone like Stakesor now, right, he, you can see there are multiple copies of Belveth around other boards as well. Now, not just on Memos, probably you can see Ork also leaning in towards that high cap board here. And that's kind of what happens when you're playing Endless Horse, because remember, he can only put one item on each unit. And and, and Thieves Club does count as just the one, one item, right? So... Darwin kind of, you know, being a little bit of a special star here, but to be fair, he is the Prince of Dimashia, right? So you got to have some leniency on him, I suppose. I always have lenience with Jarvan, you know, he's such a great unit, just jumping into backlines, shredding anything and everything. Did you know that the animation is actually using the Rek'Sai one? So if you want to be in favor of Rek'Sai boards, you can actually use the Jarvan here. Maybe I'll allow you to claim this one, but I'm, I'm going to be thinking about it. Og, 41 HP, still the highest HP target in this lobby here, is going to meet up with stakes, or both of them should be fine, but Ineffable is close to the brink of death. 18 HP and 6-1 is not a whole lot, and on the other side, there's one massive Baron waiting. We do have the extra Belveth 2 shredding through this entire board, supported by the Kai'Sa. Kai'Sa now finally online from Memo as well. He has another copy in the background, making sure that the other players that are looking for maybe a Kai'Sa 3, you know, are not going to be able to do it. Baron taking so much damage here, tanking massively for his team. Can the Kai'Sa get one more hold out? It's not going to be the case, and an Affable takes a win against Memo. This is a big hit in, in multiple ways. A massive win here. Obviously, a lot of damage done to the likes of Memo, but it also means that you stay on two lives for now. So if you attack a player, you're weak into matchup wise. Well, that's just going to be lucky. That, that doesn't necessarily mean the end of the world for you here. Now, Hawk, level nine, 12 units on the board here. If you can find the upgrades to the likes of Belveth 2, Ari 2 as well, he's level nine here ahead of whatever the rest of the lobby is currently looking at, right? So he has the better odds to get there. Lovely little tech there for anybody that's want to rat in their own ranked games, remaking the units that carry something like a Shroud, like a Sephir. Very good tech. If you just want to slam it last second, you're going to see that exactly happening. Sephir hitting that Rek'Sai, Shroud of Stillness, hitting both the carry units in the backline there, namely the Belveth that wanted to get on into this fight. Will Memo be able to survive this one? Has to be the big question. Rek'Sai 2 still alive, so is Belveth. She needs a couple a reset to get going she will get one here will she get another one looks like it might be the case belveth will come out swinging here one more time belvething all the way throughout this board but ari is alive she's going to take this win memo out in fourth 
And now the economy of stakes are becomes super important, right? Because does he have the economy here to roll for that Kaiser free? He was so heavily invested towards it. We saw a pick up and R2 ahead of Ark. He has been holding on to this R pair for a long time as well. So pretty interesting to see where these fights are going to go. The Cassandra 2 in the front here for Ark also going to be a massive pickup, basically just completely nullifying those massive tanks in the front line. And that's so great. If you can do that, we're going to see how it plays out here. And Effable was just able to find a Heimerdinger 2. Is the Heimerdinger 2 going to be enough to take a win against a horde that is running across this board here? Shroud of Stillness coming and does not hit the Samira. Bottom or top left corner is where she's standing. She's the main character of this board, targeted by the Jarvan getting down in that backline will fall before he gets another ult off. Samira still alive, still shredding, but she has so many targets to get through here. And the Ari reaches her first. The team has one, one more round and an effable out in third. And importantly here as well, Stakes all winning his round, right? And overall for the Okay, so that's potentially is Belveth 2 plus a Zephyr, so that's going to get blocked off wow. instantly here for Ogg. Just very good, very good awareness here coming through from him. And I, I love to see that kind of stuff, right? Like, obviously, Ogg is almost out of spots here, so any item that really just gives generic value to the team, like oh, a Zephyr, is a massive pickup. Ari 2 as well. Too. That's huge! All right, so a battle of Ari's, a battle of the Horde, against a pretty capped out Ionia's board is what we're looking for. Rita, who's going to take it? This is a difficult one because we didn't see which board stakes all played in his ghost fight, right? We only won the most recent one here. I think that the Endless Horse board here at this point should be falling off now. Like you have so many free unit, free item carries on the side of stakes or but everything can happen. Last second, moving around, trying to get those Sephirs and the Shroud to land. Both players trying to get this one done as they're fighting for the first place in round three. Can they do it is the question. Ari against Ari. The backline for Stakesor is still standing, but not for long as Og takes it all down, gets a first place here on the back of that Endless Horde and taking eight points home for the next round. And also, like, those two Zephyrs there were clutch. They were so critical in the way they were positioned, right? Snipes two of the carries, Snipes the Belveth, Snipes one of the Aries, the main Ari on top of that, right? So just a super strong setup here. Good, good awareness and good gameplay coming through from Ark. And also, both of these players now on 15 points for the overall standing. That is important because the breakoff from that top lobby going into that game was at 14, 15 marks. So they're not quite there, but both of these players now in with a good shot of making there towards the end of the day. I just want to say it was egg. I was waiting for the egg. I was hoping for the egg. I was praying for the egg. We didn't get the egg. We got endless hordes. I'll take it. I'll accept it. We do have an interview ready for you guys with Becca. And after that, our analyst desk is going to tell you more about this game. Hey, um, my name is Swang, uh, also known as Wega in game. I'm from Germany and I'm 24 years old. Um, yeah, my thoughts on Runeterra Reforged are that it's quite fun. Like, uh, there's a lot of diversity. I quite enjoy that there's a, a much la larger team working on the game now. They uh, really care about the game. They put out hot packs if they need to be done. I think uh, the TRCs are a good addition in general, uh, though uh, I think there should be less spots for each TRC uh, to get free GSC buy-ins, since um, if you look at the snapshot for this GSC, the ladder went crazy. Uh, one of my friends, Dark Hydra, he sat at around like 1.46k. LP and uh, he was rank 4 and then after a few days he he was rank 30 like it was so scary for for the people going for snapshot and I'm lucky since I'm in the TRC I got a spot for free I'm just chilling in Grandmaster. <laughs> Appreciate the German community a lot. Uh, uh, you've heard it a lot of times already Memo. Now it started in his small stream we had a small discord with only a few people and uh, it grew out of control like all the German people just came to us and I think that's part of why Germany has been so successful since uh, we've been growing uh, quite close we've you know improved as players a lot together so big shout out to Memo 
to like OG friends from there, like Marx, Lia, Zaza, all these people. There's too many German people that are supportive. I, I can't name all of them, but uh, I'm grateful for all of you guys. And uh, I'm also grateful for my girlfriend. She, she tries to watch if she can and support me as well. So thank you for that. Welcome back one and all to the Analyst Desk where we have got the laser focus on the game and absolutely nothing will help sway us from what we saw in that last one. Absolutely astonishing game on Stable Rift from the very beginning, but let's get into it because there's a whole ton to talk about. Morgan, I know you were particularly big on you know, what we we're seeing here in terms of the tempo of the lobby, which seems to be overwhelmingly fast. Yeah, the thing about having a high tempo lobby, okay, listen, listen, hear me out. It's fine if you go from silver to gold to prismatic, or gold to gold to prismatic, or a triple prismatic lobby. Oh, the issue with this game is that you went from gray to double prismatic. So the people that were not able to keep a good state in this game and the people that did not get a, a good augment in order to adapt to the current state of the board really got dropped out early. This was one of the wildest games we had. This was one of the highest tempo games we had. And we said goodbye to two players in stage four. So that is considered very early. Scarabez and Elusive Z did not have a very good game at all in this lobby. We, we said goodbye to two players in stage four. Even Solo Gosang, who was trying to go for that 8 stork board, was not able to make it to Ari because just the tempo increased so much. Especially for a player like Aug. Endless Hordes, all of a sudden, you're taking so much more damage when you face Aug. He's already very strong going into it. And I think he perfectly figured out how to, to manipulate Endless Hordes where you have all these extra units with a trade like Strategist that gives you, you know, uncapped shielding and AP. Doesn't care how many units you have, there's no limit to it. So really was able to piece together these two augments and figure out a board that was you know, strong enough to win a lobby. Uh, Endless Hordes used to be the worst dogman in the game, maybe <laughs> in the history of TFT. Now, very clearly not the case. I want to kind of open this up to both of you since, you know, that was something, something we weren't expecting to see. I mean, I know we've heard from David already, but Morgan, you know, do you think we're going to live in a world where we might even see Endless Hordes cropping up again? Or is that really just a one-off perfect storm kind of scenario? I mean, when we spoke to Scipio and things were at the start of the day, they both really shared the hair upon uh, Endless Horde. Not hate, but their immense disliking to that augment. They said that it really revolutionizes the gameplay and it allows you to take so many stat units, so many um, more units on your board. We had how many? 12, 11 units at Aug's board at the end. So hmm. that was really so much. So I'm expecting that Endless Hordes is one of the strongest augments in the game. If you get it and in a good state and you have enough HP so that if you lose or if you're not able to get your units to level 9, to start capping them out, to starting each and every unit, because essentially, you lose a lot of the power because of the downside and the augment that punishes you for the two units that you get. So, we see it, but you cannot take it from a spot where you're losing. Something similar, for example, like when Mix was so excited about the egg, you have to be willing to be able to use an augment like this to its full power. So, of course, you know, Org took a lot of the spotlight there, and we can see this board absolutely astonishing stuff, but I just want to hit on some of the other things that were going on in the lobby as well. Stakesaw, you know, bringing out the Ionia Challenger setup. I mean, we was talking about the idea of having kind of these rental units. Well, David, what do you think about that kind of concept of trying to, you know, play different versions of your board as you're leveling up? Yeah, that's exactly what Challengers and Ionia are. Uh, they're, they're a comp that spikes at level 7, and if you're in a desperate position, if you have little HP, if your spot was not the best, you go all in at 7, you roll down to 10 or 0 gold as early as 3-5, and you try your best at top 4. If suddenly you high roll and you roll a little bit of gold, upgrade everything, you're, you're streaking all of stage 4, suddenly you shift your focus from 
I'm just trying to survive in a top four to, hey, I have a chance to cap on my board to get into six Ionia with RE2, with Belveth, with Heimerdinger later into the game. So it has phases to it. And if everything goes well, it's a board that can evolve into something that can actually win games, despite challengers themselves not normally being able to do so. As Morgan said before, you know, the results of this lobby are going to be very important looking forward. So let's bring up the standings and see where we all are. Because again, where you finish here on day three will determine how many GSC points you leave with. Even if you can't win the tournament, moving up even a single spot could make the difference. Yeah, standings are looking very, very scary for almost everyone in this page right now. But when we swipe back up, specifically Skipeos, which has finally been able to get a win after the broadcast today. After his interview, we said that, oh, wait, he didn't get the interview above, but apparently it was just a late delivery. He's been able to win his last lobby, so he's climbing back up shortly to these players in front of us. Sonara has been performing really well among Coco who surprisingly wasn't really able to keep up with the day two streaking. Yesterday he won four games in a row. Today he got a second, a third, and a seventh. So that is the tempo we need to find in game four for Coco. All right, guys, we have got our casters ready to get into the second half of the day. So we should waste no more time. Wita and Makes, please take us away and get us started on the second half of the day. Thank you so much, guys. And I, you know, I had a sneak peek at our lobby and I'm getting giddy already again. I mean, at this point, we have so many players in this tournament that I'm excited about. It doesn't matter what lobby we pick, but in this one, we have a former EMEA champion, Canvas. And I did bring a little bit of lore to the table here because recently, you know, I was in bed, I was scrolling through my Instagram stories and suddenly I saw a post like five minutes ago at 3 a.m from Canvas saying, oh yeah, I'm live now, streaming some TFT. And I was like, Canvas, did you really just start a stream at 3 a.m.? And he's like, nah, I started at one. And that was for him an acceptable answer. <laughs> just goes to show you how crazy some of these players are when it comes to playing these games. The sleuth schedules are overrated, right, mate? We can kind of both attest to that. But looking at the points of these players, we are going to be back in lobby for you. This is the same lobby we were in in the previous game, right? So these are players that need some strong performances to really propel them back up towards that title challenge here. But you're looking at Volta, you'll have Memo as well, again, repeats in the previous lobby. Um, but also, like, we're looking at someone like Skip. Might have expected him to be a little bit higher up the standings, but remember, he had a very poor game number two, I believe. So. He is kind of just slowly but surely building back up his performance here. Yeah, it's good to see him not in Lobby 4, but in Lobby 3 instead. Of course, we're also going to be having Tebby here, who had a grand old time yesterday. Volta, who we've been speaking extensively about at the start of the show. And then we have two more Dermids coming to the rescue, hopefully, of Memo. Wet Jungler and Super Eagle are here to try and manifest their way into the top lobbies. Now, that is not going to be an easy task. In this lobby specifically, I said it before, you're looking at a former EMEA champion. You're looking at a former Golden Spatula Cup winner. This is a heavy hitter lobby if I were to call one out. But I was looking at the combined number of world's appearances across the board as well. Like Campus one, yeah, Leavis two, Skipeas one as well, right? So that's just it's just ridiculous, right? How stacked this lobby is. And you kind of attest to just overall the skill level that we have in these tournaments here as well. Because you have Went Jungler, for example, right? He's a player that back when we started competitively, I kinda of bring this up every time he's on broadcast, but I think this thing is a neat fact, right? Mm -hmm. We used Ladder exclusively as our qualification measure in set free. He was one of the players together with Fluffy and Salvi, I believe, that had the maximum amount of qualifier points by being a consistent Ladder player. And to walk it back into the previous set makes, as we both know, we finally start to see Wet Jungler really perform in tournaments as well. Yeah, I mean, he was one of the most consistent players out of the previous set. So definitely another name to keep on mind as players are getting ready for game number four. After this, there's two more. It's not all over yet, but this lobby is looking for the highest highs to claw their way into the top echelon of today. Into those top eight of the leaderboard is where you want to be to finally take it all. Of course, there will be golden spatula cup points for everybody, but there's only one golden ticket. Depends on your prismatic organs, that could be multiple. <laughs> Come on! There's only one golden ticket to the EMEA finals. We're not talking about the augments here, but 
If we, we are talking about augments, I want redemption for the egg that we've been scammed out. So prismatic, egg first, something like that. I'm down. <laughs> you can't get egg first, mate. You're no I help said, I'm broken. down. More dog you're watching. No, you're no help No, I'm down. We'll, we'll do it. We'll make it I mean, happen. Call, call, call up more dog, right? I'm sure exactly. he'll love that idea. And I'm sure that every single player <laughs> in the TFC universe would love the idea of golden egg. <laughs> but no, let's look at it here. I see a very oh, equal spin in here. Oh. I'm looking at players in the Yumi soon zone as well, right? Because and this now is pretty interesting, right? Because we're looking at faster levels. So for players that might be on an Aurelion Soul line, for example, that could be beneficial. Okay, chat is cooking. Somebody's saying new portal where everyone gets a golden egg. I am so down. Somebody at more dock, clip it, ship it. We're gonna go there. But first, we're gonna be going into the university, which of course means we're gonna have a prismatic on our hands first. Now, Wida, talk to me a little bit. Now that we know, right? Many people probably experience this in their ranked games. Now that we know prismatic is gonna come up first, how do you best play around that? I mean, the, the best way to play around it is by being canvas here and picking up that Aurelian Soul, right? Because <laughs> that is kind of like one of the, the key factors. And it's kind of like why I, I on ladder, you know, sometimes people get a little bit angry when you are not an Aurelian Soul player and you vote for the university. Because it turns out that a university is very good for Aurelian Soul players. And if you're playing like Orn, you do not want that to save your life. And look at the amount of Orns across the board here as well, Mix. That's a very big thing to keep in mind. Living Forge, it's not bad. But there are just so many other high power prismatics that you'd rather have in play that you could end up just like completely just griefing yourself and being down in augments. Something that's very interesting to me as we are looking upon these legends here is that Memo actually went from Earth to Orn for this specific game. So in the previous game, we saw him run that Earth, we saw him run the voids. Now he's saying, nah, I'll just play I'll play Orn for this one, just for funsies. So this is where we're going for him now. However, Volta and Wet Jungler still repping the Earthy boy and getting that legend out there. We're gonna be getting legends and augments in a couple of seconds so we'll see what comes around and just to kind of back up my point here as our observer and help here shad is pointing out only non on players voted for university right like no <laughs> on players went there because these players know that they do not want to go there uh and also nothing here we kind of as we, i've been watching a bit of Daisic here because like day one i wasn't on the broadcast i was like who do i want to watch i want to watch Daisic, right uh he's back he's competing it's great and when you're playing Prismatic first here, you're guaranteed to get the Ancient Archives too, which gives you oh. two copies of, of, of Thermal Traits, right? I'm, I'm not even going to talk about what's going on here because we all know what's happening, right? Um, yeah, I was hoping that maybe there was something else that will distract us from the level up, but it's guaranteed. We're going to be going there. Canvas is a happy camper. We do have to note something for Skip, though. A little bit of an error in our overlay. He's running Poro and not Orn. Okie dokie. Okay, Tiniest Titan makes. This is actually, this is like my favorite augment in the game. It is so, I, I, I would run Poro if I could get this augment every time, right? Like if I just knew that Prismatic first every game, i just pick this because this augment is so good. Oh, not Poro, Pengu, sorry. Pengu, obviously, right? Um, Pengu, yeah. This augment is, is so good because like what it does, it gives you that extra speed, it gives you the extra HP, it gives you so much gold as well because this just continues to print gold for you. And if you're playing a reroll line like the Samira here, for example, it's such a great tool for you because you get that continuous HP back possible. It's just the best of both worlds. It absolutely is. And we are getting those augments from all of those players across the board. I personally, I'm a tiniest Titan enjoyer as well. Just look at how cute that tiny river sprite is looking. Definitely something to be a fan of. But we will be seeing all of the augment choices in just a little bit as players are moving through the first couple of stages trying to get something online. We can see that Memo was hoping to maybe get Piltover here with that Vi, with that Ori, but it doesn't seem to come around. Yeah, and, and, and I keep thinking it's worth, worth noting, right, because sometimes when people pick these augments up and they're win streaking, you, they feel like they kind of lost an augment, which is not really the case with this one because you just do get that gold back. And as I said, like the pillow here is another angle to work towards, but I think that now that moment has kind of passed in time, right? And kind of see the amount of two star Samiras makes all across the board. I know you're a Samira enjoyer, but are you also a Samira enjoyer when the entire lobby is trying to get a Samira 2 in the early game? No, you see, the problem is I want to be the only one that likes Samira. I don't like competition. I want her to be only mine. And so I don't like everybody running for her because that makes it very hard for me to actually play her. 
Now, on Tebby, we are seeing Pandora's items being picked up. Of course, it is going to be that Radiant Rageblade on the Samara for now, which is going to be doing a lot of heavy lifting and helping and moving through the stages here. And we'll see the lobby get split up a little bit. We have Wet Jungler and Litic currently on 100 HP. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the Caretaker's Chosen that Wet Jungler is on. How are we feeling about this one? Okay, so I was actually, I was, so I have not had like the most success on Let Up The Set because I've just been cooking permanently, right? So I had a, I had a period of time where I was playing uh, Bard, uh, pre-buff to Bard. Uh, don't ask why, I just did. Uh, and Kha'Zix has chosen a super strong argument now. I think it, it, it's, it's very good and I think it's a, it's a high value choice to go for it. There's a lot of incremental power that comes through this augment. It really means you can kind of just match whatever happens all throughout the stage. All right, let's see if it does wet jungler way going up here against Memo. We know Memo is on Tiniest Titan, so he's not too worried about these losses. Just running around, speeding through it. But another player picked up something that I'm always interested in, and it's going to be Scapaeus, who ran with the Radiant Relics. And that's always a question of what are you actually getting here? What are you picking up? Is it going to be more defining? Or will it be something that you can flex into different things? We'll see what players are going to be picking up here from this carousel. And it's kind of funny to point that out, it makes, right? Because we have Tebby on the uh, on the Pandora's items, right? And in reality, that could just be Radiant Relics if you hit very early on the item that you want to get, right? So in reality, so it's a bit of an upside there for, for Tebby, whereas that's kind of the same augment that Scapaeus is playing. Except that it actually helps him later down the line, right? With Pandora's, you're able to be a little bit more freely in your carousel choices. You don't need to guarantee items because you can kind of rely on them getting Pandora. So I think I would rather be in Tebby's position here rather than Skip's. But both are not bad. I like a little bit of shiny items. Yeah, and speaking of shiny here, Lytic, on towards a stone line most likely here, opening up with the Jinx as the primary carry out this composition. And so far, so good, right? But you're looking at a front line that has a two-star choke after two-star two, two star Aurelian, two-star Warwick. This is a very strong common in general, right? You see a lot of there's Warwick plus Aurelia plus sets, but there's no sets right now for, Lit for Lytic, right? Which is going to be a bit of an issue now, but I think no matter what, he should be fine. I am a little bit curious about the mods. We are seeing Lytic run that pink animation, which I believe is going to be the Virulent. We were having a little bit of a discussion around all of those colors earlier, so I'm pretty sure this one is Virulent, which is going to be pretty good for that Zeri and will probably be worth it. Of course, much better would be a yellow hue because that would be robotic, but it's not going to come through for this game right now. Well, speaking of the devil and he shows, and I was not talking about Teemo, set in the shop right there. Could be a fun, an up upgrade, but you also got to figure out, is that Choke F2 better or weaker than that set 1 to be added to the board? Because there's no Ionia online either. But Super Eagle here uh, is a player that we have seen pick up a, a few games of Rek'Sai Reroll. This is not a Rek'Sai Reroll line, but just kind of just explaining like what he's open to in general. Like He's a player that plays pretty wide for the most part as well. So, <laughs> I'm just using Volta. I'm on, just, just laughing. Well, also got Ooh. double slot emblem. Okay, not bad. Well, that's got the power of the Ancient Archives make, so we're going to be seeing six on pretty much no matter what this game. I am down for it, honestly. I've been a fan of six on ever since the set released. I think the overcharging is extremely fun. And I'm glad that it's finally gotten the recognition I believe it deserved from the very start. Litic, however, streaking here with 100 HP. Will Wet Jungler join him up there? He will not. It will only be Litic going into Crux with the 100 full. Yeah, but Tebby as well, so we have, we have, we have, we have like three players streaking here, right? Memo's HP is kind of misleading, right? Because of that tiniest Titan makes, so. Yeah. Good economy He's for streaking, his streaking, but the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> That's the thing, <laughs> streaking, but like, makes, like, if you're a Volta, right? Because I don't know, like, if you just like interpop both tomes, obviously pop the first tome, got the song, then you start kind of like, Temp tempering with his board to ensure like ends up matching what he needs to get the second zone. But even then, getting second zone is going to be super, super beneficial for him, right? And super lucky. But also keep in mind here, he has a potential for a six zone. If he gets a little bit lucky here, that could be absolutely massive. Yeah, he did find the echo from this PvE round here. Is going to get another one off of the shop. Maybe we'll get another one here, depending on what we decide to do. But for now, 
it's not going to come all together. I'm starting to worry a little bit though, Wida, because if we saw correctly, Super Eagle is also on a very good losing streak, which necessarily is not a bad thing, but you would generally like something to be there to kind of even that out. And right now we don't have a Samira 2, we have two Zon, it's not Viraland, it's not Robotic Arm, so it's kind of just like something. And we know we're going to be competed on these Son emblems and Son units. So uh, th this position is making me nervous. I mean, there's some reason why it would make you nervous, right? But it does have a lot of gold to work with here. If he maintains his loss, we can kind of build up some some good losses. One would assume right here, three unit loss could be a lot worse. It's, it's decent, it's not fantastic, but it's definitely something that you can keep, keep an eye on. Also, it's worth knowing that the Seri line can kind of support two players, right? That, as the case with with most four cost centric carries, it's not like where you need to find a, a Seri free, for example, to be stable at all. So, even gets a bit of chemtech and here if you want to go down that route as well. I don't think you do. I think if you are running this and you don't have Piltover online and you know somebody else is on the Zons, you're probably opting to go for a Zeri with a little bit more Freljord and Super Eagle holding those ashes, I think, is agreeing with that line, leveling up to six here and trying to make something happen as all of the other players, of course, are picking Augment's canvas, rerolling all three options here. Still not very excited about what he's getting, but is going to go with the magic wand. Yeah, keep in mind, he is still going to be on this level up line, right? So he does have a lot more flexibility. And I think that another thing that's worth noting is that when you get to the higher echelons, you get into to getting to those legendaries, for example, a lot of those carriers like, benefit a lot more from AP. So the extra rod here is good. The, the team-wide AP from Magic Wand is also fantastic. Uh, kind of to touch back with the base that we, we were talking about here. And a key thing at the start of the set, right, was the whole duality between having Seri and Aphelios, right? And that's a line that we could see Super Eagle go down into the Aphelios, depending on how his 4-1 rolled down looks. I am just laughing because Super Eagle picked up Transfusion, if I saw correctly. And with the fact that he's already on this very big loss streak, he is going to profit off of that right away. So that's a really nice little benefit for him here as Volta actually moves under him and Eagle finds a win here in 3-2. Probably the turning point. Hopefully you don't want to go back to losing now. There speaking, that would be pretty bad, right? Because also now he's kind of created his economy to a point because as you're talking about with that transfusion and just in general, the, the expense of the compositions, of the likes of the Seri, of the likes, of the failures here. We'll potentially look towards holding this Tarek as well as currently sitting on the bench here. Tarek is a key unit in trying to buy a lot of time for the front line here as well. Just kind of figure out which ones he wants to cut from the bench here as well. So good understanding of where his board is going here from Super Eagle and obviously can still go back into Seri should the, should the items arrive. You know, Vida, do you remember our first EMEA Rising Legends finals where Warwick was everyone's favorite? We had that oh, little oh. bit of like, I have a Warwick. Do you want a Warwick? I have a Warwick. Do you want a Warwick? It feels that way with Samira right now. Everywhere I look, I see her and I swear it's not my obsession with that unit. No, see, but she is just like, I mean, we've seen people, on, on players on Twitter, like, you know, joke with the fact that they hope that they're, they're going to hit this legendary unit today, right? Uh, speaking of hitting legendary units here, Seri with a sword on the carousel here being opened up. That's going to be a gift for Volta, at least denying that Seri from the other players in the lobby that might be looking down that route as well is a big thing here. Because keep in mind, those two emblems now, that could be six sawn and six sawn to me. It's a massive spike because it's free items coming through, like free mods, obviously, and then those are going to get supercharged on top of that. That is a massive spike and he doesn't have to roll for the Seri. Yeah, it's just a very, very good pickup for Volta, who is going to have a grand old time here on the back of those six songs that are now coming into play. We knew that he was holding the right units on the bench the entire time. We're going to be seeing them come into play right now. Echo moving in, Warwick moving in, and here we go. Zixon, we have the robotic, if I see that correctly, on Ziri as well. We will get confirmation as well. And we are running that shimmering, if I'm not mistaken, on Maokai. Yeah, and on top of that, we also do have the, the chem tanks. So we'll be seeing yeah. those massive explosions as well. But Lydic here, good awareness, has that early Sephir slammed in that bottom corner here. So this Seri is not necessarily going to get a lot of time to scale into the fights. So another thing that's worth noting makes, look at the itemization here. It has that 
early, early block pressure here, which will be transferred over to an Urgot when the time comes. But right now, you don't need to have the Urgot in play to play the six stone line, right? So you can just play off the back of the strong fall cost in as he has two start now, get interested into a better board further down the road. Yeah, I'm a little bit worried about the Zeri items that we're not currently in possession of, but just hoping to find them later down the line. And you are going to be seeing that Nasus just doing much, much of the carrying here for now, trying to hold down the fort exactly like he did in the previous round. But of course, the comp is a little bit competed, and that is going to mean that you will have a harder time finding the units that you're looking for as several players are looking for those series. He's going to be going for the fork on the line instead here. And with the chem tech here as well, you, you don't necessarily get to get Nasus into the back line, right? Nasus doesn't get into the back line, but he will still be the main focus point of this entire board and will still have a massive explosion coming through here. Another thing that's also worth noting with the situation here is we have long distance pal in play here. So all that armor and that you see Nasus get from that Gargoyle stone plate is transferred over to the Seri as well. Yeah, and uh, we are getting confirmation that the mods of the Zon are exactly like we said. We do have the Chem Tank, we do have the Shimmer Injector on the Jinx, and of course the yellow robotic arm onto that Zeri. But now we're going to check in with everybody on the right side with our in-game stats. Let's see, Tebby, 9 wins, only 11 gold though. And on the lower half, we have Skip with 5 losses, but 62 gold. Big, big HP disparity between these two boards. Round about 60 HP that separate them. Yeah, we can kind of see like what's, what's the case here for Scipaeus, right? He's kind of struggling right now. Doesn't necessarily have the access to this Comet Shooter yet. This rollout will be massive. He has over 49 gold to work with on this rollout. It's going to be big, right? So got to find the Tarek too. Got to find that wow. Comet too as well. But he has Volta, he everything. just found a Zeri too just naturally gets her off of the shop. That's a massive upgrade coming here on the right-hand side for the Zixon player. Skip, still looking for similar hopes, still looking for similar units, and is going to find a Karma 2 here, but that's not, that's not doing all that much just yet. But there's an Ari in the shop as well here. Now Skipea has got to figure out, can he fit this Ari onto the board somehow? Ari is normally part of the capped out version of this board, but Fitting in on level 7 can be a bit difficult because he doesn't have that invoker, right? So you kind of want to have the vertical invoker to keep these casts going right now. But he is also kind of just floating socks here. So I assume that when this, once this wind comes through here, the area will be picked up and then we'll kind of put the puzzle together afterwards. Yeah, I agree. We did see him sell off the Zed, which is the Ionia unit that you usually carry to kind of have a little bit more oh. frontline until your Shen comes around. So that is going to be what he wanted. Holding on to that Sorcer Sorcerer's Crest could be interesting. Yeah, return investment not too good for him right now. Could have been an, a line to look towards at some point further down the road instead here. But we'll be trying to get that front line topped off here with the healing orbs, right? Because this is very different from the likes of the um, off of the Hunt that we know from, from previous. Now, healing orbs is going to heal the, the nearest unit to that front, like to the to the death to the to the dead unit, right? So this means that for Kami, you can kind of skip a gunblade because you are just naturally going to keep that top, that front line healed because they are most of the time going to be between Kami and dead units. Yeah, and I'm so curious how this is going to play out. Like there was another Karma, Skipeus didn't pick it up, so. Probably not going for the reroll and will transfer items to the Ari eventually is what I'm suspecting here, but I'm I'm not too sure if that's what we're doing. Skip, take the wheel. This guy is building comps like no one other, so it could be anything, really. I'm not too confident on predicting this one's moves, but is going to find a win here against Candice. Candice now down to 29 HP, and Volta losing despite that Zeri 2. We did see another player pick up a Zon Crest. It's going to be Lytic, so like I said, several players are looking for that line right now. Yeah, there's a lot of strong players here as well, right? That you gotta you, you look at, right? And and these players are just kind of in a bit of a a, a bad position, right? But like I think like for to throw a lot here, the reason why Volta isn't super strong is we're gonna be moving on to a very important roll down makes here with the from the side of campus here. Rise to not instead wow. of the upgrade you're looking for. It's, that is not a front an upgrade. That is not gonna be an upgrade for the RE either, but it is something for now, and we are gonna be in one of those good ones here in the um 
in the you know in, in one of the good ones here, right? Because this is gonna give a, a bit of lockdown here, team wide team wide damage spread as well. Yeah, the only thing I'm worried about right now is that the Ari is your carry, and the Ari seems to be popular among the players, so it's going to be hard to actually get her online. And in the meantime, you don't really have anyone else to cover for you. And despite being two levels above Super Eagle, there is no real upgrade here. All of the units are one star, except for that rise, and the rise alone is not going to hold you over. So Candace needs to find more. Probably once that Senna over there, you can see Lytic wiggling out of his cage but will go for the bf sword instead yeah here, Dunblade, like, yeah you say the center would be a nice pickup obviously for canvas to try to get closer to another upgrade but getting the gunblade onto the ari here with the pickup of the sword is going to be probably the, the most important thing for him right i think that just getting that team wide healing and ensuring that your ari is not going to get popped that as easily as, as it might have been Skipeas, though, going for a more Sorcerer-centric line now with that spat pickup most likely as well. So a lot of interesting things kind of moving around the lobby right now. Yeah, let's see. It is on the bench and available. We do have the six invokers come online. Definitely would like a Shen 2 to get a little bit of extra tankiness, but it's not going to be the case for now as we are not making that Sorcerer's Emblem. We're slamming a blue buff. Yeah, but again, it might have just been a unit preference, right? It wasn't a rise, which is an invoker unit, right? Getting that pilled over rise coming down here could be massive, right? Getting that team wide spread damage, because when you when you combine that grenade with the, the damage from Kama when she gets on her third cast, that is a lot of damage spread across the units in that hexagon, right? As you can see right there. Yeah, I still think he's going to transfer those item juniors uh, over to the Ari, which I think in that case the blue buff is actually pissed since you're not running the invoker emblem on her because you don't have one. So once he actually finds a karma to replace that karma, Ari is going to become the main character, but he finds himself in a similar position to Canvas. Both of these players are looking for Ari as main carry, and that is bad news on a legendary unit. There are just not that many to go around, and so they will be very, very hard to find. Yeah, honestly, another like shower thought that I've had, or like just like a random thought, right? Is that Ari is like the the biggest like main character syndrome carry in like all of TFT. I feel like because is remember like good? remember like when she had when when in like set four, I believe like in phase when you had the spirit Ari, like she was like this massive like board nuker, and now you have her again as like a novel like really really needy champion to a certain extent. Like just like, completely warps the meta game when she's like strong. I think that's just kind of fun with like we have these Aries in the stronger like when, when you have Ari at the higher tiers. Yeah, and you are seeing what Ari one has to put up with. A Yasuo in her face is not going to be able to survive this one. The challenger board coming over from Wet Jungler just too strong, too much for Canvas to actually handle and to survive is going to be one big hit, putting him down on the chopping block. But maybe, just maybe, the Raptors can turn it around, find Shen too. That's a nice little upgrade to have here. We'll see what else comes around. Yeah, that's a lot of things here that could come through. Right? Just like looking for any excess, um, any excess to these five cards right now. Arius is talking about makes is going to be the most important upgrade here. Science would be nice frontline, but even have, having double Science can somewhat be pretty okay because it's just a lot more disruption. But also Senna too. It's just so much sustainability for the entire team as well with that shield. Yeah, hopping over to Volta. Volta on the back of that Zeri 2, finally finding some good items for her. Has that Rage Blade going, has an IE slammed. Still no Jarvan to make it come alive, though. No, that's kind nice of little the, upgrades. That's, that's the big lack here for Volta, right? Even though, like, this. Um, this, this Nasus has kind of almost served this purpose to a certain extent here. You can see he's holding on to that Jarvan on the bench as of right now as well. So. This is going to be an interesting one to, to kind of follow, follow and see where it does end up here because there's, there's no job in two. This comp is a lot weaker than you might think it is. Yeah, this is still RE1 going up against Volta and he hits that Zephyr on her right away, taking her out for just a little bit of time. In comes the Zon explosion, but it's very far from the enemy backline. Cassante has done his worst to try and make that happen. He's on to the Zeri, knocks her out, and that looks to be the case for Candace to actually find a win here. It's only the Nasus that he needs to defeat, and with all of his three two-star legendaries in the background, that should be possible. I kind of just wish like there was like some spaghetti moment where if a Cassande knocks off a unit with a with like chem tank on, on it just like lands on another board, 
I just like exposed on that point. Please no. Please no. Could you imagine Don't say that? that. Don't give them any ideas. However, well, such a fiesta moment, by the way, right? But like, you can kind of see here some of the strengths and purposes here for Memo, right? The combination of long distance pals on this spot, particularly as well, is super strong because you have a unit like Urga with the double oh. titans continuously scaling into the fights. And so will this Ari now make it. You've been hounding about this Ari too for so long, and now it's finally here. I mean, I had to. She's the main character and she is missing out on her purpose with only being one star. But now she is here. Cassante has been moved out and set. Cyan is the main tank for Candace on the right hand side. But the Ari is the one that needs to be doing the damage going up against Tevi's Aphelios board. And look at the damage that she's pumping out. It's massive. It's so good. And Candace will probably come back on the base of this. On the other side, we are seeing Volta getting knocked out. Getting a little bit close there for Canvas, but in the end, he makes it. You can kind of see the power level from Tebby's side of, field, side of the board here with that Radiant Rage pit, right? And when you have, um, I think, I believe it's, it's a hard home, or is it, or, I mean, it might be awesome, but that's one of the, the galaxies I forgot the name of right now, right? Where, where you can upgrade your, you can forge a Radiant item of one of the items you have. Yeah, and when you have like the Aphelio centric patches for a while, Rage Blade was one of the most important ones to go for because that attack speed scaling is absolutely insane and kind of the same thing going on here for Lydic as well. Not a lot of additional damage to his units, right? There's no Giants there, no Death Blade, for example, but just has a ton of attack speed trying to get that plague out there, trying to also ensure that it just gets a lot of those executes with the ability. Yeah, and we are seeing a similar board to Voltas here coming out of Lytic. Both of these players were looking for those six Zon units. A little bit less this in slot. Uh, this in slot. This mods on Lytic's board here with the Virulent, but look at the sheer damage that Candace's board is putting out. The Zeri just nuked to bits in a couple of seconds, and this one will go Ari's way once more, taking out Lytic here on the bottom of the leaderboard. Scapaeus also taken a loss. All of these players are struggling to make it into the top four. It's something like very reminiscent about just seeing Canvas knock people out with this animation, right? That was just kind of the, the entire picture that we got to see time and time again over the course of the Rising Legends finals in the last set when he, when he claimed that EMEA title. But has a lot of work to do here. And the second that he lines into something like Memo, right? He hasn't played Memo in a while. You can see 10 rounds at least since the two of them are played. And if Canvas's board is not strong enough to match Memo's, all this hard work he's put in might just be for a sick at the end of the day. I'll see, we'll see how it goes. There are a couple of other players that he could still meet. Here is Memo's board. Another Zon player, another Zeri. This time only two instead of six. And on the back of this tiniest Titan, Memo has been doing fantastic for himself throughout the game. Early loss streak, gets the stats, gets the long distance, and is extremely well equipped here with items, best in slot items on that Urgot, really good items on the Zeri as well. Will he be able to take out more players is going to be the question. He is going up here against Scipaeus, if I'm seeing correctly, and that might be very hard. Left hand side, we have Candice going up against Super Eagle. One of these two players could get knocked out. They're both on single digit H. P. Can the Karma do enough for Skip here Ooh. is going to be the question. And yes, yes, she can. Doing lots and lots of damage. And Candace and Skipeus both make it through one more round. Yeah, and even as a Karma too, you can kind of see just how much power there is in her when she gets that third cast and those carries are, on, are exposed to her, right? Ari doing a lot of chip dancers. Ari is still Ari 1. But even then, that's still a lot of power here. And when you look at the, like, in the shop right now, he has a rise pair uh, he can pick up potentially, but he would have to sell off his Shen pair potentially, or even his Galio pair. He's still on Galio 1. It's 5 6 makes. There are so many shortcomings off this board that everything needs to be fall everything needs to fall in line for Scapaeus perfectly here. Uh, we know Scapaeus loves a little bit of a positioning game. Let's see that Trout of Stillness hit. Both sides have won, but the Ari and the Karma are unaffected for both of these boards. So it is a little bit of a battle of Ionians coming through between Candace and Scapaeus. Somebody has to go home here. Somebody will not survive this round. And on the back of that, it's actually getting so close here. Karma getting chumped by that Cyan. In comes the Ari old and Candace will take the win here. Take down Scapaeus and Tebby also knocked down to four HP will survive however on the back of Scapaeus going out here still a chance for him to make it into the top four 
Yeah, honestly, Tabby can kind of be happy, I think, with a, with a fifth place this game as weird as Sandra. He's on a sixth loss streak now after finding an Aphelios 2 with this Rage Blade on top of it as well. I think he was, was he on the, the Sawn line for a while as like on top of that, right? So he's definitely going to be, I won't, you're never going to be happy about going fifth in an important tournament game where you're fighting for a chance to stay in the running to become the Golden Spatula Cup champion. But I think this is going to be an acceptable fifth when you look at how the game has gone, especially because Campus was able to stabilize before he, like, before he went out game. Hopping over to Tebby's board here is going to get an anvil, of course, from this PvE fight. We'll see how it does and rolls down here to try and get an upgrade. That Urga 2 would be really nice. The Shen 2 would be really nice. Does come into fruition, so a little bit of a tankier frontline is going to help that Aphelios actually scale up. But let's see what we're getting. In the no Urga 2 is also such a big miss, but because like that additional survivability from the Urga being able to dive into the back lines and be a massive threat, it's just completely lost in a one star, right? Because it just gets absolutely annihilated by most of these carries here. You put him into a comma too, like he gets two or three shot very easily from like a full rotation. So just having to kind of take five, you can kind of see how these two boards kind of match up. Like, look at the Urga on the right side of your screen right now, the two star one with the long distance palace as well. Just how much more powerful it is. Yeah, and I think that is going to spell disaster for Tebby getting knocked out in fifth. Was hoping to maybe claw into the top four here, but Memo with 83 HP, 85 Tiny Titans coming in clutch, is going to say, nuh uh, the rest of you, you can fight among yourselves. I'm just chilling up here, finding Aatrox too. I do want to shout out Super Eagle. I was a little bit worried about him earlier on. On the back of that Living Forge, he found a lot of upgrades, the most recent one being that Anima Visage. So even getting stronger with every couple of rounds is going to do him really well. But we'll see whether or not these players can make it into the top two. I think the top one is going to be very hard to get. Candice going up against Wet Jungler here. We have the challengers trying to make way through the legendary soup. The Ari in the background is the one that's dealing all of the damage. And look at that wave come through. Wet Jungler taking a massive hit. Dies of Panda once more from Candice here, eliminating a player after another. And this fight also just exemplifies why some rises are just simply superior to other rises, right? Because you kind of just see like the grenade just locking down the guys and trying to like get away, just like getting like rubber banded back into the <laughs> into, into that pillar of a prison, right? That's just kind of kind of interesting one to, to look out for. But that's just the power level of this, right? Like the team wide damage, the the, the the massive lockdown of a massive part of, this, of, this, of the board as well is just so powerful. But now Memo has kind of started to make his transition into a board that can kind of battle against canvases and that you're talking about make sure that, that tiniest titan so much value here as well on top of that yeah but canvas might do it again going up against super eagle here the shroud of stillness hits on both sides of the board rise being taken down and senna being taken down ari a little bit delayed here all on the back of that but the damage is going to come eventually there is no avoiding it this ari is doing so much for this board and was the most important hit for canvas to find you can see him take out one after another this feels like a rerun of the emea rising legend final last set where this panda annie was taken lives upon lives and it, it almost feels like he's just taken out every single player that has died this game right i know that's not quite the case but he's definitely up there with like three or four eliminations at the point right it's just ridiculous and as we were talking about now two boards that are going to be very similar going head to head memo kind of started rolling a bit for the for the composition in advance, but you look at these sports, they are very similar in terms of power level. Obviously, Memo on an AD line, and generally speaking, AD lines cap out a little bit lower than AP lines does. And you think about the fact, though, that Memo has Gifts of the Fallen, he has Long Distance Pals, he has Double Combat Augments, and we haven't seen this battle for a while. I'm excited to see where this ends up. We did see Memo lose in between, and I am rather confident it was probably canvas's boards but i am willing to be wrong and we're going to take a look on how this plays out canvas is still on five hp it could be his very last round but on the back of eight wins it's probably not going to happen in comes the scion massive charge into the enemy backline Cassante close to that Ari gets taken out right before and look at the sheer damage she is doing she is saying not today and Memo doesn't have any gold to work with here. He's just going to be taking these hits one after another, trying to find upgrades wherever possible. 
Yeah, and with the fact he has that tinier sights and he can actually just sit and build up an economy over these next few stages, start a 7-2 roll down even. He's going to have so much HP that even when we when we hit 7-1 and he loses, he will still very much be in the game. Remember, all Memo needs is one fight when Campus needs to string together multiple fight wins, which right now is very easy for Campus to do, but there are a few optimizations that can come through from Memo that could change the picture. Yeah, we'll see on whether or not they come into play. For now, it is going to be Canvas going up again and again and again. And thus far, nothing has changed on the side of Memo. So I'm not expecting a different outcome, but we'll see whether or not it is possible for Canvas to actually take down this behemoth of an HP bar that Memo has built upon. Looks like, yeah, he can quite easily. Yeah, and I think that as much as we try to hype this up here right now, it's very obvious what's happening, right? The first... You gotta have to kill the entire ball from Canvas before the third cast of Ari comes for that, because when you have that much damage combined with a Hexite Gunblade, nothing is gonna die on the board here. And that's gonna be a massive issue, potentially, for Memo as well to look into. So, I mean, I think that you are just kind of accepting your fate and you're not probably gonna go into a, a, a second place here. It's not horrible, right? But when you've been playing from ahead so far throughout this entire game, when you look at and you think about how Canvas ended up in this position with just 5 HP remaining. It's gonna be a frustrating loss to take. We'll see, we'll see. There's a dragon, you know, I am I am down to try and get some copium going for the side of Memo here with something he would need to actually maybe have a chance. What do you think? But needs to start his entire file right now, right? Because a one-star Setsuani, even with the redemption here, will just fall apart without anything else really to be added to the system. So that's an important one as well. He does kind of have maybe a rise too for the extra damage coming through here. Those are a couple of good upgrades here. A good high or two could, absolute, could absolutely be a massive one as well to, to look into. So options are here. Are, they are there for now. No real utility items coming through either here. So no Sephir, for example, to lock out the Ari. Yeah, the only thing that's going out is actually a Shroud of Stillness on the opposite side for Canvas, making even more way in his way to the win. In comes the cast, and you can just see how much damage this Ari is producing. It's ridiculous how strong this board is in Canvas. Now hitting level 10 with one level above Memo. Of course, I don't think there's any coming back from this. It already looked dire. I was willing to give him a little bit of a break here and say, okay, you know, maybe, maybe on the back of that Heimer too, we could do something. Mm -mm. I don't think it's going to happen. It's just, even if his board was fully upgraded, I don't think it would be possible to, to kind of lean out the window here a little bit, but we'll see if Candace finally takes down Memo or if it is going to be the other way around. Memo finally in executing range here with his 15 HP. And one more time, we get to see the Ari absolutely blast off. Has been moved to the bottom left corner, just turned around, in comes to cast wave, and she is doing ridiculous amounts of damage. Canvas, one more time, back to back to back with the dies of Panda, takes the lobby here and eliminates Memo in second place, getting a win in that very important lobby. Yeah, you just see what is needed here for campus as well, right? Like, you know, like when, when we're going to the university, we knew he was probably by far going to be the, the player that benefits the most from that, right? There's just no question about it. The addition of that level up into the pool guaranteed of your Arkham just me you're going to save so much gold. When you have a player like Cambridge, right, him and his cousin Double, they're so known for this place that they were some of the people that pioneered the place out back in set free, going for these massively high cap bots was how they broke onto the scene. And seeing that done just to perfection is just beautiful. I, I really love that as well. I think the rest of the lobby had a little bit of trouble with getting the Son contest out. There was probably some other lines available that weren't picked up here. We're going to hear from our analyst desk how they break it down, what they thought about this game. But first, we have an interview with another French player, Experian. Then we're going to hear from our analyst desk after that. Hello, I'm uh, Alexi, you know probably me as Xperion. I'm from Toulouse in France. I'll play TFT since set one and I play for Solabri right now. I really like uh, Runeterra Reforge, it's a very good set. Uh, we have a lot of competitive things uh, we don't have in the 
previous sets, it's uh, really good to play it with different meta, uh, different map, different way to play the game. Okay, for me, the best player in the ladder is probably Solo Gesang. He had a really good experience about uh, ladder and uh, all the sets he touched the wrong one a lot. So uh, I guess it's the best player of ladder in uh, UW. For a tournament, I practice uh, for sure in ladder and uh, I try to have a plan when I come in the game. Uh, like uh, with that I go here, with that I go here, with that I go here and I don't uh, improvise on the tournament. Uh, my objective is uh, for sure to go at the world, to do my best, but uh, my goal is to go to the world and uh, represent Solari. I will say thank you to all people who support me, thank you to my team Solari, and uh, thank you to my parents and my girlfriend. Uh, they are always here for me and uh, I'm very thankful. So in that last game, we were all sent to school when we got a very harsh lesson indeed about the power of prismatics from early on. Let's address, of course, the elephant in the room. We had the Sword of Damocles hanging over the entire lobby. Canvas picking up the level up from the very beginning of the game. Somebody had to stop him from hitting his final form and nobody managed to do it, Morgan. Elephant, I'm have to disagree. It, it was a panda. We've heard Mix say three times or four times the size of panda. You don't get to call him an elephant, but anyways, speaking about canvas and speaking about prismatic lobbies, in the last game, we did say that when it's three prismatics, when the university comes, it's much more stable as the entire lobby is able to keep up with the tempo because essentially everyone has a prismatic start. Oh, well, last game, it was a gray and a prismatic. That's why the lobby temple got really destroyed. In this game, it was much more close. The only one that really had such a good start, because it's a prismatic, everyone doesn't want to lose HP, was Memo. His tiniest titan allowed him to lose in the early game very safely, generating infinite amount of gold with that tiniest titan. And starting from stage three, he started racking up win streaks, making himself really able to keep up with the win streak. And of course, all that gold from tiniest titan builds up a lot of economy panda. On the flip side, I think it was Volta. Volta, very comfortable on Earth, very comfortable on Ancient Archives, knows all the different lines and comps in the game that are outside of the norm. Ends up on six on, had the two on emblems as well, but roll down was a disaster. Could not find a single Urga. Had a Belveth one holding two BTs at the end of the game when he was knocked out. Had a Jarvan one as well. So all in all, had a very good line that could end up even winning the game, but with three players finessing Zeri and him being, you know, 100% locked in because of the two emblems, he just could not make it work. On the opposite side, we had Wet Jungler, who played, I think, a marvelous game of challengers. He played Caretaker's Chosen, having that tempo across every single level, into LDP, into Cybernetic Bulk, so just all combat strength and tempo-heavy augments that really favor challengers' game plan of just trying to, at the very least, top four. That's exactly where Wet Jungler ended up. So I want to you know, pitch the question to you guys now. We've seen as of our previous lobby, you know, these 
as you mentioned, the zone being contested, even under the best of circumstances, does not seem to be reliable. So, I mean, you know, we have another for you on the subject, Morgan. Well, we see the parade of pandas absolutely destroying everybody. Would you like to too see some more challenges entering the mix for these final two games coming up? I would love to. I think we're kind of beyond the, the arc where every game used to have at least one Aeonia emblem, at least one Challenger emblem, and they were extremely strong. They were, you almost had, I remember in like two patches ago, in the, in the past Golden Special Cup, we used to see boards and games where you had four players contesting challengers, five games contesting challengers. And the thing about them is that you really have to keep up with the tempo. Something that Panda mentioned in the last desk is that they spike hard really on level seven. So if you're not contested, if you're able to get that early Kaisa, that early so yes, I would love to see more challengers only if they're lucky with the roll downs. All right, let's take a look at our standings. We were almost done with the final day of play. And of course our players are fighting tooth and nail for every single point they can gain. David, who's standing out to you in our bottom half of players? Well, what jungler was there at the, at the kind of top end, still two games left, he can, can still claw back into the top eight. Not sure about winning because we're seeing here the points are bubbling up when it comes to the very top end of the standings. And Double 61 and Day Sick, two names that some players would say are historically some of the best players in EMEA's history, are proving it yet again here in Day 3 of EMEA's GSC number two, first and second currently in the standings. That's absolutely astonishing stuff. And again, you know, in GSC1, we we're starting to think maybe we're seeing a bit of a change of guard. A lot of our experienced players were getting knocked out in day one. What a difference it is here in GSC number two. I mean, Morgan, you know, why do you think we're seeing such a different tournament than we've been seeing before? I mean, tempo is everything. And mental going into game three is really everything. We've seen people really perform extremely well yesterday like Coco which is a player that we've mentioned his name quite a lot so it's a deja vu when you see him oh Coco's winning Coco's winning it happened four times in a row yesterday but apparently they used all of their luck and all of their skills in order to maintain a good game in, in day two but these roll downs have been kind of harsh because Coco came up seventh in that last game so we see people shifting really up and down today Yes, it's only about whether where you finish on day three that counts for everything. We will have a short break and interview with you, so maybe we return. We'll be moving into our final two games of the competition to see if we can crown ourselves a champion of the Golden Spatula Cup number two. Stay tuned. My name is Jesus, I'm 20 years old, I'm from Valencia, Spain. I'm currently uh, qualified for the GSC. I think the tier C system changes are quite good because you uh, you are more likely to try hard the, all the tournaments that are related uh, to, to qualify for the GSCs or just any EMEA related tourney. And yeah, it, it makes sense to play uh, national TRC at the moment, at least for me. And that's the way I qualified for this GSC. The Malaga event was great. I mean, it was fantastic. I got to meet a lot of uh, players that I knew from TFT games, I guess. I think these events are a big part of what the community of TFT could be growing. Like these events, it's a meeting point for uh, every player from EMEA that wants to play this game not only for fun but in a competitive way so we get to meet each other and then in uh, hopefully future events you know more people you want to go there because you have some friends there i would like to give a shout out to all my friends that uh, support me on a daily basis they uh, they give me support they uh, encourage me they uh, congratulate me when i win anything or when i get a bad result they always like try to to cheer me so yeah i uh, shout out to them and also to my family that also supports me a lot uh, with this and yeah i love them
You know, every single time I hear this, dun, 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 I just get so excited. I just cannot help it. It's something with this sound that gets me giddy. I am so pleased to be taking you guys through gains number five and six. And of course, I'm not alone here because why would I? On my side are going to be Morgan and Impetuous Panda. And Panda, you were just, well, actually both of you were just coming back from the analyst desk, but we're going to be looking at this lobby here how are we feeling about our top eight? Very excited. A lot of big names, but also a mix of, of kind of newer players that are popping up and showing up, uh, you know, in a big way, like the God, for example. I think all of last set was his kind of entry into kind of TFT at a high level. But in this set, I think he's really performing at the highest level. I casted the rest of UMA qualifiers. He popped off there and he's an absolute personality. I'll put it that way. So I'm happy to see him finding success. Yeah, I'm also feeling very excited coming from the desk because watching as an analyst, yeah, sometimes can be fun. You get to put your eyes on a few things, but hey, that last game had so many moments where I wanted to, to voice it out. There were so many crazy things. So I love being on the mic and this is where I feel most comfortable, specifically when it's a good portal like the Battle Cafeteria. Everyone is going to be putting emblems now, so all of players are going to be so happy, Makes. Are they? They are going to get a little bit of extra value here, but of course, you're not going to be the only ones that have access to comps that normally aren't as available to them. Basic here on the Earth angle It's definitely going to show us how he will pilot this one. In case you're not familiar, we are portraying the region portal in the top right hand corner. So because it's Bandle Cafeteria, you're seeing that little blurb there that explains what it does. And we're going to be rotating the name exactly like that in our upper graphic. Now, Daisic here already finding a Jace. Now, if there's an Ariana and a Vi in the next shop, that is going to be good news. Might also be open to this scale reroll. I saw him play it earlier on stream today as well. And it is going to be a uh, Bandit Cafeteria, so you have a chance to make a Slayer Emblem if you wish to with that glove. But looks like he's not going to opt for it. And what a mistake. Three more kills in this next shop. Could have had five kills already. <laughs> yeah, it is quite unlucky and such a very strange of events when you see someone skip two kills and the game says whoop you should have gone for that because you get three more in a single shop wait if technically technically if he bought these past two his chances of getting kills would have been lower so maybe he would have not had three in that shop right surely surely that's the reasoning that we'll have to follow here you can see basic face is saying oh god oh god that's so <laughs> many kills Probably should have gone KL, but that is not going to be what we're looking after here. And he has the option of a Dead Eye Crest right out of the get-go. And of course, the Ancient Archives coming in from Earth. And we are going to be re-rolling both of the other options just to see if there's anything that's really intriguing. But it will be the Ancient Archives. Oh. And we have a Freljard Emblem and a Strategist Emblem. Uh-oh. And for the likes of Weed, I think they might be happy to see this might be a Rek'Sai game. Freljord would be the safest default option strategy. I think not really ideal. Likewise for Bastion. Had the chance to get Piltover. Had it earlier on coming into this 2-1 round uh, with the chance to pop, top pop a Tome. But won't be the case. It will be the safer Freljord emblem instead. And we are seeing something else that I'm getting really excited about here. Canvas picking up the loving invocation. And that is a strong statement, Augment. You are signaling to the rest of the lobby, hey, if you contest me on this, we're both going to go down, so don't you dare. <laughs> it is one of these games where you see people just picking an augment and going slash deafen and them declaring that they're going to be playing that comp. Now, for Daisy, I wanted to add something. He has, again, this is a battle cafeteria, so everyone had a spat. Option to maybe go for a Sork and a Strategist here and try to play the uh, Lux Azir board, which is probably going to be quite uncontested since we always see people playing. Uh, we've, we've been seeing people dodge it because it doesn't perform that well. I might be wrong because this is a bandle cafeteria and we already see a Shurima spat slammed. So <laughs> again, going for the fairly odd, I have to agree with David here. It was the safest option. All right, let's see what other players are going with. Of course, foreign players bringing through the forges here. We do have the sniper's focus coming out out of uh, whoops, change around. I believe that was double 61's board and we're hopping over to canvas now. Loving invocation is going to stack up your invokers. Ideally, you start this with a Karma on board. She is going to gain infinite stacks, but it is not going to be the case for Canvas right now. Does have the Soraka and, of course, the Cassio, though. 
It'd be a great start with a spark, though. Very important item. I think underrated item for many newer players when it comes to just the sheer damage you get and how much it adds to your comp throughout every single stage. All starting in stage two, so it does add some extra damage like Sunfire does when there isn't much DPS already from your units. But overall, very good start. As long as no one contests him, we've seen it before. Two players into invokers. Oh. Karma in the shop for Canvas. <laughs> he has to be careful that no one contests him or else they might both be in trouble. I have to admit that he has one of the godliest stars we might have ever seen so far. He even has a Nikos right there. So, but now, will he be going for maybe, maybe a reroll on level 7? Just as you said, Panda, he has to be uncontested. What makes your in canvas position? Yeah. What do you do? I play a lot of Karma, so I'm very familiar with this spot here. However, I'm Light not as skilled as, as these players, so. Uh... I'm not sure they should be listening to me through for any tips and tricks. However, it is going to be really important that nobody competes him here. And picking that karma up so early, I said it before, but the loving invocation is going to be massive for Canvas. Hopping over to double 61 though, who's Ooh. on a little bit of a Sork moment right now. Ooh, that Malzahar is such a beast with these crits. Shooting people with 530 crits randomly. Doesn't generate that much gold, but wow, these crits kind of hurt. <laughs> <laughs> and double min maxing here, holding these kills just in case there is someone trying to play a kill. Reroll, trying to make sure that these stage two shops are not going to be as worthwhile for that player. I think a good habit to have generally if you have the gold left over. But looking at the key units here on the carousel, we have a Callista as a belt. Could be a guard breaker if there are any challenger players looking to find that four challenger spike early. And you can see on the right hand side, there's a lot of specialists to go around, of course, because of the Bandle Cafeteria that gave everybody one. So we'll see how players are deciding now that the items are here. Jim Ray beelining for that tier could be going into Sork Spat. So far, I'm going to be a little bit worried about Dasik because you being 78 HP at the first carousel is kind of losing a lot of his battles. He's not able at all to get any units killed so that means if he keeps up the five loss streak he could be going into grogs with something maybe as as short as 66 67 hp question mark so i think daisic be having such a rough early game and again if he goes the rex i reroll that you guys suggested specifically panda since it's like again the safest option I think with this Freljord spot, you can still go for the classic Zon Freljord mix with Urgot, blah, 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 Lissandra, Ash, and this could be very reasonable, but Panda, in his situation, what would be the safest play? Um, I'm curious more about this Swain, because with Hole Crusher as a solo frontline and after the buffs as well with Sharima spat on him, I think Swain can be an absolute Giga Chad throughout this stage too. Here's to see how many players try and go for the Sharima angle. I think 7 Sharima is a very stable comp if you have enough gold and econ uh, to hit the level 7 board with 7 Sharima online. And you can kind of dual carry Azir and the Akshan if you have both AP and AD items. And it differs a little bit from that more usual Azir Lux comp where you have just full on AP. Two Darius just naturally in the shop here for Philalix is going to be interesting. Is already on that Noxus line with two emblems back of the portal and of course the ancient archives so that is going to be a nice little upgrade here for him i am very curious i think basic just coming back to you guys's conversation i would also go rather for the zeri with like a little bit more of a freljord angle and then try to just get four freljord in but we'll see what he decides to do our players are going kind of crazy here. Two Noxus emblems, two Challenger emblems already slammed in here by Flalix and the God. So the way you look at it, you can see people already committing way too early. So I kind of love the fact that in this lobby, everyone is so stable. Loving Invocation again, also just as you mentioned, makes did make people know that, okay, I'm going for Invokers. Don't contest with me. So I think in this lobby, what I love about it is that everyone has a very straight direction with what they're going for. One of the keys of Ancient Archive is the fact that some players like to have immediate direction from stage 2-1. They know exactly what units to hold, how to execute their game plan without having to get dizzy or lose econ in the process because they're thinking about several different paths. In the case of Noxus Emblems, they're going to be so strong to hit the six Noxus so early without having to overroll for all six of the actual Noxus units. And also fitting in units like uh, the Echo later on and making Katarina and Echo both uh, viable carries and viable threats in the late game boards. We have to think about positioning for Darius, but also for the rogues jumping into your backline. Yeah, I absolutely agree, though, with two Noxus emblems, I can't help but wonder, are we going to see nine Noxus eventually out of this board for Lalex, thus far having grandiose shops, right? Two Darius, Katarina coming through, this just 
that's specifically delivered to him through comes a clet. You know, all of these Noxus units, they're just stopping by saying like, hey, you want me? I'm here if you do. I love that he kind of slammed the Giant Slayer already way too early, trying to look in for any early wins. Pushing the six now could be an option if he wants to keep up racking these Noxus wins with the stats and maybe try to look for an early uh, win con. But I think something else could he could be going for, but he does go for it here, Panda. And gets the six Noxus online, trying to defend this win streak. And this is a shame he slammed the Giant Slayer early because both of those components would have been perfect for IE and Titans on the Darius considering yes, the components yeah. he got after Wolves. I do like the Ionic Spark Slam. It's not very traditional in Noctis, but you do have to find a way to kill Cloak in the early game with BT not really being uh, the best item until much later into the game where you have the extra AD to benefit from and just the extra damage to make the healing actually come through. So overall, I really like the game plan. I like how he's able to take down a streak there for Yoroi and despite not being only in a one streak, I think it's very important with Noxus to get these stacks in early. And it's not only Yoroi's streak that's ending here. Jimray has also been pushed off the throne and the streak, and we are going to get the next set of augments come through. Something I can see that you're smiling about, Panda. It's just going to be low impact, silver augments. We're swimming, we're chilling. And Daystick is also chilling. Transfusion, uh, working perfectly with his 55 HP. He was low HP at all. I'm going to get a lot of value from this. And I'm imagining he's going to start pivoting into some kind of Azari or, or an Akshan board later on. But as I said, you know, to no one's surprise, two Samiras on the board, 100% uh, correct in most boards on stage three. Not, not a huge fan of Transfusion 1, Th since Daisic really has lost a lot of HP, I think it's, it could be a very great option here. It kind of makes his units a little bit more tanky. Uh, the way that it actually stacks and works with Bruisers as well, since he's going to be having it, will be really such a good addition to his board. And Makes, I think, is actually going to the board that you suggested. He's already gathering these Jinx, Akshan. He sold it, but yeah. I think he is, he's not, that, that is not a Rek'Sai reroll game. I, I, I don't think it's a Rek'Sai reroll. I think you're definitely going into Freljord and you'll try to make that work. You could be going into Deadeye Freljord. We saw a couple of Ophelio sports actually do quite well. And on the back of that extra emblem, I could see that happen, but we are going to see what Daisic does right now. Hoping uh, to have a lot of options later down the line. You can see he's building up Econ. He's just holding back. He's fine with loose streaking. He wants to loose streak. He wants to build up as much economy as possible to then later actually have a good angle into finding good four cost units to actually make this happen. I mean, on Sinar's board, picking up social distancing, I think it's going to work great if he's trying to play for seven Surima. Uh, similar to Challengers, same concept I explained earlier in a, in a previous cast. Uh, you don't really get flat stats from Shurima, it is just the, the health and the attack speed. Uh, so it's really going to be great to complement the trait if he's trying to go for that angle. Looks like he is, with the units he's holding on his bench, it looks like it will be uh, a tempo-heavy 7 Shurima angle, similar what? to Challengers, really. This is such a double uh Oh, <laughs> Is this the first time I ever get to see a Malzahar 3? Did anyone ever see that before? A Malzahar 3. I've seen him as a... You get it, why not? He's usually an accompanying piece to the, the Cho Bitem comp with Cho'Gath as a main carry and Malzahar as a secondary. Don't ask me why this comp exists, it is very cursed <laughs> indeed. But Malzahar is the main carry, I think he's had a lot of weight to pull considering his ult AI is sometimes a little bit Ooh. iffy, a little bit on the bronze, bronze iron oh. side of things, not so much challenger. Yeah, and I do agree. If you're looking at this board, right, 10 gold, you have a Malzahar 3, you're losing, but you also have six Sorg, you have a lot of upgrades options, and you are looking at double 61, somebody that I never need to worry about until he's actually on single digits, I feel like. Just having cast him for quite a couple of years now, it's, uh, I always get scared, he always turns it around, I'm going to wait it out and see as players are picking up some more options here. Sonar this time around, getting the tier. Looks like three spats are open for now. Three players that hit have still not found a way to utilize a spat to find direction aside from just the extra HP the Bandit Cafeteria wow. gives. But Daisy looks like he's also be going Azir. into Shirima, the early Azir. Might just be a more traditional oh. Shirima comp, it looks like. So many huh? options, though. Zeri, so many yeah. options. Zeris and Lissandra. He's going to be able to get in maybe the uh, Earth Freljord in right now. He also has the Vi for the option if he wants to go for... Um, a, a bruiser, but he sticks with the Renekton because that, that would have been able to keep him maintained the Shurima, but at this point, it doesn't really matter. Maybe if I go in, it would have been strong, stronger a little bit, tankiness-wise. So indicator, 
if you're trying to play Shurima, I think it's a Shoujin because you can't really make good use of this in any AD comps, in, in Zeri, uh, yeah. in Aphelios, etc. So um, it's really about reading the items and seeing where you're trying to go. That being said, Sinar, we said, was on the same direction, so they could possibly collide. The early Zeri is going to be great for, for Dasic, though. That is kind of what we were talking about, right? Him actually spending a lot of gold or saving a lot of gold, then rolling it down as soon as he hits level seven to find a lot of options. You can see he's still holding on. Like he has two Zeris, he has an Urgot. I'm sure even if he like finds a Zeri to Urgot, he probably is going to run it and then make that happen with the Shojin somehow. I'm not uh, convinced that he's fully decided on the Azir just yet, but we'll see how it goes. Belveth coming through on 3-6 here for him. Basic and level 7 Belveth. I think I've seen this movie before. Uh, I won't spoil how it ends, so <laughs> uh, hopefully there's a different ending in this game for the rest of the players in the lobby. Yeah, the last time I have it, okay, you didn't want to spoil it. I'm going to be the one who spoils it. He had it very early. He was already when streaking. It was also a challenger Belveth, and it was on stage 3-2. This time, however, Panda, it is very different. He has it when he's on 33 HP. He finally stems that Shurima emblem, and he does make use of it on the Belveth. So that is a very late application of the Spadalet that we all got from the Battle Cafeteria. However, it will be able to win him quite a few rounds, saving him again the hassle of sacrificing more rounds for the transmission and I think that this Belvet is doing God's work despite the fact that he had pivoted I don't think that this round would have been won if he didn't high roll that Belvet she is the empress after all coral reset after coral reset she is going to get now we're feeding some extra health into that Situani trying to keep that in the front line because of course he does have that Freljord emblem so it does make sense to keep her as a bruiser just shifting things around Azir now also coming into play and I now agree I think he's fully committed to going for the Shurimas I think he was still thinking about it a little bit but that was probably his game plan all along and Canvas here with the Pandora bench trying to get some reforges out trying to get some upgrades possibly for the Shin. I think Shen's the big one. The real stability point of this comp is finding a Shen 2 on level 7. Uh, not the easiest thing to ask for, of course. Sometimes you find no Shens at all, and then your spot is just entirely doomed. I think some players uh, misunderstand that Karma 3 is, is the big spike for this comp. It is, of course, much later, but the biggest stability point is that Shen 2 star. Uh, you called it, Mix. You said that with Loving Invocation, he would have actually gladly admitted and was very vocal about playing Karma, but... I don't think that this is the case in this lobby about what you mentioned. He has to be uncontested, because guess what? He is. This is not the current only come aboard. And so far, he has went down to zero, fully sent it. He only has four pairs. He has two Nikos. But essentially, he just needs three more Karmas. But still, dropping down to zero gold and not finding any more is quite unlucky. Yeah, it's not the best spot to be in, but like we were saying, look at the Shen 1, fully itemized, doing so much work here. It is going to be enough to actually take a win against the god, and even though the Econ might be looking terrible, I'm not too worried in the long run. A lot of it is sitting on the back there in that bench. We saw three four costs being hold. That's already quite a bunch of money, and we are going to get our last augments come in. And some key choices here for the god. He is playing a challenger comp, needs to find that combat strength, has the harm assist, has a ton of stats now as well. Is missing the Kaisa though for the eight challenger spikes. This is a big problem here. You need to find the chance to get this Kaisa online. You do oh. finally find it, but you have two emblems. There isn't a challenger heart here, so it's gonna be awkward to get a challenger in anyway until you're level eight. Yeah, that is the issue. I was just going to mention, but I'm a very, very good catch Panda again. Him having the double challenger emblem is not going to get into action at all until he can survive. Go to level 8. In a stage now, where he has so many pairs. There's one for the Yasuo. He has one for the uh, Warwick. Setting only on one Kai'Sa so far. Could be a little bit challenging to win his way through makes. Uh, what's the next choice for the god? We will see how it goes and whether or not we can actually reach the 8 challenger right now. It's looking a little bit depleted in terms of economy to level 8 quite far away. See how he does against the sword clump of double 61, still holding on to that Meltzahar 3, doing much of the heavy lifting there in that background. But the Yasu is on to him, causing a little bit of havoc uh. there, will be taken down eventually. Look at the sheer power of this 3 star, 1 cost, and the Lux is going to be enough for Double to actually take a win here. And if I'm looking on the right hand side, I'm starting to get worried about Dasik. He's been losing and losing and it's on 15 HP now. You can see that he's not really able to run the Azir as main carry. And that is not good news. Overlining for the God, going down to 
that first pick for the next carousel is the fact that he has a chance to find something like a Belveth, something like an, a Heimerdinger, for example, go down to six challenger potentially and, and get in these legendaries online and take this Gwen one out of the way and get Heimerdinger online, who's so, so massive. As is Yasuo two star with RFC Edge of Night, two of his best in slot items, and the chance to really outposition and outplay all of his opponents in this stage, surely or surely off of that Yasuo with RFC sniping targets. Yeah, we did speak about how important it was for him to get to level A, but sending it in with a Yasuo, he knows that after he lost that last combat, it might be a little bit harsh, so he had to stabilize a little bit, rolling down for the Yasuo. That I might be a little bit worried about. You know why? Because that unit. It's so stupid. The moment it goes into the back line and it just gets the right target, it's like, ah, no, I'm just gonna go away from that. Thank you. And it has happened once, it has happened again. And despite rolling down for the Yasuo, getting Yasuo 2, still not finding another single Kaisa. And he still loses the battle. All and right, is... we do have two legendaries here available the Zena, of course, a very good pickup for the Zeri comms. But with two players on Shirima, that Cassante probably looking pretty tasty as well. We can tell that Canvas and Yaroi both still have spatulas to slam that they could be using to upgrade their comps even further. I think uh, the god carefully and, and correctly chose to take the Titans here just to have a third item on the Yasuo over a Senna, which would be an argument to his board uh, with Senna with a Challenger Emblem instead of the Gwen. But I think in this case, just knows that most of his board power and most of his chances to survive his stage four is on this Yasuo and needs to put all his power into that one unit. Some of the players just... hitting level eight here. Daysick able to find a Zier two. Candace finally stabilizing on the back of Shen two. Sonar also finding a Zier two. And Casey double with the Lux two. The upgrades come rolling around for all of the boards. And if you're one of the players that hasn't hit anything yet, you're starting to look at this and go, uh-uh. That's not great news for me. So we'll see how players like Philalix will do here. Darius 2 is great, but is it good enough to actually hold him over here? Yeah, finding that Azir with the Noxus Emblem has been one of the most late comms back then in one of the specific matches, but I'm not really sure if it's going to be good in this meta or if it's going to be available again to use in such a situation or not. He does have the least that you just, he does have the Joel Lotus, so he's putting up a lot of damage because essentially all of his units can crit. But the only issue is that we've seen um, the God and I think, no, I think Dasik was contesting with that Shurima Emblem that he slammed the alien on the Belvet, so that's why he's not able to get his Shurima units to two star. Now, Dasik loses another combat, and if we can keep an eye out on him, he's only li living with 7 HP, thanks to spectators being absolutely fast. And Panda, you also have to be fast with how does Dasik get himself out of this sticky situation? It's tough, and it's one of the worst feelings in TFT when you go into a line that you feel is going to be uncontested, because it's not necessarily one of the strongest or most obvious lines to play, like Xerius, for example. And suddenly, you start scouting, and three players are playing Sharima units on their board. You have a much harder time hitting all of your units. They basically have to sacrifice all of his HP, or gold rather, to do so. Well, HP as well, it looks like. And he's down now to, again, 7 HP facing off against essentially a mirror match with another Sharima player who is, in theory, much healthier. If this Cassante can live, it can't. It cannot knock out the, the Swain in time. Does displace the main tank, though, which could be pretty big in terms of this fight being won for Daysick. Maybe a close battle in the end, but it looks like I think this Shirwani just a little bit too tanky for Sinar to handle. Yeah, we'll see how this fight plays out, but I'm not too curious on it. Battle by battle, these Sharimas are getting through each other. One more time, action. Ults it out. It's the Swain that's standing. Eventually will take him down, and Dasik down to one HP. Ooh. The hidden last stand. The hidden last stand augment on Dasik now. Keeps him alive for one more shot. But again, it's in a very, very sticky situation with not being able to find any of his units for free. He did manage to get the Zwani too. He did manage to get the Renekton and the Azir. But something was mentioning again that our, our observers just gave us. Headlines, top of the news, Canvas has so far been the only one not committing his spats. Yeah, that's a very interesting tidbit of information, but maybe, just maybe, on the back of these raptors here, he is going to find something that he will be able to use it on. We're looking on the right-hand side and seeing that many of the players are currently committing some rolls. Sinar, notably quite low in Econ, double quite low in Econ, and Dasik, of course, the person that we've been following with 1 HP, still very, very low. 
is it would love to go eight and maybe find a way to fit in seven Shurima to really find a way. Because five Shurima is, is kind of fake. I think it's a trait that uh, from three to seven is the only <laughs> jump you want to make. Five Shurima is in the middle spot where it doesn't give enough power uh, to your carries, to the Azir and to this Akshan. And this might be it. Dasik still up on the chopping block here. On the other side is Yaroi, currently leading the lobby on the win streak, looking extremely healthy, extremely strong. But can he do enough here? The Callist of Two getting stuck on the Sechuani, a massive tank being taken out here by that Akshan in the background. And the Azir will do the rest of it. Now, Dasik looking to have stabilized a little bit. I'm going to have to second what Panda said. Going in for 7 Shurima might be the only way that Dasik finds his retaliation here. Again, 4 Fairly Order is nice. All that shredding is amazing. And all of his units being able to deal more damage is really good. But the thing is, his items on the back line are not really that ideal. He does have a Hodge and a Rapid Fire on Azir, which is kind oh, of... Oh, I love Double 61. I'm sorry. This is my favorite player of all time. The only <laughs> player that could assemble a board like this. Six Sorcerers casted in three stars. A main tank with a Sorcerer emblem. Three star Malzahar with a gold collector on him still. Healing orbs is so good for sorcerers, though. It's the, maybe the one saving grace for double. Yeah, Glad somebody's enough. excited about it. I will see how it does. Dasik still up on the chopping block, trying to get through here. Morgan, can he do it? It might be a little bit hard because that Kassadin is essentially, with, essentially without the Riftwalker emblem. Riftwalker Augment is not going to be dealing enough damage. Going for the Kassadin here is really such a crazy move. And again, he's not finding any damage. I know that Panda is a little bit excited about it, but Double is definitely not going to be excited for long about the results that this board has been able to achieve. Okay, Panda, talk me through what can we do here to actually save this board for Double. Jumerate, Dasik, and Double all up for elimination with single digits. Oh, I don't think there's much you can do. I think uh, deciding to go down this line is a risky move. I would never do it myself. I don't like uh, playing in the unknown. Double 61 is where he feels most comfortable. Some things, things don't work out as you expect, though. And in this case, I think Malzahar is not doing enough with these items. I think Malzahar 3, uh, just his ult AI is too iffy, too inconsistent to actually produce results. We are getting word that there is a... a scary upgrade coming through and one of the players here canvas has found an re2 from the shop had two nakos he was sitting on them holding back and he is on that invoker line so that is going to be a scary unit to be looking out for in the meantime we're looking at jimry and double 61 both of them able to continue winning here so we're not going to be saying goodbye to any of our players except daisy which of course panda i mean uh, makes you get to say your yeah. favorite line Dice of Panda! It, it's so funny, right? Because for anybody that's maybe not familiar with the EMEA competition, Canvas has been running this little legendary so much that it has been the personification of him for all of last set. And in the World Championship, one of his fellow countrymen, Enzo, actually ran the chibi Annie in one of the games to, to shout him out after he got eliminated. So it was a very wholesome moment. and. Whenever I see this chibi panda, I'm like, oh, that's canvas. <laughs> and Team 61 picks up the Gunblade, has now a third item for Lux, considering he is not running the usual Sorcerer Demacia board. On the flip side, his cousin also playing AP, but so much stronger. Lumming Invocations at the start of the game has an RE2 star, who will be getting items as we move through the next few carousels as well. And so strange this game, seeing so many players on Sorcerers, on Sharima, on these Comps are considered maybe A minus tier, all AP comps and all contesting each other. We're going to be seeing KC Double possibly going up against Jim Ray. Those are the two low HP players. We'll see whether or not that's the case. It's going to be Cousin against Cousin, Cub Double 61 going up against Candice here. Called it a little bit earlier, Mix. He was able to find that innocent Ari 2. And guess what? She's fully itemized with the Rabadons, Jewel Gunblade, and Gunblade. We're waiting for the third cast. That huge one that flips the entire board, able to delete his backline immediately and send double 61 with a double, no a triple, maybe a quadruple kill. And it's going to be another. To say it. Dies of, dies of Panda. Panda. Yes. It has to. <laughs> so I'm not sure I like uh, being here. turned to the villain here, you know? Every, every single cutscene. Our poor players. Name. Stop killing people, David! <laughs> oh, oh my! God. It was my name before any existed. Uh, mm -hmm. Make so surely, I'm gonna surely. I'm gonna claim I'm gonna sue Riot clearly for copyright <laughs> infringement. I'm also running to be Annie. 
Something cool that we just saw out of Double, as soon as he knew he was beat, he actually hopped over to Jim Ray to see whether or not Jim Ray was also going to be eliminated or if this was actually a seventh place for him. So little by little, we are seeing these players trying to claw it, even if it's just one place. Keep in mind, this is the top lobby and the god is up against Sinar here. Both of these players rather low, but it's the god that's fighting for survival. Can he do it? The Kaisa in the background stacking up that Archangels, but on the right hand side, we have so many Sharimas trying to make it through here. Kaisa, one more cast, taking out a bunch of units there, but Azir is on to her. She cannot dash away, and the god will probably lose this one on the back of this Azir. Jimre and him both taken out here. The minus HP coming into play. We have our top four. So unfortunate for the god. Had 23 HP two rounds ago. Uh, lost these last two, ends up fifth in the end. When you start facing off these exotic boards like Hamas is, where he suddenly gets an RE2 out of nowhere, it becomes so difficult if you're already at low HP as the god was after that big roll down in stage four. A lot of damage being done here, not being able to make him celebrate his eight challenges board, which has been long, long, long anticipated. Sadly, a little bit demotivating results here. The god doesn't even make it to top four. But again, we call that this lobby has been very close. You know that because even Canvas, the one who's been win streaking, killing people of Panda makes, has been able to make it to eight win streak here. Now, the fact that I highlight. And it is the, the little legend, not David, after every sentence. It's getting kind of repetitive here, but forgive me, we have too many pandas, too many pandas in this broadcast. <laughs> the fun part is that there's even yet another panda behind the scenes that <laughs> has quite an important role, but we'll see about how this game turns out. Philalix found the Noxus emblem so early here. Can he keep on surviving, Morgan, or is Yara going to put an end towards him? That's going to be the question that this fight is going to be answering for us again. Six Noxus, one dock, and he does have the Empress fully equipped. However, not been able to make her reach her strongest power, which is the two-star. She gets... Uh, actually, I mean, he has been able to make her get a two-star. QSS makes her alive for quite a long time. The Noxus emblem making her still alive. The Darius is the only one getting to be able to do some damage. But the Kaisa is doing way too much. The Aatrox comes back, but not on time. And Felix is going to be losing enough HP to kick him out of this game. Negative two HP. Barely could have made it. But we're down to our top three players. And Philalix just barely got a third item on the Darius. Uh, didn't decide to reroll Noxus instead. Just got a few legendaries early on. Decided to play around them instead with the Noxus emblems. And in the end, because he could not really spike at level nine or, or get all these legendaries two starred, ends up pittering out to top four. But I think still pretty happy. I think the game plan went as planned for Philalix. We're going to be looking at Sinar, who is going up against Yaroi. We know what these boards entail, and for Sinar, the big point is going to be one. Can that Cassante actually put in a lot of effort here and knock someone out that is causing havoc? And can the Azir live long enough to take the rest of the board out? You can see he's already going in, he's charging up, but there's no Rage Blade or anything. Getting actually CC by the Yasuo. The Yasuo taken out the Azir right from the start. That's a massive kill on the side of Yaroi. And I'm not sure if Sonar has anything to turn around here. You can see him shake his head in defeat and it's looking really, really sad for a Turkish player here. Yaroy on his end actually played against Canvas and lost. So this is the ghost copy, but it will be enough to take out Sinar and have our top two. I think Sinar also content with this finish. Seven Shrima doesn't really cap much higher than a third or a second in some cases. I think both Flalix and Sinar had very obvious game plans with the line they took. They knew where the limits of those game plans were and they executed them properly. I think similar to Sonar, Daysick was also trying to go for Seven Shrima and that was a complete opposite game plan where he just didn't make it anywhere close to that final board. So how long that frontline survived, especially, especially thanks to the own item again. But the issue here is that Yasuo, for one time, for one time, the unit caught in the back line and has been able to get a very good cast. Now, it is the battle of the legendaries. We see an Ari 2 contesting right now with a Yasuo, two-star, a challenger Gwen, a board that is able to put a lot of damage if they're able to reach out for the, for the Ari. However, it was placed perfectly from Canvas side, away from all damage, away from all harm, able to deal enough damage, healing up back to max full HP with the Gunblade Soyaroi. We'll be going out and for two games in a row, Canvas will be killing people off Panda and claiming his win, all these Golden Special Cup points, all these placements in order to maybe be our winner for the Golden Special Cup Day 3.
That was a massive cast wave from Candace is just ridiculous every time on this RAT. Too, he knows it. He's been using it to his advantage for I think all of this tournament thus far. Whenever he can get it, Panda, and it's just crazy. It was a perfect example of why you need to build Gunblade on Ari in the late game. There's so much different bits of chip damage that can kill her off entirely after a few different hits. Gunblade gives you security that you're not going to have that low roll fight RNG where she can just die middle of the fight and you have no more damage left. So really, really huge. She barely died both times in the Kai'Sa cast. In the end, survived and was able to win that fight for Canvas. Yeah, and with that, we are going to be hearing from our analyst before we go into the very final game of the day. You don't want to miss it. Don't go anywhere. We just have a short break ready with the Rondas, and after that, we'll be back. My in-game name is Darondas. I am born in Poland, but I've been living in Ireland for the last 15 years, and I am 22. Uh, so my thoughts about Rune Terror Forge, I really like it. I think it's the best set they've released so far, for sure. Um, I really enjoyed the variance between games. Every portal is different, every game is slightly different, and keeps you engaged, I suppose, for longer. And the units themselves is, are very good, and I feel like uh, the recent patches have also been pretty balanced, and you can play a lot of different comps. So yeah, overall, I'm really enjoying it. Um, so for the TRCs, I do really like the system as it gives more opportunities to qualify for the GSC through different means, because the ladder has been very competitive recent times. It's very difficult to get into the top 30. And otherwise, the regional tournaments are a bit more accessible, I feel like. It's a lot more, not easier, but more manageable to qualify through them. And I do like that there is still the open qualifier just in case it goes wrong and you can still have some backup option to still try and qualify for the GSC and also just gives more tournaments even for practice so I do really like the involvement of the TRCs in the system uh, yeah I think Lelouch and uh, Double are playing very well this set I think Solo Gesang is playing very well on ladder but we'll see if that can translate into tournaments but yeah I think Lelouch and Solo Gesang are my favorites so far the first thing that I had a mistake with was when you have a bad streak, I would say you need to stop playing, <laughs> that's the first thing. And also I think uh, watching other people is very helpful to improve your game. I think I spent about, I'd say 50-50 is playing and watching other people to improve your own game. And I would say that's a very good thing to start with. And that's probably the biggest advice I have. I'd like to shout out my family, they've always supported me in what I do. Even if they don't really understand what's going on, they still support me, they're happy for me. Apart from that, I'd like to shout out some of the Polish TFT players. They help me sometimes with a lot of the things, like even asking about the system, things like that. They always help me out if I'm asking. So yeah, that's who I'd shout out. Welcome back, one and all. We've got a final game come up for you, but before we get there, let's just quickly run through what we saw in the previous game. So coming into this, in that last game, we had kind of three big players coming in. Double 61 as our points leader, Sinar and Dasik just behind, you know, being a big three like we had in the Golden Spatch Cup number one. Unfortunately, it didn't work out very well for most of them, with Sinar the only one of the three able to get a strong finish. Yeah, and, and also we have a new player coming into the mix now with Canvas, right? Taking a second place, putting himself up to, to 29, uh, I believe, or so, something around there as well, like mm. matching doubles points now after that game. This kind of shows how much the game can change here, and that is going to be Canvas. 
you know, we've seen this now, back-to-back -back lobbies from him. Just a strong performance where he comes and showcases what it is. He's so good at these high cap boards here. But Peter, we can't really look past the point that he was very fortunate with the fact he got dropped the double Nikos. Oh, for sure. And I think you point out really well in the green room, you had an immense patience to hold onto those and say, I've got the late game here. I've got a chance to swing really big. Certainly Canvas didn't have the most points heading into that game. So I think he did need the big finish. I mean, you know, let's talk about some of the other comps in here though. You know, double 61, of course, I think turned quite a few heads with that three-star Malzahar with the gold collector. Yeah, that was kind of just like one of those like off the wall reroll comps that you see like double 61 just go for a time shot. We've seen it time and time again across different sets that he has pretty good spot recognition this time around. Not necessarily super good for him. A lot of these other compositions just used those craftable emblems a lot better. So let's let's talk a little bit about the kind of situation here. You know, being that we had emblems in from the beginning of the game, how you know? Could you explain for us who maybe haven't got as much experience about how to approach a Vandal cafeteria game? I mean, it kind of depends on like what you're going to get dropped in the early round, because we saw something like Shurima all of a sudden coming out of nowhere. It's something that, generally speaking, really pops off when you have more craftable emblems, right? We get that Shurima emblem in and it can kind of be used to to get other stuff, like other strong comes. And also something like Challenges, for example, are comes that rely on like Ionia as well. Those are a great craftable emblems that just really allows you to like, have flexible boards. So what you will see, like headlined, is you're just going to see a lot of flexible boards that really makes great use of these extra emblems. I do, you do have to address, of course, Tasic having a very awkward game trying to smash together Freljord and a Shurima uh, towards the end of the game. I mean, as you said, you know, Shurima being one of those craftable emblems, it was always a possibility that that would be coming through. But I believe that we have got our fight, well, our penultimate standings ready heading into the final lobby. We'll, of course, be sticking with table number one. We'll be looking at the final points before going into that game. Quickly, before we do, Let's take a quick look at our players who are currently towards the bottom. Of course, these will not be competing for the GSC 2 crown. No, they will not, but they will be fighting it out for those extra golden spatula points so they can guarantee themselves a berth into the Rising Legends. A player like Stakes or Right had a third place finish in GSC number one. Would love a top 16 finish. We can kind of just start focusing on that tournament instead of having to stress out about other situations coming that way. The same thing goes for someone like Skipeus or other players here that had back to back day one finishes, Peter. But at the top of the standings here, Sinar two points down to your Roy, and then you have the Cousins at 29 points, three points behind them. We can basically boil this down to the fact that Sinar just needs to keep up his form. He's been playing fifth all day. And if that happens, no one can touch him. Yeah, only one bottom four so far. What a day it would be for Sinar to come through and keep hold of this lead. You know, Zeb, with your Roy as his closest competition in the final game, you, you can only imagine what's going through Sina's head right now, knowing that all of the pieces are in place for him to take the win and take the title. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the most important things as well. And you've got to keep in mind here, there are players in here that have had strong day ones and strong day twos. And now with those tiebreakers also coming into play here, that is super important to, you know, maybe even could clinch a title right as well. So a lot of things we've got to keep in mind, Peter. All right, we're in line for our potential first ever Turkish GSC champion. Makes in Petrus, Panda, and Morgan bring us in into the last game of Golden Spatula Cup number two. Thank you so much, guys. And we couldn't be happier to be here. Of course, we do have a couple of things to kind of figure out first. First of all, where are the eggs, Panda? What's going on with the eggs? So I was very hungry. Uh, earlier today, and I made an egg salad. It was very tasty, quite nutritious, uh, keeps me in top, tip top shape, uh, but they're gone. They're all gone, makes it hard. Oh, so the eggs are gone. Second of all, Morgan, where are the scores? Why are they not on screen the entire time? Uh, now they are. Now you can see the, the points that the players have. Sinar, we are Roy Campbell's double 61, Felix, Lecoco, Aug, and the God. We have our best eight players, our top eight contenders right now. One of these people, or allow me to phrase that better. <clears throat> One of these legends is going to be claiming the throne after game six in the Golden Special Cup day three and the finals. And X, how many yeah. people is, is David going to kill today? How many times are we going to see the animation? Oh, we are going to see how it goes. You're speaking about our former EMEA champion, and he has done quite a lot of executing people with this panda, but it is going to be the unstable rift that we will travel onto with our top eight players. 
Of course, if you ever find yourself wondering, the portal is shown in the top right hand corner on a rotation. We are hopping on board with Sinar, the current point leader, 32, two more points than anyone else in this lobby. And overall, not the most exciting of portals potentially for viewers and players alike, but one of the fairly low variance portals. Nothing too crazy is happening, it's an extra item. Everyone benefits from extra items. Ideally, those playing, you know, double carry comps like Kaisa Yasuo, even more so. But you are going to be rewarded for having a very good knowledge around itemization, around what units want, what items at every single stage of the game. If I was Vida watching this right now, I'd be so happy. An early Rek'Sai. Okay, we don't see the items yet. Oh no. But... No, 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 hey. no, no. Don't make hey. his final game hey. the most important game of Rek'Sai for roll. <laughs> I beg, please. That's not what we're hey. doing. It's a void portal. It's a void portal. So it, 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 I don't know about you, but that's a sign. Oh, he sells it. Oh, no. Never mind, Max. Why did he have to Thank tell him? Thank you, Sinar, for listening to what is good. I am so excited. Looking at the legends, though, we have two players on Earth, Double 61 and Philalix. Those are the players that we are going to be needing to check in with, see what they're doing. Well, looking at his board, I think Sonara has a very good idea of what is good. Samira, Cassiopeia, <laughs> Cassiopeia, that waiting in the wings. Ideally, a Warwick to pair on level four alongside the Cassiopeia for both Challenger and Juggernaut with a future Darius, but still a very strong opener. Has to hope for a Noxus unit in. Ooh, he can make oh, 20 here if he wants start. it. But a Vi pair is so tempting in the it. end, offs not to. <laughs> no, he did. He did. He did make 20. He sold yeah. it off. Off not to keep the Viper. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's see. Gargantuan was off. Could have been interesting if you were looking to go the for boss. that. Darius finds the boss, finds a Felyard Heart, and is going to go with the Portable Forge instead. Edge. Edge. The entire lobby will breathe a sigh of relief. No Trickster's Glass, Samira for Sinar to really snowball his current standings lead into an HP lead throughout these next two stages. All right, all right. Let's see what everybody else picked up. We are seeing most of the players hitting level four here, as is the norm. And in come the Augments, Double 61 and the God, both on Shimmer items, which could be interesting. Philalix, however, picking up the Ancient Archives, and that's the biggest question. What did he pick up? Where are we going with Philalix? We'd we'll love to see his board in a quite a few seconds, but at this You're point, seeing we it. See Opposite much, uh... side. Uh, never mind, okay, we do, we do manage to see it. And that's a built over emblem waiting for him outside. So this is gonna be a lost streak gameplay for him. However, unlucky enough that he's not been able to get the built over in starting from the first round. Also ends up with a four unit loss, so that eight damage. What kind of hurt? And has a choice to maybe roll for built over, but having the Orianna and not having the Vi, the Echo, the Jade, I think that's a doomed game plan. And I have to hope to find it soon. Double stealing one of the Vi's in his own shop, but we have to talk about all that shimmers. In my opinion, and I think in many uh, top players' opinion, the strongest augment to get at 2-1. The leads you can snowball into are absolutely insane. It'll be Gambler's Blade for double 61 and Draven Axe for the God, both on Samira. Surprise, surprise. I love the God so much. Look at him. He's just vibing. He's chilling out. He is so happy with himself. If you ever find yourself wanting to see more of this guy, there's a hilarious clip of him yesterday, or I think the day before that, finding a massive upgrade to the board and just hysteriously laughing about the strongness of his board here. And he's going to be going up on the other side to Lococo, a player that we haven't mentioned as much in the previous game because he was in the lobby right below lobby one, but he found the win there and is back in that final top leader lobby with 27 points. Also, I think it's worth mentioning that he's currently playing with Poro, a legend that we've not seen for quite some time now. Mostly people rely on Owen, people rely maybe going on a lost streak with Aurelian Soul. We've also seen a few Earths here and there, but someone playing with Earth, well, that's a gay get shared legend. I have to mention we saw the Coco there with Trickster's Glass Samira. So already three players that are on some of the most high roll openers you can currently obtain in this game of TFT on this current patch. Everyone that is low rolling or is not content with where they're starting, it has to feel so, so bad. It has to find a way to probably lose streak most of this stage and come back into the game midway through stage three. Yeah, that is going to be something to keep in mind as players are moving on. But of course, that's only the first couple of augments. It's not all lost yet if they don't have a great start. We know many of these players are actually quite comfortable with playing from a losing streak angle, with playing a little bit from behind. I wouldn't count them out just yet, but of course that is going to be something to look upon if you're not in a comfortable spot to see players with 
shimmer items Ow. to see players with that trickster glass that is going to hurt. Yeah, and all thanks to the unstable ref giving Yeroi that that BT. Yeroi has been able to have the Exodia items on this Samira. Dead Dance BT, but now Panda, we get to talk about your favorite part of the game, carousels. Yes, and my favorite unit as well. What a coincidence. It is a Darius with a glove that can build into IE and, Kat and Katarina as well, also with a glove. So we're seeing a lot of Noxus already. Players giving the reason to stay in this tree, it seems like. And every board we've gone to seems to be incredibly strong. Death Defiance going to go so well with Darius later into the game. Possibly Rek'Sai, but considering the Noxus on the board already, I think we'll be sticking to this Darius angle. And Yare actually picking up that Darius that you mentioned here is the only player that's still on 100 HP as we are approaching Crux rather faster than we would all possibly like. The Darius is going to go right into play, give us that three Noxus here. And with that, Samira is going to be quite strong. Poppy in the front line tanking everything here. Philalix on the other side hopping over here is not really happy with these options. This uh. Piltover emblem is not giving him anything. It's quite and unlucky I'm... that you go to stage two, five, Panda, with a built over emblem, and you can't just get two built over units. That is very, very sad for Philalix. And even the Akshan teasing him. If he was on a win streak start, he would love to see Akshan too. It would be a way to secure that win streak. But when you're losing, you cannot commit nine gold to a unit that will not allow you to win fights regardless. So very correctly sells here. But again, I think there's no salvaging the fact that you took the risk in a high roll position where you have to maybe find a way to get it first in this game and the risk is for sure not paying off for now. Needs a reforger. A reforger might be the only thing that saves him from this situation because I think committing to the Piltover mm -hmm. might be a little bit too hard. Also something else could be a Pandora's items. Pandora's items could easily swap in that emblem into something that he might want. I think you're absolutely right with that. We're definitely not going down the Piltover route anymore. That is done and over with. We're holding on to the gold. We are saying goodbye, or as I taught you before, Morgan, chissy to that Piltover. It's not going to be going there. <laughs> and we are looking for other options to explore. Hopefully going to get uh, something to actually reforge it or even a Pandora's. I'm going to say this might be the hardest stage two I've ever had to cast. It seems like every single player is playing the same exact board. Three Noxus with Samira holding items on their board. Yeah, but not everyone has these items and not everyone has a texture glass having almost six units at stage two six. One of the strongest old items that you can hope for. So many varieties that you can put this, that item on and Panda. If you have a texture glass, who could you go for? What are the best units? could be paired up with a trickster glass for maximum value. Teach me, senpai. I think it's the answer to, to a lot of questions in TFT. It's Samira, uh, especially for stage two. Uh, some would <laughs> argue that Kalista is better as soon as you get her. I'm not sure I would agree, especially with a, Kalista, with a Samira two. I think Samira just does so much work in stage two, and they double dip with the armor reduction in terms of both just doing more and more damage and kind of snowballs out of control, especially if you have a Darius to accompany these Samiras. Um, but the real viable options are going to be Samira, Kalista for DPS in stages two and three. And looking to late game, any tanky, uh, big HP unit like Urgot, like Sejuani, some legendaries even later into the game. Yeah, it's always good to have an extra one of these massive beefy boys in that front line as soon as we get into the fields of players actually having units other than RE2 that shred through boards because in RE2, she's not going to care about that. She's just going to annihilate your backline regardless. But uh-oh, the god Ooh. here finding success in the Zons. As a robotic arm, one of the best augments that you could currently put on. I mean, not augments, but one of the best chem tech mods that you could put on any of your Zon units. Specifically paired up with a very important item, the Draven's Axe, which gives a lot of AD for your Zeri. He also had the Rage Blade. So that is almost two out of three perfect things that he wants. The robotic arm, the itemization. Now the only thing that remains is an augment that allows him to pivot to that Zeri Panda. More than augment gold. And he's going to have that for sure uh, with the lead he's had. 50 gold right now coming into 3-1. He has a Draven's Axe as well to just snowball his lead even more. Um, and again, you can see the items. They're, they're very clearly indicative of playing into Zeri. Zeri holding the, the Rage Blade and Urgot later on holding that uh, BT. So we're just going to have to hope that not many other players are trying to pivot into the same line. We saw it before with Volta in that eighth place. If there's three players going for Zeri, it's going to be so hard to find Zeri and Urgot 2 to stabilize. 
It is going to be Prismatics coming out of these augments here. 3-2. I know you hate it, Panda, but I live for it. Gonna see what players pick up. The god tempted here by that built different cursed crown. Not necessarily the options you wanted if you're playing Zeri, and it is going to be the roll the dice to give two extra radiant items onto the board. Roll the Dice, one of my favorite augments to pick up in stage three, alongside Capricious Forge. I think if you're win streaking especially, or you have a good two-star unit to put this on, it allows you to really snowball your lead and stay healthy and stay on a win streak in stage three. Just so much immediate combat power. And so many different units like Nasus, for example, can use it so well later in the game. Yeah, look, we were talking about this. Oh, no. I was just going to say that, Max, yesterday in the interview. We spoke with them and they said they hate it, but here goes the full open mode from Lecoco now. Double seeing this, just tabbing out, saying, like, this guy, man, tabbing back in. Of course, they're friends, so it is going to be something you hate less when you see it on somebody that you like, but is going to be unfortunate for every single other player. Now, Panda, for people that are maybe not as familiar with the final reserves, why don't you tell us why Lecoco is doing what he's doing? Well, final reserves is first and foremost an APM check because you will lose all of your HP, uh, you know, and happily do so because once you get to your last life, once you die and you'll be knocked out of the game in TFT, instead you're given one more chance one final reserve to come back into the game with a whole lot of extra XP, 80 to be exact, and a whole lot of gold. So you will be level 9 with 100 to 150 gold to roll down in one turn. If you're able to successfully assemble the Exodia board, Velvet 2 and RE2, etc., you will probably win the game. And that is why many top top players do not like it. Uh, there is not as much risk involved as Last Stand, in my opinion. Yeah, your explanation was really good, Panda, but, that, but that's what not why I was laughing. Look at the Coco's camera. I mean, I mean yeah. that is the face of a guy who had above 90 HP and then decided to fully open for a final reserves, absolutely chilling like he's done nothing. Now, a lot of people will call this guy crazy, but seven out of eight TFT players hate this guy. Now, after taking this augment, we're about to figure out why. <laughs> I mean, what do you want him to do? He's just waiting his turn, right? It's just like, uh, okay, I guess I open for it. I wait until I'm knocked all the way down. And then we go full send heavy APM check like Panda said. And that is going to be it. Of course, in the carousel, he's still required to pick something up eventually if he wants a little bit of a choice here. But I'm pretty sure Lococo is not going to be phased by anything right now. I do want to check in with Og, though, because we haven't seen him in a little bit. We know that Philalix is on that very cursed Piltover emblem that he really couldn't bring to life. But here is Og, and he's also on a little bit of a Noxus angle. And I know you're getting excited about that Death's Defiance there, but th there is no Darius to put it on. Okay, Don't work on Swain for now. A hundred gold, Panda. A hundred gold. We got two people fully sending it here. Except that Og maybe has a few units in his board. But him and Lakoko going for the full lost streak for maximum hedge fund value and maximum open. And now he ruins his lost streak because he goes into an empty board. I don't think Og is too happy about that. <laughs> and this is tricky for Og. I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that Og knew exactly that he wanted to pick Hedgeman. I think it just maybe he rolled through a few different options. That was his best choice. Uh, in this case, it'll be very risky with Lakoko also going to be able to assemble an Azodia board. If Og goes low enough where he's at 1 HP and he faces Lakoko once he's already hit that upgraded board, he's going to be in big trouble. He might be knocked out in, in a bottom four position. And just look at this. So we were talking about Philalix and the Spiltover emblem and... He eventually was able to actually find the Piltover, but if you're looking at that TX, we're, at we're three, wind six, streaking. <laughs> yeah, zero stacks, we're at 3-6. This dinosaur is an aesthetic bonus decoration, if anything. Looking at Philatex board right now with four gunners blending speed, one of the augments that does nothing but just give you two items, a rapid fire cannon and a rage blade. Now, for a Zeni board, for four gunners board, this could sound really exciting because he didn't have that many items. And again, he's been very unlucky to find anything that swaps off his built over board like we we spoke about it, Panda. But is that really a good choice? Do you agree with Philalix taking uh, running speed and still committing to built over despite not being able to slam it in the first stage, missing five losses in potential? 
I think if this was any other game in the day, it would be correct because you're playing. At the end of the day, you know that someone like the Hoko has a chance to just be 100% first place with how strong his board will be if he hits. Uh, and you have to kind of play for preserving HP right now so that when you do start facing these extremely strong players and you start losing almost guaranteed in stages four and five, you're healthy enough to outplay the other players. But this is the final game of the tournament. This is where players have to take bigger risks and, and try and find a way to maybe even beat out the Coco or hope he can't actually roll down and hit his board in time. We're definitely going to be keeping an eagle eye on Lococo. Of course, he assembled a board here to actually take down the wolves, as is correct. He wants all of those upgrades here. That's not around. You're keen <laughs> on actually open fording. He's going to sell everything right away, though, I think. Thank you for your business <laughs> and yeet. <laughs> yeah, he can't even pick up that orb. There's too many things. Now he can, is going to see if that's something he can make something out of. And then we're going to be selling that gin once again. Oh. He's already committing to the AP items. That is going to be a level 9 board, already waiting for that Addy, that sweet, sweet Addy to come on. Slamming the Shoujin, slamming the Jewel Gauntlet. You know what? I swear, if, even if Coco doesn't come up as top 4 in this lobby, he still has my full respect. I've never seen someone open fort from over 90 HP. 90 HP. And looking at the it's... God's board, trying to play for Zeri has not hit it yet, unfortunately. I think we've seen this in so many times from so many players rolling down to seven, or going to seven at 4-1, rolling down to 10 gold and not finding Zeri just yet. Thankfully, Draven's Axe might be a way to boost back up that gold and actually have the gold to hit both Zeri and Urgot too. Last Augments coming through is going to be Gold Augments now. If you're the god, know your enemy is probably looking pretty interesting. You know that several of the players are a little bit of a Noxus angle, are a little bit of a Challenger angle, are a little bit of a Zaun angle. So having similar traits with them is going to help him be a little bit stronger here. Finding a Felius too in the background there, if I saw correctly, and Lococo is going to be going with healing orbs, just generic, you know, not locking himself into anything. Yeah, I think going for the Aphelios might be a very interesting choice because, again, that unit, despite not being the strongest right now, but he didn't even get a Zeri, but Panda, what are we looking at? Challengers, my favorite comp in the game. Sinar is going down this route and he's done it correctly. It. Level 7, 0 gold, Kaisa 2, Yasuo 2. That, that, yeah. That's correctly. You just hit. Okay, thank you for explaining that. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, just yeah, very good for him is going to go up against Lakoko though, so not a challenge in this fight. Lakoko dropping lower and lower, 15 of uh, 14 HP. It's going to be reaching that final checkpoint in one or two games, depending on how they go. Although with this open fort, it could actually maybe on fort two. I'm not sure if it could be one. One thing to know about Lakoko's board and, and why some viewers might be confused as to why he's just full selling and trying to reach that final reserve threshold as fast as possible. For the most part, if you hit it earlier at 4-2, 4-3 around this time, it's much easier to have a board that even with one-star legendaries, you might still win rounds. You might not be doomed where other players are spiked enough that you'll be losing anyway. So it has some assurance there. Also, the fact that you'll be taxing players for so much more HP much earlier on. So it'll just be an absolute menace for the entirety of the Stage 4 and Stage 5. Yeah, he's also okay. losing a lot of HP, so that makes sure that he gets that carousel at stage 4. So we're expecting a legendary unit from the carousel. And if it's Ari, the unit that he's already built the itemization for, makes we're looking at a final fight between, again, Og and Sinar, who is going to be on top. We will see Ark still has a little bit of HP to fall back on. Of course, with his augments, he doesn't want to spend as much gold as he did. He would have probably liked to preserve the 100, and it's not enough to actually turn the story around here. We will see Lakoko go to Begins. 1 HP and see how that plays out. First now, this is a cell, though. This is either going to be the fastest roll down that we ever see in our lives, or the biggest throw. Panda, your favorite round, the carousel. And now for 40 seconds of action with a true, how do I say this, adrenaline, heart rush, a lot of, you call it, Lecoco is about to spend all of his money. And Ari is going to be a great start to this roll down. Needs to find an Ari too if he really wants to stabilize. He has Trickster's Glass as well, remember, so he has a chance to have two different two star, five cost legendary on the board. Uh, and we'll see what exactly he wants to do with the itemization. But the key units to look out for Belveth, two in terms of the AD carry, Ari, two in terms of the AP carry. That Ari. Ion, two is great for your frontline as well. And you really want to start, if you want to lean heavily into air, you want to hold on to things like Taric, things like Karma, and things like Shen as well. 
And we're rolling it down, my friends. Level 9 finds one Belbeth. Also picked up the spatula from the carousel here. Here's Ari coming through. Atrox 2, Cyan 2, Belbeth. One more, and we have the Belbeth 2 assembled. Cyan 2 is not going to come into play. Hits a lot of legendaries, but not necessarily the ones we want it here, but keeps his wits about him. Needs to slam items as fast as possible as he has rolled down and has not hit the Belbeth 2 or the Ari 2. Both of these are one star. You can see him slam these items even now still to try and make something off of it is it going to be enough is the big question ignore so two. many rides in the middle of the way panda more than that yes scion 2 offered two times in a row did not end up buying it has a chance for juggernaut emblem does end up making it instead is this gonna be enough i'm not entirely sure re1 if you're facing weak players yes but the moment you face a win streak player like a roy like philalix at the point now you might be in big trouble shen 2 is big here though ah uh. I mean, just the flashes, the thumbs yes, up luck. here, saying, I don't mind, I'm good. We'll see how it goes. Other players watching this board, seeing if that is something they want to deal with or if he actually hit on his roll down. Seems to be the case that Lakoko will sell something off to make that Chen 2 to try and get a little bit of extra front line going. Could be that with Trickster's Glass, he chose not to make Scion 2 on purpose, thinking he has enough frontline already and just needs more gold for, for the Ari, but didn't hit anyway. And now sitting at 4 HP at the mercy of these natural rolls coming to the PvE round. I'm not a huge fan of him selling this Senna because, again, despite the fact that this unit oh. would be quite stronger going with the shields and everything, it could be hard if he loses just one round. And this is something that might be happening, maybe not anytime soon, maybe not against Yeroi's board because, just as you mentioned earlier, Panda, him getting these units early in stage four does make sure that he doesn't lose because no one has really hit their strongest point yet. Now, he gets a Heimer. He could not afford it before, but he could be looking for it at this point. So something that we're seeing a lot of players that played this kind of board do is actually sacrifice the Karma in the front line to make sure the Ionias goes onto the Ari or the Shen. And Lakoko even had a second there where the Karma was and able to buy that Ionias got the buff. So a little bit unfortunate here. I think you would rather frontline her and just kill her off as soon as possible to guarantee the Ionia buff onto your carry Ari. But Lococo seems to be thinking differently. Made a little bit of gold here. We'll see on whether or not he can find the big upgrades here now. Belveth 2 coming into play. It is the Ari 2 that he so desperately wants, but doesn't... Yeah, well, I jinxed it. Oh. Here she is. And this is the correct, in my opinion, final capped legendary board. You're playing around the Ari, you're playing around with the Taric and the Karma online, but also the Gwen onto the, the you know, the Shadows with Senna and the Aatrox as a tertiary carry outside of Belveth and Ari herself. So has finally found everything, now has maybe the chance to get some extra gold, find the Heimerdinger and really cap out this board fully. I think the Morello and the Ari might have been a little bit too worried here. You could have looked for a better third item, but he doesn't want to take the risk. Again, being with one HP is something that Coco does know that if he loses one round, he's going to be going away. It's either him or Canvas right now. Two of our biggest contenders that some one of them could have been crowned again as the champion and the one who gets to sit on the throne on day three, but it's going to be Lecoco's board. Absolutely astonishing Canvas as he goes out first despite having 29 points. He is not going to be a winner for gold special cup day three as he goes off the leaderboard. And this is what we were talking about with the fact that you know the Coco's gonna spike. You know he's gonna roll down, hit a, a very, very scary board. If you're anywhere under 15 HP, if you're on one life, the moment he rotates into your player pool, you are in deep, deep trouble unless you've been able to match his board, which is frankly almost impossible if you don't also have final reserves. Yeah, it is going to be very hard, but some players are going to try it nonetheless. Double 61 looking to build a similar board here has the Ari fully itemized, but is it going to be enough? Both of these players are still pretty safe. Sinar and Double 61 around that 25, 30 HP mark, but it is going to be important for them to actually stop the bleeding eventually if they don't want to get one rolled over by our dear friend Lococo. So somebody will take the loss here and it's double 61 now looking at a similar fate to his cousin. So many people, people playing the same board here, Panda. And if you look closely, this is the meta. This is something that you spoke about before about how dominant five cost units are. So why don't you give us a quick explanation of how does this board rely so much and is so strong right now? 
Quick correction. This is the meta in a game where you have to win because it's the last game of a tournament and it's not just playing yeah. for cutoffs and not just playing for being, you know, the top half of the lobby. It's playing for winning the game. So everyone is trying to assemble this Exodia board. Some players like the Coco having obviously much more favor than others in terms of hitting all of their upgrades. And Double 61 there had a copy of Cyan, a copy of Ari, and correctly deciding to actually fully make the Ari because Lococo was in his player pool. There was a chance that the final reserve sport was going to roll around and that Ari 2 is going to hold you over and maybe even give you a fighting chance against the Exodia board of Lococo. And for now, it's also going to stop the bleeding against the other players, finds a win against Philalix, and is looking to be strong against Lococo as well. Players on the rest of the field are dropping lower and lower as well. You can see that most of them have rolled all of their Econ. It's only Yaroy who has some HP and some Econ to fall back on. Favorite round, Panda. Carousels, are you okay with the choices or do we have any objections, sir? Well, Zephyr is the biggest one. The fact that you can put up a Belveth or an Ari into the air and, and you know take them out of the fight for six seconds at the very start might be the difference maker when Double faces up against Lococo, when the French face off against each other to try and win out in this lobby. One key thing to remember, Lococo has significantly less points in the standings right now than players like Sinar, than players like Roy. So even if Lococo wins the lobby, if Sinar does well enough for himself, if he's able to preserve his HP for long enough as he has his entire game, he might still be able to be Ooh. our GSC champion. Yeah, I'm... I'm that could have been a Belvedere 3. That was a Belvedere 3 angle mix. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. There's so many people contesting him on it. I don't think that was yeah, the yeah, case, but <laughs> like Coco, the executor, is rolling around and facing the only board where he maybe actually has somebody that could put him down. The Sephir hitting that Ari right from the get go. The enemy Ari being able to free cast, but she still needs to take down the Belveth and the Ari that Lakoko built, Heimerdinger doing his best to try and support here. Belveth still getting some extra resets, will fall eventually, and Double61 has done it! He's taken down the final reserves in sixth place. Sonar, who was leading the points, unfortunately also going out in fifth year. Revenge for his teammate, Canvas, went by the hands of Lecoco, but Double61 takes up the retaliation. And this is the issue with going with final reserves. If you lose one round against someone that has been able to pivot from the level 9 board with a little bit more HP, and again, the Morello, the Zephyr, everything went perfect in that fight for 61, Panda. I love, Morgan, that the first affiliation that you use to connect Double61 and Canvas is the fact that on the same team, Carmine Core, and not the fact that they're actually family. They are cousins <laughs> playing in the final lobby of GSC number three, and Double161 does indeed avenge his cousin in the process. Whether it is his cousin, whether it is his teammate, the retaliation was there, and we might see be saying goodbye to another player right now. We see Felix competing with the late built over, which has not been doing him so good in these final rounds. We are focusing now on the third I mean, on the left one, but we also might be saying goodbye to Double 61, except if Yeroi does have a good option to take him out right here. However, Felix board is not dealing enough damage, will be going down, but Double 61 luckily might be staying in the game because his Addy is doing God's work, keeping him alive, doing a lot of damage. The Hammerdinger is the only player still left alive or the champion, but that Katarina is doing a lot of damage hitting stage three again with all that crit. Yeroi does have a lot of damage and 61 might be going up, but no, he stays alive on one HP. On one HP, that maybe to take so that defense. The Katarina Ooh. just getting a cast after cast after cast, and no one to knock her down. No unit standing. Massive here. Double 61 clawing his way into the top three. And this might be the time that I say one HP in a dream, and I really mean it. Double 61 is trying to win a potential GSC title for the first time ever. Two-time EMEA champion, of course, but has not actually won a GSC tournament yet. He might be doing it here today. I don't know about yeah. you guys, the, the deck Katarina was such a giga chat keeping him alive. And we're looking at a few item options makes. What would we take here? Now we are going to see the Katarina, of course, already has three items. The Shroud of Stillness uh, uh, item you always like to pick up, right? It's just so good in the later stages, especially if you're facing something like a RE2. But I just quickly want to mention the player points because Yaroi is currently one point ahead of Double 61. So if Double wants to take this GSC, he actually has to get a place higher than Yaroi. Yaroi has been looking incredibly strong for all of this game. 
be very hard for him right here. We see double sixty one finally hitting the two star Aatrox right before that fight. However, unlucky for him, he's gonna be playing against the clone. Unlucky for him because we see a Roy competing right now at this point with sixty one. One of them is. Or could be our champion for day three. The Ari luckily stays alive this time for the targeting. But, however, the Belvet gets to target him. Still alive with all of these scores that she's picking up. The Mechano is doing such an amazing work, keeping her down. But the Death Dance delays the damage, allowing for more survivability. It does save double 61 in this fight. And again, we do see Aroy dealing a lot of damage. His board is going to be getting way stronger. But he has HP to afford it. However, he doesn't need it because he does take the win. And now AUG is one fight away. Him and double 61 are facing each other. So this could be for one of them. Leroy has a chance now to eliminate double to crown himself champion of this GSC number two. It'll be so hard to do so. Zephyr on this Heimerdinger, full attack speed as well. The Ari has perfect items and the Zephyr is going to be so huge. It could be pivotal in deciding the outcome of these upcoming few fights. Of course, we don't know who Yaroi is going to face up against. It could be a ghost copy of either Og or Casey Double Sport. He has enough HP to survive, but Casey Double and Og, somebody is going to go home right now. It is only Casey Double and Yaroi that are still fighting for Zephyr. this title. And this Zephyr is going to hit something. Cyan charging into that enemy backline. The Ari cast comes out, takes out the Jinx in the far corner. Ash going down as well. The Ziri is still alive, but she's not doing enough. She's just getting absolutely stomped by this Ari and Casey double taken down Og. Now it is down to Yaroi and him. Yeah, the Zephyr hitting, the Cyan charging on that Zeri. Og not being able to deal any damage with his backline, but now Panda. It always has been, regardless, before or after this battle, as long as it's between double 61 and Yaroi because of the points, uh, Aug was already away because of his placements. But now, is there anything double can do to counter that massive economy and that massive spike that is about to hit Yaroi when he gets the Echo 3 and the Darius 3? Yaroi still has some HP to work with. I think he's still correct to try and, and wait it out. But no, gonna roll down heavily here. One away from Echo, one away from Darius. Finds the Echo in the end, does not have gold. Get both though, gonna get the Darius first. The one downside here for double, the Zephyr on the Heimerdinger is gonna be very hard to hit any of the key units since they're all frontline melee bruisers. And now it's going to be between one of them. 29 points on double, 30 on Yaroi. This one placement could do all the difference. No tiebreakers, nothing will save him here if Yaroi wins. Double 61 needs to win this fight. However, the Katarina gets a free backline access to that area. No one to target out, so she gets to delete it. And that Darius 3 is putting in God's work with the Death Dance. Lost Whisper and Giant Slayer giving him a lot of damage. Martyr keeping him alive with the Harm Assist. He's not going to be taking any damage. And ladies and gents, with that final dunk, Yaroi claims up his spot and he's going to be your champion for the Golden Spatula Cup 3 after an amazing and a ludicrous victory against Double 61. And it seems like a rerun of rerun. It's France coming out on top of Rising Legends. This region is cracked at TFT and Yaroi showing up as rather new face in the Rising Legends circuit and just taking it all home, looking really good while doing it. And we got a bunch of super exciting games. I'm so glad about this outcome, Panda. And in this final lobby, across the entire tournament, France has once again sent a message right when some players, some casters, some analysts were starting to think Germany might be taking over, were starting to think that France's reign had finished. Lecoco in days one and two, Lecoco in this final lobby, Cambys, Double, and Yoroi all sending a message that France is not done. France still wants to be the top region in EMEA, and hopefully maybe this set even at Worlds. He gets to celebrate and twice, not just because he win today makes, but because it's his first Golden Special Cup victory ever. So that is something we should all clap and salute 07 in the chat for this legend. We are going to be hearing from our analyst desk in just a little bit. Don't go anywhere. Of course, there is going to be Golden Spatula Cup points to be earned, interviews to be had, and more information to be shared. But first, we go into a quick break. Thank you so much for listening. So uh, I'm Rutger, 20 years old, and I come from the Netherlands. My, my in-game name is Ludwig Pro, that's also what I'm known for in the DFT community. Uh, I used to play 
a lot of chess when I was younger. I also competed in some tournaments, stuff like that. And uh, yeah, I'm like super addicted to TFT. So my thoughts about Terry Forge. I think it's uh, it's a great set, especially if you if you compare it to like set eight, for example. I think the set is great. The, the units are great. The traits are great. Um, overall, I think the balancing team is doing a very good job as well. Like sometimes you might have some build over issues or you know stuff like that. But I think in general the, the set is, is it's really fun. It's it's super competitive. I think the strongest DRC either has to be the German DRC or the French DRC. You, you, in every GSC or, or Super Bowl or whatever, you you always see the Germans and, and the French players shine. They always make it with, with like 10 to 12 people to final day of GSC, which is really insane. Oh, the best player for sure has to be either Gambis or Enzo X. Gambis had like an insane run in Rising Legends itself. I think he, he won like GSC 3, he won the final of Rising Legends. But Enzo X, he, I think he finished like fifth at the World Champions. So I think both of these players had an insane run. And it, it's really hard to decide like which one performed better, but so I would say both. Oh, I'll give a shout out to uh, a bunch of people. First of all, uh, the Dutch uh, Discord server. Um, we've been growing a lot recently and hope we can we can really grow even more in the future. Also, a shout out to the German and the Tunisian community. Um, I think they're, they're very fun to watch on Twitch, stuff like that. And then some personal shout outs. So I want to shout out Suso, uh, Lusher, Tifty Chillout, uh, Dudonot, uh, Noodle Burner, and uh, also Snubble TFT actually. So uh, yeah, with that being said, those are my shout, shout outs. Welcome back, one and all. The Golden Spatula Cup number two has come to its conclusion. And oh boy, Wiener, as I was saying on the cast, I th I was certain coming in today, based on Sasa's performance in GSC1, this was going to be the time for the German players to really come up you know, and take the spotlight away. But what a world we live in. Five French players on the final table and a French GSC champion in Yeroi. What an incredible final game. Yeah, absolutely a fantastic game coming through here, right? And we have all these like massive legendary boards with final reserves, but good old trusted Noxus reroll coming through here. And you look at the Katarina item. She was for a long time the primary carrier there. Rocking an IE, not even a JG, right? So not even like fully optimal items for that Katarina as well. Just a crazy game overall. I mean, well, let's start from the beginning then. Unstable Rift, we knew our players would be playing with one more item than we'd be used to, but it wouldn't be an item that could necessarily predict what it was going to be on the next round. You know, what, you know, how do you think our players adapted to having such a variable start to the game? I mean, it's kind of hard, right? Because there were so many players that were just like, I'm going to fully open my board, I'm going full Lost Ring, I'm going full Winter Ring, right? You saw Yavroy, for example, right? The champion here. His management of just using this early game extra item to just like massively out the rest of the lobby was crazy, right? Up until 4 3, I think he was 100 HP. Yeah, it was absolutely astonishing stuff. I mean, you know, of course, alongside that, you know, as much as Jiroi managed to take the road forward, we've got to address, you know, that we had the uh, risk winners from Coco. I mean, to be fair, Goku came into this game behind the you know, the leaders of the pack, so he had to go for something big. But I don't think I've seen anything quite like that before, at least in the tournament. Oh, we had some, we've had some pretty determined um, open fort players in the past, right? Double being one of them as well, right? But like, 
This is just saying, you know what, I'm gonna play fully into my Orc, man. I think back to the start, top of show, when we had to do a stake sword and Scapaeus and Ardua pointing out this Orc, man. It's just not what they would remove from the game, because you can kind of see just how it just ended up shaping the game around here. And Lecoco, uh, it could have been absolute disaster for him, but he tacked Double, who was also on like a fast nine points, didn't have full investments here. And that gave him so much time to kind of work his way through the lobby until the other players in and around the lobby had a, a board that was equally capped. But I do feel bad for Felix in this lobby. I mean, you know, having trouble finding the Piltover in the first place and then realizing that he was in a lobby with a player who would literally be completely open forting. The only thing that means that you definitely cannot ever get a decent T-Hex online. Yeah, and even then, Philalex showed great awareness in terms of how he decided to kind of navigate his game, right? He found the early Seri, like, made the early investment into that, and he actually ended up putting together a pretty strong streak, which meant that he actually secured a pretty good placement. As you can see in the clips right now here, 4 1, he's putting together a streak that lasted at least until 4 3, where he picks up a Seri 2 as well. Yeah, that streak was absolutely ridiculous, but. Of course, you know, coming out of the last game, we were on the edges of our seats until the very last moment. We almost thought Double 61 would be able to pick up the only title he's never gained for himself, which, you know, of course, Canvas will have over him that of a Golden Spatula Cup champion to go along with the regional and world titles. Wasn't quite there, but it was a pretty damn close thing. I think, I, I think that... I would rather have the world title than I would have a GSC title. <laughs> I think that's a little bit more grand it's a little bit more grandiose, right? But no, I get I definitely get what you're saying, right? It feels kind of crazy to me, right? When you think you look at the players like Canvas, uh, sorry, Double 61, who hasn't picked up a golden spatula cup yet. And this seemed like it was gonna be his option to do that, right? But when you look in the lobby here, you had Canvas who also went for the level up game plan for the open forward here. He was forced to pull the trigger around the two sooner than he would have liked because of the fact that Lakoko just kind of accelerated that process for the entire of the rest of the lobby. All right, let's go and find out how it all played out. Of course, we know who our champion is already, but it is important every single place, one of every single player, because they will be getting an increasingly large amount of GSC points. Yeah, and Simply Wojciech, not the greatest performance from him, but it is a repeat day free, so he will be very happy with the fact that he has put a together a fair amount of GSC points already to put towards that standings and again same thing goes for Slanash had a great opening to the day and then kind of just fell off towards the back end of the day same thing can be said for them like Voltariax but the important thing for Volta is now he's on the board here he's in the mix of a chance mm. of making it to the finals he missed those in the last set right not something that we kind of recognize with Volta right? he's always there outside of the last set and at the top of the standings here you have Roy great performance from him and also Lalana top 16 where Jungler Skipay is again a player we, we've spoken about right before Second place in the previous Golden Spatula Cup, picking up even more points here, should be locked in for finals already as well. And of course, selfishly, I'm very glad to see Lalana managing to make the top 15 there. Again, this was very much a GSC of returning names, so to see so many familiar faces up there at the very tippy top is very gratifying indeed, but also to see all the other developing players alongside them. It's an incredibly tough thing to come into such a developed field and say, you know what? Despite the fact that these guys have got far more tournament experience than me, I think I can go head to head with them. Yeah, and I think that's kind of, we should kind of get it from the horse's mouth, I think, right? Because we do have the interview ready here with your Roy. And first of all, massive, massive congratulations to, to you on a, on a fantastic victory. I feel like this must be an amazing feeling. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, uh, I knew I had the level, but I, you never expect uh, such a win of a, uh, of a uh, great Tony. Well, Roy, I want to ask the question here. You know, how did you feel before the tournament even began? You know, were you were you starting off and thinking this is going to be my tournament? Uh, I mean, uh, um, since the the open qualifier, uh, I was really confident. Uh, I often started do, uh, those with um, uh, two top ones, and then uh, it uh, went. It uh, got me to the JC, uh, and then uh, starting the JC, I was not uh, so confident because uh, I felt the meta was uh, uh, really different since the player uh, were better in the JC. Uh, but then I knew if I um, uh, that he, if I focused and uh, played my best. I could uh, take the victory, and that happened, so, yeah. 
I think something that I think was pretty interesting here in this game specifically, you had a lot of you had a lot of like open four players, like Coco, Final Reserves, Exploration, etc. And then you had you just continuously playing your style, win streaking all throughout the game here. Just is that like the the main thing for you in your game plan and how you feel safe in a game? Is that win streaking? Um in fact in the previous set uh I liked to open fort a lot. Uh, really uh, selling all my whole board uh, and uh, starting the game later to have uh, a big cap. But uh, since the last set, we saw with um, uh, with uh, Enzo uh, having a good result, never opening. And uh, since the since uh, those results, I think uh, Europe uh, started to learn that uh, open falling, except when you have uh, Plutora, is uh, not a good thing. Especially in this meta, where uh, HP can just save you a, a lot of places, and uh, since uh, this, I I try to improve my uh, my streak boards, and I was kind of lucky uh, last game because uh, I had uh, two star legendary in uh, one four, so went well for me. Oh, good old Samira. <laughs> well, I want to go back in time a little bit. Uh, we've been letting us know by production that the... Uh, I don't know if you remember this from a Golden Patch I cut before, where you missed out on making it through to day two by a single place. Uh, you ended up 65th overall. I, uh, if, you can, if you can remember that, uh, yeah, you know, how, how does that feel in, you know, in the context of what you've done today? Um... I mean, uh, the first time uh, I uh, missed uh, day two by one place, it was my first ever JC, and my uh, uh, I came from the open qualifier, so uh, uh, I was really disappointed uh, on the moment, but it was still a great perf great uh, performance, and uh, since then uh, I really think uh, my level uh, went uh, really. Uh, uh, I compared uh, to the time uh, I did uh, the the last result, so uh, it's a so great absolutely. revenge, you know. Yeah. So another thing that's also pretty interesting, right, is that we've seen a kind of a rise of like people that like practicing groups a lot more. And like, do you have like a specific like group of people that you that you practice a lot with, or are you more of a, a lone wolf, so to say? Uh no, I, I'm practicing a, a lot with a group of guy. Uh, Called uh, the Watu Bons. Uh, I uh, also have uh, a mail from the association of the cube. This guy, I started in a Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Uri. Uh, oh, I don't know if we still got them. It looks like connection is going a little bit. Uri, can you still hear us? Yes. I can okay, uh, hear you. I'm oh, sorry, could you, could you repeat again? Uh, from uh, when? Uh, just. Uh, do you want me to just go entirely through the, question, uh, the answer again, I'm afraid? Um, so, I uh, said uh, the what to bounce, the. Can you hear me? Yes, yep. we can hear you. Okay, okay. Uh, so, I was talking about uh, my uh, study group, who's uh, called the uh, what to bounce. Uh, mm. But uh, where there are like uh, five or uh, we are five or six, I believe. Um, and then uh, I have uh, one mate uh, from a long time in uh, in the associ the association I'm part of, uh, Raptor Esport, uh, whose name is uh, Finub, and uh, he really helped me a lot uh, in the, at the start of the season because uh, I was stuck in Masters, and I really was about to stop the game because I was feeling. Uh, so bad, uh, not improving, and uh, he helped me. He helped me um, undo this, uh, my, the problems I have, and then I started to grind, and here I am. It's kind of crazy, right, Peter? That transition from being able to mm. be hard stock masters into a into a GSC win, right? And again, this is also going to mean that you are going to be qualified for the EMEA finals for the first time here. And I know you've missed qualification for the Hex League before with the up and down, so I assume this must be amazing for you to like, have that spot locked in already. Yeah, sure. Uh, and for the Hex League, uh, I'm uh, 
I'm in a good spot to qualify to the 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 up and down again. So if I can do both, uh, it would be really good. So you're right. I mean, you know, as you said, it sounds like you put an enormous amount of work into getting here. You know, how are you going to celebrate now that you've you know you've got yourself the first place prize? You've got yourself that guaranteed spot. Uh, I think I think uh, I'm just going to get out of my room and jump with my brother and scream and I, I don't know, man. It just uh, it's just burning in me. <laughs> That's a good plan. Yeah. Definitely a fantastic plan. Celebrating with family. Nothing can really beat that. Do you have any final shout outs that you want to give before we let you go, Yoroi? Um I'd like to shout out the entire uh, French community. It was uh, really friendly. Uh, and it's a really good uh, environment to improve since uh, everyone is ready to to give an a end uh, to everyone. And yeah, to the viewers as well. All right, Zero, thank you so much. We'll leave you to leap around and just try and soak in what an incredible accomplishment you have made here today. We very much look forward to seeing you playing at the EMEA Regional Finals. Thank you. Oh. So that will bring us more or less to a close. We've still got a few items of business before we go, of course. Uh, we have had our contest going on on Twitter, which is, of course, uh, we've had some pretty witty answers so far, Twitter, to, to, you know, which of our players deserves the win the most. You know, again, it wasn't about necessarily being right. It was just about being clever about it. Because I don't think a lot of people would have been right if they, with their guess, I don't think a lot of people had your Roy on their bingo card, Peter. <laughs> No, absolutely. So let's see what the answer ends up being, because last time around it was something extremely silly. Uh, Coco because they're cuckoo for spatulas. To be fair, I think that was a pretty safe bet under the circumstances, given that Coco dominated days one and two. Yeah, again, one of those uh, great, strong performances we've seen from Coco time and time again. It's just a question of time until we see that final big victory under his belt, I assume. All right, so again, that will bring us pretty much to the end of things here today. It's worth noting, of course, the people have been asking about the Sharima Cup. Uh, it will be coming up, I believe, in a little over an hour on the NA side of things. But from our side of things, we, of course, have got the Super Brawl coming up down the line on the 8th of September. That is our team event 4v4. And it's worth noting that we haven't necessarily decided teams for everything yet. It's kind of the way you access that is through the TRCs. And you can find out more information about the TRCs at risinglegends.gg slash TRC, I believe. Hopefully, there'll be a link in the chat right now. So there's still time across many of our regions to still get in and potentially join that team. Wait, how would you encourage folks to go and take part in the Super Brawl? Uh, I would, uh, you just uh, sign up, get to play. It's always great fun to play a team-based uh, TFT. Right? We, we saw it last. It was an absolutely stunning success. A lot of people had so much fun. We got to see some new names kind of make a, make a name for themselves. Bowman Death being one of them on that French team, for example, right? Potterball and Volta kind of just like griefing each other to get MVPs and stuff. It was great. Later, but if if you do like great fun, remember that on Twitter you can find us over at TFT Esports EMEA, where we will produce great content for you, including banger memes and much more. If you want more traditional TFT news, remember that at Play TFT on Instagram, on YouTube, and on Facebook and on Twitter as well. I suppose you can find more general TFT news there, Peter. And could you give us the individual socials? Yes, so of course the easy ones are ours because you can see them just below our names, which is counterfeit cast and we to cast because we like to end our names a little bit differently. Of course, from earlier today, Impetuous Panda makes underscore and Morgan cast. If you use the cast the command, you'll be able to see them in the chat right now. Just plug those into Twitter and you will pretty much find all of us straight away. Again, the Sharima Cup is come up in just over an hour. Thank you so much for joining us again. Do come back and join us on 8th of September for the Super Bowl. It's a hell of an event. But for now, thank you to everybody involved. And of course, to our wonderful production team as well, working behind the scenes to make sure this was an absolutely incredible event. So congratulations again to Rai for an incredibly well-played competition. We'll see you guys down the line for the Super Brawl. Yeah, I 
stay Breaking my own limits and I won't say I'm not gonna win it cause this crown's made for me You just wait and see All my haters getting bitter cause I'm working overtime <laughs> my moment and i own it stay in focus and i show it you know i'm taking the night feeling it right stay on the light and i stay loving myself serving me well as you can tell cause it's my moment I'm the master of my fate Conquering my fears I'm in control and taking names I just speak my truth, babe You should follow suit 